The Mine with the Iron Door by Harold Bell Wright The Canyon of Gold From every street and corner in Tucson we see the mountains. From our places of business, from our railway depots and hotels, from our university campus and halls, and from the windows and porches of our homes we look up to the mighty hills. But of all the peaks and ranges that keep their sentinel posts around this old pueblo, there are none so bold in the outlines of their granite heights and rugged canyons, so exquisitely beautiful in their soft colors of red and blue and purple, or so luring in the call of their remote and hidden fastnesses as the Santa Catalinas. Every morning they are there, looking down upon our little city in the desert with a brooding, godlike tolerance, remote yet very near. All day long they watch with world-old patience our fretful activities, our puny strivings, and our foolish pretenses. And when evening is come and the dusk of our desert basin deepens, their castle crags and turret peaks signal with the red fire of the sunset, good night to us who dwell in the gloom below. Even in the darkness we see their shadowy might against the sky and feel the still and solemn mystery of their enduring strength under the desert stars. This is a story of some people who lived in the Catalinas. If you would find more exactly the scene of this romance, you must take the new Bankhead Highway that, in its course from Tucson to Florence and Phoenix, runs for miles in the shadow of these mountains. From the old Mexican quarter of the city, picturesque still with the colorful life of the West that is vanishing, you go straight north on Main Street, where the dust of your passing is the dust of the crumbled adobe buildings and fortifications of the ancient Pueblo that had its beginning somewhere in the forgotten centuries. Leaving the outskirts of the town, your way leads over rolling lands of greasewood and cacti, down the long grade past the cemetery past the government hospital in the valley, to the bridge that spans the Relito. From the little river you climb quickly up to the desert slopes that form the western base of the main range, and that lie under the wide skies unmarked by human hands since the beginning of deserts and mountains. Beyond the famous steam pump ranch, some sixteen miles from Tucson, the road to Oracle branches off from the Bankhead Highway and climbs higher and higher until... From a wide mesa you can see the place of my story, the mighty Cañada del Oro, the Canyon of Gold. But if you know the way, you may turn aside from the main road before you come to this new oracle branch, and take instead the old road that winds closer to the mountains, and for several miles follows the bed of the lower canyon. It was along this ancient trail that the eventful and romantic life of the southern Arizona country through its many ages moved. This way, centuries ago, came the Spaniards, lured by tales of strange people who used silver and gold as we use tin and iron, and who set turquoise in the gates of their houses. This way came the Franciscan fathers to find in the Cañada del Oro gold for their mission at San Xavier. This way, from the San Pedro and the Aravipa, came the savage Apache to raid the peaceful farming Papagos, and later to war against the pale-faced settlers in the valley of the Santa Cruz. Prehistoric races, explorers, Indians, priests, pioneers, prospectors, cattlemen, soldiers, and adventurers of every sort from every land, all, all have come this way, along this old road through the Canyon of Gold." And because there was water here, and because there was gold here, this wild and adventurous life, through the passing of centuries, made this place a camping ground and a battlefield, a place of labor and crime, of victory and defeat, of splendid heroism, noble sacrifice, and dreadful fear. Set amid the grandeur and the beauty of these vast deserts, lonely skies and wild and rugged mountains, the Cañada del Oro has been, most of all, as indeed it is today, a place of dreams that never came true, of hopes that were never fulfilled, of labor that was vain. Of all the stirring tales of this picturesque region of the Santa Catalinas, of all the romantic legends and traditions that have come down to us from its shadowy past, none is more filled with the essence of human life and love and hopes and dreams 
than is the tale of the mine with the iron door. But this is not a story of those old Spaniards and Padres and Indians and pioneers. It is a story of today. The old, old tale of the mine with the iron door is as true for us as it ever was for those who lived and loved so many years ago. We too in these days have our dreams that must remain always, merely dreams and nothing more. We too in these modern times are called upon to bury in the secret places of our modern hearts hopes that are dead. In every life there are ashes of fires that have burned out or by some cold fate have been extinguished. For every living one of us, I believe, there is a Cañada del Oro, a canyon of gold. There is a lost mine that will never be found. There are iron doors that may never be opened. And yet, those who look for it still find color in the Cañada del Oro. Romance and adventure still live in the canyon of gold. The treasures of life are not all hidden in a lost mine behind an iron door. As the old prospector, Thad Grove, said to his partner one time when their last pinch of dust was gone and their most promising lead had pinched out, after all, it's a dead immortal cinch that if we had happened to strike it rich like we was hoping, we couldn't never been as rich as we was hoping to be. There just naturally ain't that much gold, no how. Sure, returned Bob Hill, the other old-timer. Ain't you never took notice how much richer a feller with one poor little old nugget in his pan is than the hombre what only thinks he's got a bonanza somewheres in the insides of a mountain? And look at this, will you? If everybody was to certain sure find the mine he's hunting, there'd be so blame much gold in the world that it'd take a hunter mule train to pack enough to buy a mess of frijoles. It's a good thing, I say, that somebody, or something, has fixed it somehow so all our fool dreams can't come true. Speaking of love, said Thad on another occasion when the two were discussing the happiness that had so strangely come to them with their partnership daughter, Love ain't no big deposit that a feller is allus hoping to find but mostly never does. Love is just a medium high grade ore that you got to dig for. Yep, agreed Bob. And when you've got your ore, you sure got to run it through the mill and treat it scientific if you expect to recover much of the values. The affairs of the old partners and their daughter Marta were matters of great and never failing interest to the loungers who gathered in front of the general store and post office in Oracle. Bill Jansen, known as the Lizard, invariably opened and led the discussions. The Jansen family, it should be said, had drifted into the Cañada del Oro from Arkansas. They were, in the picturesque vernacular of the cattlemen, nesters. The lizard, an only son, was one of those rat-faced, shifty-eyed, loose-mouthed male creatures who know everything about everybody and spend the major part of their days telling it. It was on one of those social occasions when the lizard was entertaining a group of idlers on the platform in front of the store that I first heard of the two old prospectors and their partnership girl. End of chapter one. At the Oracle Store. Yes, sir, said the lizard. I'm a telling you that them thar partners and their gal, Marta, her name is, are the beatinest outfit ye or any other man ever seed. Ain't nobody can figure em out, no how. They been here nigh about five year, too. Me and Paul Ma, we been here eight year ourselves coming this fall. Yes, sir, they're sure a queer actin' lot. The lizard had so evidently made his introductory remarks for my benefit that some sort of acknowledgment was unquestionably due. What are they, miners? Uh-huh, they're working a claim, making enough to live on, I reckon. Leastways, they're a livin'. But that ain't it. It's that that there gal of theirn. He shook his head and heaved a troubled sigh. Law, law and no one could have failed to mark the eager viciousness of the lizard's expression as the loose-mouthed creature ruminated on the delectable gossip he was about to offer. 
You see, it's like this. Them two old timers had this here gal with them when they first come into the canyon down yonder. She was a kid, long about fourteen then. Now, there ain't nobody can tell for sure who she is, nor where she come from. They say as how old Bob and Thad found her when they was a prospecting once down on the border somewheres. Took her away from some Mexican outfit or other. Maybe it's so, and maybe it ain't. But everybody allows how she ain't come from no good sort no how. Cause if she had, why wouldn't the partners tell it? And take a look at this dad beaten father arrangement. Take their names, for instance. One is Bob Hill, t'other is Thad Grove. And what's the gal's name but Martha Hillgrove? Hillgrove, you kitch it? And one week old Bob, he'll be her pappy. And the next week old Thad, he's her pa. And the gal, she just naturally allows they both her daddies. My God, it's enough to drive a decent man plumb loony and try and figure it out. The lizard's friends laughed. Oh, you can laugh, but I'm a-telling you thar's something wrong somewheres, and I ain't the only one what says so neither. Won't nobody over here in Oracle have nothing to do with her, will they? He turned to the loungers for confirmation. She's a plum beauty, too, and a mighty cute little piece. Regular spitfire, if you get her started. And smart. Say, she bosses them poor old partners till they're scared mighty nigh to death of her. And proud. Huh. She's too all fire proud to suit some of us. The crowd grinned. The lizard sure ought to know, said one. How about it, lizard? came from another. You been a-trying to make up to her ever since she moved into your neighborhood, ain't you? Y'all don't need to mind about me, retorted the lizard with a vicious leer. My day'll happen long yet. You notice I ain't drawed what Chuck Billings got. Chuck Billings, he continued for the benefit of anyone who might not be well versed in Kenyatta del Oro history, he was one of George Wheeler's punchers, and he took up with her one evening when she was a coming home from St. Jimmy's. And I'll be dad burned if her old prospecting daddies didn't work on Chuck till George just naturally had to send him into the hospital at Tucson. Chuck, he ain't never showed up in this neighborhood since, neither. I heard as how George told him if he did get well and dast come back, he'd take a try at him himself. Good for George. Eh? What's that? Does George Wheeler live in the Kenyatta del Oro, too? Nah, Wheeler, he's got a big cow ranch just back here from Oracle Peace. George, he rides all the canyon country, though. Him and his punchers. And us folks down in the canyon, we go through his horse pasture when we come up here to the Oracle for anything. George and his wife, they're about the only folks what'll have any tuck with that partnership gal. But shucks, George and his wife, they'd be good to anybody. Take St. Jimmy and his ma now. They have her round, of course. St. Jimmy is your minister, I suppose. He's what? A minister. Clergyman, you know. A preacher. Oh, you mean a parson. Shucks. Nah. St. Jimmy, he's just one of these here fellas what's everybody's friend. He lives with his ma up in the mountain above Juniper Spring, about three mile from the Wheeler's Ranch, just off the canyon trail after you come up into the hills. A little white house it is. You can see it from most anywheres. His real name's Burton. He's a doctor, er was, for he got to be a lunger. He was a living back east when he took sick. Then him and his ma, they come to this country. He's well enough here, peers like, but they do say he doesn't leave the Arizona and go back to his doctoring again like he was. He's a funny cuss. Plays the flute to beat anything. You can hear him most any time of a pretty evening. He'll roost up on some rock on the side of the mountain somewheres and toot away till plumb midnight. But he won't never play when you ask him. Now for any of the dances we have here in the Oracle neither. I heard George Wheeler say once as how St. Jiminy were right smart of a doctor back to his home where he come from. You see, St. Jiminy, St. Jimmy, he's been a-teachin' this here gal of the partners book learning. The lizard opened his wide mouth in a laugh which showed every yellow tooth in his head. I'll say he's teachin' her. 
I've seen them together up on the mountains and in the canyon more than once. Book learning. Ha! <laughs> you don't need to take my word for it, neither. You can ask anybody about what decent folks thinks of Martin Hillgrove. She... How much more the lizard would have said on his favorite topic will never be known, for at that moment a man appeared in the open doorway of the store. Not one of the group of loungers spoke, but every eye was turned on the man who stood looking them over with such cool contempt. He was dressed in the ordinary garb of civilization, but his dark, impassive countenance, with the raven black hair and eyes, was not to be mistaken. The man was an Indian. Presently, without a word, the red man stepped past the loungers and walked away up the road. Silently they watched until the Indian was out of sight. The lizard drew a long breath. "'That thar's Natachi. He's Injun. He lives all alone somewheres in the mountains, way up at the head of the Kenyatta del Oro. He's one of them thar school Injuns. Talks like a regular book when he wants to, but mostly he won't say nothing to nobody. Wears white clothes all right like you see. Goes round just like all the Injuns used to which goes to show, I claim, that an engine is an engine no matter how much they try to larn him. That's right, agreed one of the listeners. He's a real sociable cuss, ain't he? commented another with a grin. Him and St. Jiminy's friendly enough, said the lizard, and I know the old partners claim he ain't no harm, but I ain't having no truck with him myself. This here's a white man's country, I say. A chorus of... You bet, that's what, and you're a shoutin', approved the lizard's sentiments. Then another voice said, Do you reckon this here Natachi really knows anything about that old lost mine in the canyon like some folks seem to think? The lizard wagged his head in a solemn and pretentious silence, signifying that, however ready he might be to talk about the partner's girl, the mine with the iron door was not a subject to be lightly discussed in the presence of a stranger. End of chapter 2 The Partner's Girl The house in the Canyon of Gold, where the partners and their girl lived, was little more than a cabin of rough unpainted boards. But there was a wide porch overrun with vines and a vegetable garden with flowers. Beyond the garden there was a rude barn or shelter, built as the Indians build, of sahuaro poles and mud, with a small corral made of thorny ocotillo, and the place as a whole was roughly enclosed by an old fence of mesquite post and barbed wire. On every side the mountain rose, ridge and dome and peak, into the sky, and night and day, through summer droughts and winter rains, the canyon creek murmured or sang or roared on its way from the woodsy heart of the Catalinas to lose itself in the sandy wastes of the desert below. The little mine where the partners worked was across the creek a hundred yards or more from the kitchen door. It was that time of year when, if the rain gods of the Indians have been kind, the deserts and mountains of Arizona riot in a blaze of color. On the mountainside, silvery-white Apache plumes and graceful wands of brilliant scarlet mallow were nodding amid the lilac of the loco weed, while in every glade and damp depression the gold of the buckbean shone in settings of brightest green, and on the canyon floor the pink-white bloom of canyon anemone, with yellow primroses and whispering bells, made points and patches of light in the shadow of the rocky walls. It is not enough to say that the partner's girl fully justified the lizard's somewhat qualified admiration. There was something more, something that neither the lizard nor his kind could appreciate. She was rather boyish, perhaps, as girls reared in the healthful out-of-door atmosphere are apt to be, but it was a dainty boyishness, if sturdy, that in no way marred the exquisite feminine qualities of her beauty. Her hair and eyes were dark, and her cheeks richly colored with good health and sunshine. And she looked at one with disconcerting combination of innocence and frankness which, together with the charm of her sex, was certain to fix the attention of any mere male. 
whatever his station in life or previous condition of servitude. In short, the strangeness of Marta Hillgrove's relationship to the grizzled old partners, with the mystery of her real parentage, was not at all needed to make her the talk of the countryside. She was the kind of a girl that both men and women instinctively discuss, though for quite different reasons. Bob Hill put his empty coffee cup down that Saturday morning with a long breath of satisfaction and felt for the pipe and the sack of tobacco in his shirt pocket. "'There's nothing to it, daughter,' he remarked, his faded blue eyes twinkling and his leathery, wrinkled old face beaming with pride and love. "'If Mother Burton larns you any more cooking, that and me will founder ourselves, sure. I'm here to maintain that one whiff of breakfast like that would make one of them Egypt mummies claw himself right out of his pyramid.' Thad Grove grunted a scornful, pessimistic, protesting grunt, and rubbed the top of his totally bald head with aggressive vigor. "'She ain't your daughter, Bob Hill. Not this week. It's my turn to be daddy, and you know it. You're all us a-trying to gouge me out of my rights.' Marta's laughter was as unaffected as the song of the cardinal that, at that moment, was waking the canyon echoes. Patting Thad's arm affectionately, she said, "'Make him play fair, Daddy. Make him play fair. I'll back you up every time he tries to cheat.' "'By smoke!' ejaculated Bob. "'I clean disremembered what day it was today. But tomorrow is another week, and she'll be mine all right then.' He glared at Thad triumphantly. "'I tell you, partner, just a thinking of me going to be Daddy to a gal like her makes me all set up.' I've sure got a feeling that tomorrow is the day we'll dig clean through to our bonanza. Huh? retorted Thad. I got a feeling we ain't going to dig into no bonanza tomorrow, nor nothing else. Why not? demanded Bob. Cause tomorrow's Sunday, ain't it? Holy cats, but you're a-getting loonier and loonier. If you keep on a-dying at the top, you won't fit to be daddy to nobody. I'll just up and get myself a pint of Guardian for my off weeks. That's what I'll do. I may be a dine at the top, returned Bob, but by smoke I ain't covering no alkali flat under my hat like you be. As for us working Sundays, I know we ain't allowed in general, but it's a plum sin if we can't, just for tomorrow, with me all set like I am. He looked at Marta appealingly. "'Whatever my gal says goes,' said Thad. Bob continued persuasively. "'You see, honey, I've got it all figured out "'that when we get in about three feet further than we'll make today, "'we're bound to uncover our everlasting fortunes. "'You want us all to be rich, don't you?' "'It's no use,' said the girl firmly. "'You both know well enough that I will not permit you to break the Sabbath.' St. Jimmy's mother says it's no way for us Christians to do, and that settles it. Anything that Mother Burton says is wrong is wrong. You both consider yourselves Christians, don't you? You're dead right, daughter, said Thad, with an air of gentle complacency. I hadn't a mite of a notion to work on Sunday myself. I wouldn't go so far as to say I was much of a Christian, but... He glared at his partner. It's a cinch I'm no Zulu. As for anybody that intimates we got a chance to uncover a fortune anywhere in that hole out there, between the dump and China, <laughs> well, I hate to tell you what sort of a Christian I think he is. Bob grinned cheerfully. Maybe I ain't so much of a Christian neither, he agreed. But if I'd been that old pharaoh what built them pyramids... The girl interrupted. Now there you go again. This is the second time. What in the world started you talking about Egypt and pyramids and pharaoh and mummies and things like that? Oh, I just happened to make a peek into one of them books that St. Jimmy got us to buy for you. That's all, returned the old-timer with a sly wink at the smiling girl. And anyway, it seems like I ought to know something about mummies by this time, after living as long as I have without their... He pointed a long, gnarled finger at his partner. Egypt or Arizona, living or dead, it's all the same, I reckon. A mummy's a mummy wherever you find it. Thad rubbed his bald head with deliberate care. 
Daughter, does Mother Burton's brand of Christianity say anything about what a man should do to his enemies? Indeed it does, returned the girl. It says we must love our enemies and forgive them. All right, all right. And what does it say about loving and forgiving your friends, eh? Why, nothing, I guess. Course it don't, cried the old prospector in shrill triumph. Course it don't, and do you know why? I'll tell you why. It's because it's so doggone easy to forgive an enemy compared to what it is to forgive a friend. That's why. The good book knows tain't necessary to say nothing about friends, cause it's just as natural and virtuous to hate a friend as tis to love an enemy. That's what I'm a-meanin'. Marta was not in the least disturbed over this exchange of courtesies by her two fathers. Rising from the table, she laughingly remarked that if they were not too busy, they might saddle her horse, as she must go to Oracle for supplies. Whereupon the partners went to the barn, leaving their girl free to clear away the breakfast things, wash the dishes, and finish her morning housework. It was an unwritten law of the partnership that the particular father of the week should stand obligated to the parental responsibilities of the position. It was by no means the last of his duties that he must endure the criticisms of the other upon the way he was bringing up his daughter. It seemed scarcely necessary to add that criticism was never wanting and that it was never without directness and point. To compensate for this burden of responsibility, the parent was permitted to say, My gal, when the critic, by the rules of the game, must invariably say, That gal of yorn. While Thad the father was currying his daughter's horse, Nugget, a bright little pinto, Bob squatted comfortably on his heels, his back against the wall of the barn. "'Partner,' he said, as one who speaks after mature deliberation, "'I ain't meaning to mix none in your family affairs, "'but as a friend, I'm feeling constrained to remark "'that you ain't doing right by that gal of yourn no how.' Marta's father was making a careful examination of the Pinto's off forefoot and seemed not to hear. Bob continued, "'Anybody can see that she comes mighty nigh being grown up. First thing you know, somebody will make her understand all at once that she's a woman, and then—' Thad dropped the Pinto's foot and glared at his partner over the horse's back. "'Then what?' "'Then she'll be wanting to know things, and it might be too late to tell her.' "'You mean that I ought to tell my gal what we know about her?' demanded Marta's father. "'Is that what you're trying to say?' "'You guessed it, partner.' returned the critical one cheerfully it's time that your gal knowed about herself being her daddy it's up to you to tell her the other exploded which is exactly what i tried all last week to tell you when you was her daddy you blamed old numbskull and you wouldn't hear listen to me a healthy father you are when it's your daughter that ought to be told you can't even whisper but when she's mine, you can yell your fool head off, tell me what I ought to do. Besides, you said yourself that we don't actually know enough to tell her anything. But that was last week, you see, returned Bob calmly. You was doing the talking then. Now I'm telling you. When Thad, without replying, fell to rubbing Nugget's glossy hide with such energy that the little horse squirmed like a schoolboy undergoing maternal inspection, Bob continued, "'Marta is bound to know when she stops to think about it that she just can't have two fathers. It's plumb unnatural, even for two such daddies as she's got. So far she ain't give it much thought.' She's sort of growed up with the idea and accepted things as young folks do. Up to a certain time, that is. My point is that from now on her time is liable to come any day. Right now, if she thinks of it at all, she just smiles and plays the game with us. But that's because she's mostly kid yet. You wait till the woman in her is woke up. Right there she'll quit playing and something is due to happen. You ain't doing right by your daughter, Thad, not to tell her. You sure ain't. Thad Grove faced his old partner miserably. I know you're right, Bob. Marta ought to be told what we know about her. I can see that it'll look mighty bad to her some day if she ain't. But 
Hang darn it. It's just like you said last week. We don't know enough for me to tell her anything. If I was to tell her what little we do know, it would look a heap sight worse to her than it possibly can with her not being told anything, like she is now. The way I figure, if the gal don't know nothing, she's got a chance to ride over it. But if she knows the little that we know, she'll be plumb ruined. I don't reckon it's near as bad as that, partner, said the other soothingly. I'm here to tell you that there ain't nothing could ruin that gal of yourn. And this, the fire of old Thad's soul flared up anew. Is that so? he returned in a voice of withering scorn. Is that so? Well, I'm a-telling you that you can ruin anybody. St. Jimmy, for instance, retorted Bob with sarcasm. Yes, St. Jimmy, you can't tell what sort of a scoundrel St. Jimmy would have been if he hadn't happened to a turned sick. There's many a man in the pen right now, just on account of having too much good health. I reckon you're speaking gospel for once, agreed Bob reluctantly. Then, as if he had not forgotten his critical privileges, he added, But there's something else that you ought to tell your gal. Something that the best authorities all agree ought to be told every gal by somebody. And being as you're her father, and she ain't never had no real ma, why, it would look like it was up to you. What's that? demanded Thad suspiciously. That's what they call love, returned the other gently. Grown up like Marta has, with just us two old dried-up desert rats, she don't know no more about love and its consequences than... than... nothing. Marta's father dropped his brush and kicked it viciously across the stable. Nugget danced with excitement. Love? Holy cats! What fool notion will take you next? You don't need to worry none. Some feller will happen along some day and tell her more about love in a minute than you've ever knowed in all your life. That's just it, returned the other. Some feller's bound to tell her, just like you say. He'll slip up on her quiet like when she ain't suspicionin' nothing and break it to her sudden before she knows where she's at. That's how them consequences happen. And that's why she ought to know beforehand, so she can be watchin' out. Thad was rubbing his bald head, seeking, apparently, for an answer sufficiently crushing, when a clear call came from the house. Daddy! Oh, Daddy, I'm ready! With frantic haste, the partners, working together as if they had never had a difference, saddled and bridled the pinto. Together they led the little horse to the house. When the girl was in the saddle, she looked down into their upturned faces with such an expression of girlish affection and womanly thoughtfulness that the two old men grinned with sheepish delight and pride. "'You will find your dinner all ready for you,' she said, while Nugget tossed his head, impatient to be off. "'It is on the table covered with cloth. I'll be home in time for supper. Adios!' She lifted the bridle rein, and the pinto loped away. The partners stood watching while she opened and closed the gate, cowboy fashion, without dismounting. With a wave of her hand, she rode up on the canyon while the two old men followed with their eyes until she passed from sight around a turn in the canyon wall. Thad spoke slowly. "'You're a plumb right, Bob. The gal has mighty nigh growed into a woman, ain't she? It don't seem more than a month or two, neither, does it?' It sure don't, returned the other softly. And ain't she a wonder, Thad? Ain't she just a natural-born wonder? She's all of that, agreed Thad. And then some. It plumb scares me, though, when I think of her finding out about herself and her all educated up by St. Jimmy and his mother like she is. Holy cats, Bob! What'll we do? She's bound to know some day, said Bob. She's bound to, sure, echoed Thad with a groan. But my God Almighty, ain't either of us got nerve to tell her now. If she hadn't been going to school to St. Jimmy these last five years, I mean, if she was like she would have been with just me and you to bring her up, 
it might not have mattered. But now, now it's going to be plain hell for her when she finds out. Bob murmured softly. Won't even let us work on Sundays, cause it ain't the right way for Christians like us to do. We ought to have told long ago that's what we ought to have done. Sure, we ought to have told her, cried Thad, just like we ought to have done a lot of things we ain't. But mourning over what ought to have been done ain't paying us nothing. What we're going to do, that's what we got to figure out. The gal's got to be told. Yes, returned Bob, and she's got to be told for some sneaking varmint beats us to it and tells her for true what me and you are only suspicioning. how you ever do it. How will I ever do it? shrilled Thad. Holy cats! I can't! How you ever do it yourself? Bob answered helplessly. I can't neither, and by smoke I won't. She's got to be told, insisted Thad. Sure she has, said Bob. End of chapter 3 St. Jimmy Dr. Jimmy Burton and his mother spent their first year in Arizona at Tucson and Oracle, but when they were satisfied that Jimmy could live if he gave up his too strenuous professional work and remained in the Southwest, and that if he did not follow that course he would as surely die, they built the little white house on the mountainside at Juniper Springs, above the Cañada del Oro. As Jimmy explained, it was quite necessary under the circumstances that they live where they could see out. It was during that first summer in Oracle that the neighbors began to speak of his tender care of his mother, for even in those days when he was too ill to do more than think, his thoughts were all for her. And so lovingly did he try to shield her from the pain of his suffering, so cheerfully did he accustom her to the thought of the utter hopelessness of his professional future, and so courageously, for her sake, did he accept the pitifully small portion that life offered him, that the people marveled at the spirit of the man. It was a question, they sometimes said, with a touch of sincere reverence in their voices, if Dr. Burton needed his mother as much as the doctor's mother needed him. But Jimmy and his mother knew that the truth of the matter was, they needed each other. And so, in their mutual need, both mother and son found compensation for their dreams that now could never come true. In place of the professional honors that were predicted with such confidence for her boy, and toward which she had looked with such pride, the mother saw her son honored by the love of the unpretentious country folk. From plans that had failed and hopes that were buried, Jimmy himself turned to the grandeur of the mountains and the beauty of the tree and bush and flower, to the limitless spaces of the desert and the peace of the quiet stars. The life of the great eastern city, with its hunger for fame, its struggle for riches, its endless tumult and its restless longings, faded farther and farther away. The simple, more primitive, more peaceful life of God's great unimproved world became every day more satisfying. To the roaming cowboys and miners and their kind, and to the people of the little mountain village, that tiny white house on the hill was known, and many a man, when things were going wrong, came to spend an hour with this friend whose understanding was so clear and whose counsel was so true. Many a girl or woman in need of comfort, strength, or courage came to sit a while with Mrs. Burton, and sometimes a tired rider of the range would hear in the twilight dusk the clear, sweet song of Jimmy's flute, and hearing would smile and lift his wide-brimmed hat, or perhaps a lonely prospector, camped for the night in some gulch or wash, would hear, and hearing would think again of things that, in his search for gold, he had forgotten. And this is how Dr. James Burton became St. Jimmy, and St. Jimmy's mother became Mother Burton to them all. It was natural that the good doctor should become Marta Hillgrove's teacher, and that Mrs. Burton should mother the girl who, until her father's brought her to the Cañada del Oro, had never known a woman's guiding love. 
Indeed, it was St. Jimmy and his mother and all that their friendship meant to Marta that had kept the preachers in that neighborhood. Never before since the beginning of their partnership had those wanderers stayed so long in one place. For four, nearly five, years Marta had been studying under St. Jimmy, a fair equivalent of the usual college course. With this textbook education she had received from Mother Burton the kind of training that such a woman would have given a daughter of her own, and yet these most excellent teachers knew no more of their pupil's history than did those thoughtless ones who so freely discussed the girl and looked at her askance for what they thought her parentage might be. It should be said, too, that this schooling which Marta had received from St. Jimmy and his mother was wholly a matter of love. As Dr. Burton explained to the partners, when they insisted that he should be paid same as a regular teacher, the work was really a blessing to him in that his pupil contributed more to his life than he could possibly give to hers, while Mother Burton warned the anxious fathers, gently but firmly, that if they ever said another word about pay, they would ruin everything. But as the years passed and she watched the amazing development of the girl's mind and saw the unfolding of her richly endowed womanhood, wise Mother Burton came to wonder sometimes if St. Jimmy's teaching was not more a matter of love than even he perhaps realized. On that spring morning when Marta rode to Oracle and her fathers discussed the problem that so troubled them, St. Jimmy sat in the yard before the cottage door. On every side he saw the mariposa tulips lifting their lovely orange cups and sweet pea blossoms swinging like pink and white fairies above the lilac carpet of wild verbena and purple fragrant hyptus, while against the rocks that were stained with splashes of gray and orange and red and yellow lichens stood the purple penstemon. The mountainsides below were wondrous with the scarlet glory of the Ocotillo and the indescribable beauty of the Choyas and Opuntias with their crowns and diadems of red and salmon and orange and pink. The slopes and benches of the lower levels were bright with great fields of golden brittle bush, and beyond these on the wide spaces of the mesa he could see the yuccas, our lord's candles, in countless thousands, raising their stately shafts with eight-foot clusters of creamy white bloom. Mrs. Burton, leaving her housework for a moment, came to stand in the doorway, when they had spoken of the beautiful sight that never failed to move them, calling each other's attention to different favorite views, St. Jimmy said, Mother, doesn't it all make you sort of hungry for something, something that can't be told in words? He laughed in boyish embarrassment. His mother smiled. Marta will be coming from Oracle with the mail, I suppose. This is Saturday, you know. Yes, I know, said Jimmy softly, and wondered if his mother guessed what it really was that he hungered for and could not talk about even to her. Mrs. Burton was turning back into the house when they heard someone coming up the trail from the canyon. A moment later the partners appeared. St. Jimmy and his mother knew at once that the old prospectors had come on business of greater moment than to make a mere neighborly call. When they had exchanged the customary greetings and Marta's fathers had assured their friends that the girl was well, Thad and Bob sat looking at each other in troubled silence. Well. Bob said at last, "'Why don't you go ahead? She's your gal this week. Being her daddy makes it your play, don't it?' Thad, rubbing his bald head desperately, made several ineffectual attempts to speak. At last, with a recklessness born of his inner struggle, he addressed Mrs. Burton. "'You see, ma'am, me and my partner here's been taking notice lately how my gal Marta is due, first thing we know, to be a growed-up woman. She is indeed, replied Jimmy's mother with an encouraging smile. Yes, ma'am, that's what me and Bob here took notice. And we've been figuring up that maybe it was time she knowed what we know about her. You and your son knows the same as everybody does, I reckon, that we ain't Marta's real honest-to-God daddies. Yes, said Mrs. Burton, but we have never in any way mentioned the matter to Marta. 
No, ma'am, said Thad, and we ain't neither. And that's just what's the matter now, put in Bob. The gal ain't never been told nothing. Mrs. Burton looked at her son. I am sure that you men are right, said St. Jimmy. I've been wanting to talk with you about it. You ought to tell Marta everything you know of her and her people. How she came to you. Everything. The partners consulted each other silently. Then Thad turned to Marta's teacher. The old prospector's faded blue eyes were fixed on the younger man's face with a steady, searching gaze that permitted no evasion, even if St. Jimmy had been disposed to parry the question. "'Is there, to your thinking, any particular reason why my gal ought to be told at this particular time?' St. Jimmy smiled reassuringly. "'No particular reason, as far as I know,' he said. Of course you realize that there has always been more or less talk. Sooner or later the girl is bound to hear it. She should be fortified with the truth. Again, Bob and Thad looked at each other helplessly. And if the truth ain't just what you might call fortifying, what then? said Thad at last. Yes, echoed Bob. What then? What if my partner and me can't say that all the gossip is talking ain't so? St. Jimmy did not answer. Mother Burton looked away. Old Thad rubbed his bald head in mournful meditation. "'Dr. Burton,' said Bob slowly, as one feeling his way amid conversational dangers, "'Thad and me ain't to say blind if we be getting old. We can still tell color when we run across it.' He consulted his partner with a look, and— Thad nodded his head in approval. Bob continued, "'We're all mighty proud of what you've been doing for our gal.' He caught himself quickly. "'Excuse me, partner, for your gal, I mean.' Thad raised his hand, a gesture which signified that, in the stress of the situation, he waved the fine point of their usual courtesy, and for this crucial occasion acknowledged their joint fatherhood. Old Bob swallowed, with difficulty, something that seemed to obstruct his usual freedom of speech. Um, "'I reckon you understand, sir, that we ain't no ways lacking in appreciation and gratitude to you and your ma for helping Marta to grow up into the young woman she is. My partner and me, we sure done what we could, and we'd been glad to have done more if it had been possible. But it wasn't, not for us.' And we're sensible to what it all means to our gal. If she wasn't trained up and all educated like you and your ma has made her, it wouldn't much matter what her own folks was or how she first come to us. I understand, said St. Jimmy gently, and I know that the girl could not love you men more if you were, in fact, her own fathers. I know, too, that nothing could make her love you less but I am convinced that she should know all that you know about her. "'We would have told her the story long ago,' said Thad, "'if only we'd have knowed a little more than we do, "'or maybe if we hadn't knowed as much, "'or if what little we do know didn't look so almighty bad.' "'It will look a heap worse to her now than it ever did to us,' said Bob. "'It sure will,' agreed Thad. And so, you see, we've been waiting and putting it off, hoping that we would maybe somehow find out something that, as it is, is lacking. He appealed to Mrs. Burton. You can see how it is, can't you, ma'am? I understand, said the good woman, gently. But I agree with my son. Whatever it is, the story will make no difference in Marta's love for you, just as it has made no difference in your love for her. Yes, said Thad, but how about the difference it might make to— He paused and looked at his partner helplessly. Ahem, to, I mean— Bob spoke quickly. To you and St. Jimmy, ma'am, what difference will it make to you folks? Thad drew a deep breath of relief and rubbed his bald head with satisfaction. Mother Burton met them bravely with— Nothing that you have to tell can change our feeling for Marta. I could not love her more if she were my own daughter. The two old men looked at St. Jimmy eagerly. 
You dead sure that nothing would make you change toward our gal? demanded Bob. You plumb certain be you, sir, said old Thad. St. Jimmy smiled reassuringly. As certain as I am of death, he answered. With an air of excited relief, Thad faced his partner. That being the case, I move, partner, that we tell Dr. Burton here what we know, and he can tell our gal or not as he sees fit, and when he sees fit. Just what I was about to offer myself, returned Bob. You go ahead. End of chapter four. The Prospector's Story It was about sixteen years ago, Thad began at last, Seventeen in the middle of next month, said Bob. Thad continued. Me and my partner here was a-coming into Tucson from the Santa Rosa Mountains, which is down close to the Mexican line. We'd been out for about three months and was needing supplies. Long late in the afternoon of the second day from where we'd been working, we stopped at a little ranch house about three miles this side of the line for water. We knowed the old Mexican man and woman that lived there all right. Most everybody did. Everybody like us old desert rats, that is. And didn't nobody know any good of them either. Some claim that the old woman was Snor Jack's mother, said Bob. Snor Jack, you know, is half Mex and an almighty bad citizen, too. He's somewhere across the line right now, hiding out for a killing he and his crowd made in a hold-up about the same time that we're telling you of. Thad took up the story. Well, sir, we'd filled our water bags and was standing talking with the old woman who'd come to watch us. The man, he was away, it appeared. When all at once a little boy come trotting round the corner of the cabin from behind somewheres. "'About three or four he was,' said Bob. "'About that,' agreed Thad. "'And when he seed us, he just stopped short, kind of scared-like, and stood there crying. "'Well, sir, me and Bob tumbled in a holy minute that he didn't belong there. "'We knowed them old Mexicans didn't have no kid that wasn't growed up long ago, "'and this little chap didn't look like a Mexican youngster no how.' The old woman acted kind of rattled at us looking at the kid so sharp and started in telling us that the muchachito was one of her grandsons. That sounded fair enough at first, but when she turned and yelled at the kid in Mex, giving him the devil for not staying behind the house like she'd told him, we see that something was wrong. He didn't savvy Mex no more than we do Chinese. While the poor little cuss was standing there scared stiff and crying, not knowing what the old woman wanted, Bob here went down on one knee and held out his hands, inviting-like. "'Come here, sonny,' says he to the kid in English. "'Come on over here and let's have a look at you.' "'Well, sir, that youngster gave a funny little laugh right through his tears and come running. The old woman didn't know what to do, but I was keeping one eye on her so she didn't dare try to start anything much. Bob, he asked the youngster, What's your name, sonny? And the little fella answered back, bright as a dollar, My name's Marta. Marta, says Bob, looking up at me puzzle-like. That's a funny name for a boy. I ain't no boy, said the kid, quick as a flash. I'm a girl, I am. "'And by smoke she was,' ejaculated Bob. "'Yes,' continued Thad. "'And when the old woman seen that the little gal was talking to us, "'the old woman, she didn't savvy a word of anything but Mex, "'but she could tell what was going on. "'When she see it, she just naturally grabbed the youngster "'and yanked her into the house and shut the door. "'Me and Bob made camp not far away that night, "'and after supper, and it had got good and dark, we was sitting by the fire, talking things over, when all at once we heard the sound of a wagon and a child screaming, sort of choked-like. You can believe we wasn't long getting to where the sound come from. Them Mexicans was lighting out with that little girl for across the border. 
By that time, me and my partner were so plumb sure that there was something wrong that we didn't waste no more strength in foolishness. We just proceeded to give that hombre the third degree till he ups and confesses that the baby was left with them by some white folks who was on a hunting trip and that they was only keeping the youngster till her daddy and mammy came back for her. You can guess how quick me and Bob was to believe any such yarn as that. So we figured the safest thing to do was to take the baby ourselves into Tucson, which we done. Well, sir, by the time we struck town, that little gal had made such a hit with us both that we couldn't near think of giving her up. Darndest affectionate kid that ever was, put in Bob. Started right off first thing loving us two old rapscallions like we'd always belonged to her and calling us both daddy. We sure done our best to find her real folks, though, said Thad. We stayed in Tucson for more than a month, but the authorities nor nobody couldn't get no hint nowhere about any kid being lost nor stole nor nothing. Things was moving pretty fast in this country them days, and the sheriff always had his hands full. So it wasn't long till everybody got busy with some fresh excitement, and me and Bob was left with the baby on our hands. There didn't appear to be nothing else we could do, so we just decided that providence or good luck or something had fixed it so's us two old mavericks was blessed with a offspring whether we was regularly entitled to one or not. Then pretty soon we moved on over into the Graham Mountains and just naturally took her along. We both was loving her so by now that we was about to fight to see which one was to be her daddy when we compromised by agreeing to take turn and turn about week by week and that's how we come to give her both our names, Hillgrove. Her first name is Martha, we suppose, but Martha was the best she could ever tell us, and that's about all there is of it up to the time we fetched her here and you started in teaching her. You see, ma'am, said Bob, this here is the way me and Thad has got it figured. The baby must have been left with them Mexicans where we found her, cause she ain't Mexican nor any part Mexican herself. Well, what kind of white folks do you reckon would go away and leave a little gal like that with such an outfit? They couldn't have left her accidental like, cause if they had, they'd have come back for her, and then they'd been hunting us. With all the fuss we made about it in Tucson, somebody would have knowed something about her, sure. If her people hadn't wanted to get shet of her on account of them being the sort they was, and there ain't been no time since that me and Thad has been hard to find. Don't you see? Her folks couldn't have been decent, even if her father and mother was. Was, I mean, even if she was born all regular and right, which don't look no way likely. Any way you take it. They must have been a bad sort to throw away a baby like her. You can bet they was, added Thad mournfully, for it's a dead immortal cinch that them old Mexicans couldn't have come by her no other way, cause they never went anywhere, and if they had stole her, it sure would have raised enough interest in the country for somebody to a heard about it. No, sir, take it any way you like. It just naturally looks bad. And the old prospector finished with an air of relief. That's all me and my partner knows about it. St. Jimmy did not speak. He was evidently deeply moved by the strange story. Mrs. Burton was drying her eyes. The partners waited with no little anxiety. At last, Bob asked timidly, Be you still thinking, sir, as how our gal ought to be told? Reluctantly, St. Jimmy answered, I'm afraid that Marta must know. He looked at his mother. I am sure she must know, said Mrs. Burton with quiet decision, and you, my son, are the one to tell her. It will come to her easier from you, her teacher, than from anyone else. Yes, ma'am, cried Thad eagerly. That's the way me and Bob figured it. Will you do it, sir? asked Bob. Yes, said St. Jimmy, 
I will tell her. The partners sighed with relief. That sure lets us out of a mighty bad hole, said Thad. It'll be a heap easier on our gal, too. It sure will, echoed Bob. Ain't nobody can tell what kind of god-awful mess us old fools would have made of it. We're almighty grateful to you, sir, for helping us out. We are that, came from Thad with pathetic earnestness. Bob said hurriedly, And now that it's all settled, partner, I move me and you pulls out of here before our gal happens long. I wouldn't be catched by her right now for all the money we're going to have when we strike that big vein we're tunneling for. Which ain't so much as it might be at that, retorted Thad. You can never tell, returned Bob with his usual cheery optimism. Gold is where you find it. When Bob and Thad were gone, St. Jimmy and his mother, discussing the matter, were forced to agree with the partners. It certainly did look bad. In fact, it looked so bad that St. Jimmy was not at all happy under the burden of the responsibility which the old prospectors had shifted from their own shoulders to his. He foresaw that it would not be easy to tell this young woman, whom he had educated and whose fine, sensitive pride he knew so well, this story that he had just heard from her two foster fathers. When Marta stopped at the Burtons on her way home from Oracle, Later in the day, neither St. Jimmy nor his mother mentioned the partner's visit, and there seemed to be no opportunity for the girl's teacher to tell her the story he was sure she should know. Some other time, he told himself, it would be easier, perhaps. While the partner's daughter was riding home from the Burtons that afternoon, and the partners were at work in their little mine, Natachi the Indian stood on a point of rock, high on the mountainside, so high that he could look beyond the canyon of gold and afar off, over the brown desert that, from the foothills of the Catalinas, stretches away, weary mile after weary mile, until, in the shadowy blue distance, it is lost in the sky. To those of us who are accustomed to the present-day Indian in his white man's garb, doing the white man's work on the white man's roads and ranches, Natachi would have aroused peculiar, not to say amusing, interest. From the single feather in the headband which bound his long raven black hair to his beaded moccasins, he was dressed in the picturesque costume of his savage fathers. Save for a broad hunting knife, he was armed only with the primitive bow and arrows. He was in the best years of his manhood, and his face and bearing would have graced the hero of a Fenimore Cooper Indian tale. But however much he seemed out of step with the times, that lone figure standing sentinel-like on the rocky point fitted his wild surroundings. So indeed might one of his ancestors have stood to watch the strange new human life when it first began to move along those trails that, until then, had known only the sandaled and moccasined feet of prehistoric peoples. An hour passed. The Indian held his place as motionless as the rock against which he leaned, while his somber gaze ranged over those mighty reaches of desert and mountain and sky. High over Rice Peak a golden eagle wheeled on guard before the nest of his royal mate. But Natachi seemed not to see. From a dead oak on Samaniego Ridge a red-tailed hawk screamed his shrill challenge. The Indian apparently did not hear. A company of buzzards circled above a dark object in the wash below the Wheeler Ranch corrals. Natachi gave no heed. A ground squirrel leaped to a nearby rock to sit bolt upright, with bright eyes fixed upon the red man. The while he sounded a chirping note of inquiry, but the Indian's gaze remained steadfastly fixed on that distant landscape where he could see a cloud of dust that was raised by a swiftly moving automobile on the Oracle Road. On the Bankhead Highway there were two similar clouds. In the purple haze beyond the point of the Torrellita Mountains, a streamer of smoke marked the position of a southern Pacific overland train that was approaching Tucson from the western coast. The face of the red watchman on the mountainside was set stern and grim. In his somber eyes there was a gleam of savage meaning. 
The sun was just touching the tops of the Tucson hills when the Indian started and leaned forward with sudden, quickened interest. No ordinary power of human vision would have noticed that black speck in the vast stretch of country, much less could the ordinary observer have said exactly what it was that had attracted the Indian's attention. But Natachi saw that the tiny dot, moving so slowly on the old road into the Cañada del Oro, was a man. His interest was excited to an unusual degree because the man was walking, unaccompanied by even a pack burrow. And now the evening wind from the desert, fragrant with the smell of greasewood, mesquite, and cat claw, swept along the mountainside. The Tucson hills were massed dark blue with their outlines sharply cut against the colors of the sunset. Natachi, watching, saw that lone figure on the trail below enter the canyon of gold and lose itself in the gathering dusk. As the shadows thickened, the night prowlers on padded feet crept from their dark retreats into the gloom. Owls and bats on silent wings swept by. Old ghosts of the dead past stirred again on the old desert and mountain ways. In the deeper dusk that now filled the canyon, voices awoke, strange, murmuring, whispering, phantom voices that seemed to come from an innumerable company of dreary, hopeless souls. The light went out of the western sky. Details of plant and rock and bush were lost. Weird and wild, like a mysterious spirit brooding over the scene, the dark figure of the Indian on the rock point above the canyon of gold was silhouetted against the starlit sky. In the little white house on the mountainside, St. Jimmy was thinking on the strange story that the partners had told. In their home beside the canyon creek, the old prospectors and their partnership daughter were sleeping, with no dreams of the strange leading of the tangled threads of lives to the canyon of gold. Far away to the south, in old Mexico, two men sat in a cantina, about them, on a table with glasses and a bottle of mescal, lay a crudely drawn map. As they talked together in low tones, they referred often to the rude sketch which bore in poorly written words, La mina con la puerta de fierro en la cañada del oro, the mine with the door of iron in the canyon of gold. End of chapter 5 Night. Night skies are kind to those who love the stars. To others they are heavy with brooding fears. The man who was following the old road up the canyon of gold had made his way a mile or more from the point where he was last seen by the Indian when the deepening twilight warned him of the nearness of the night. It was evident from the pedestrian's irresolute movements and from his manner of nervous doubt in selecting a spot for his camp that not only was he a stranger in the Cañada del Oro, but as well that he was unaccustomed to such surroundings. He was a young man of about twenty-two or twenty-three years, tall but rather slender, with a face habitually clean-shaven but covered just now with a stubby beard of several days' growth. His skin, where it was exposed, was sunburned rather than tanned that deep color so marked in the out-of-doors men of the West. On the whole, he gave the impression, somehow, of one but recently recovered from a serious illness, and yet he did not appear over-fatigued, though the pack which he carried was not light, and he had evidently been many hours on the road. In spite of his rude dress and unkempt appearance due to his mode of traveling, there was in his bearing the unmistakable air of a man of business, but he was that type of business man that knows something more than the daily grind of money-making machines. His world, apparently, was not wholly a world of factories and banks and institutions of commerce. Forced at last by the approaching darkness to decide upon some place to spend the night, the traveler selected a spot beside the canyon creek a hundred yards from the road, but even after he had lowered his heavy back to the ground, 
he stood for some minutes looking anxiously about as if still uncertain as to the wisdom of his selection nor was the man's manner wholly that of inexperience suddenly without thought of his evening meal or any preparation for his comfort until the morning he climbed again up the steep bank to the road where he gazed back along the way he had come and studied the mountain sides with eyes of dread the man was in an agony of fear not until it was too dark to distinguish objects at any distance did he return to the place where he had left his pack and set about the necessary work of preparing his supper and making his bed hurriedly as best he could in the failing light he gathered a supply of wood and after several awkward failures succeeded in kindling a fire from his pack he took a small frying pan a coffee-pot a tin cup and a meagre supply of food with these and with water from the creek he made shift to prepare an unaccustomed meal several times he paused to stand gazing into the fire as if lost in thought again and again he turned his head quickly to listen often with a shuddering start he whirled to search the darkness beyond the flickering shadows as if in fear of what the light of his fire might bring upon him when he had eaten his poorly prepared supper he spread his blankets and lay down there was something pitiful in the trivial and puny details of this lone stranger's camp in the wild canana del oro there was something sinister in the night-life that crept and crawled in the darkness about him there was something pathetic in the man's lying down to sleep unprotected amid such surroundings the mountains are very friendly to those who know them to those who know them not they are grim and dreadful when the day is gone night skies are kind to those who love the stars to others they are heavy with brooding fears the timid life of the wild places is good company for those who know each voice and sound to others every movement is a menace every call a voice of danger when the sun is down cowering in his blankets the man listened for a while to the strange and fearful things that stirred in the nearby bushes on the rocky ledges and on the mountain sides above he heard the canyon voices whispering murmuring moaning the night deepened the boisterous song of the creek became a sullen growl the mountain walls seemed to close in the stars above the peaks and ridges were lonely and far away the campfire so tiny in the gloom burned low the sleeping man groaned and stirred uneasily as if in pain and a fox that had crept too close slipped away in startled flight the man cried out in his sleep and a coyote that was following the scent of the camp up the wind turned aside to slink into the thicket of mesquite the man awoke and springing to his feet stood as if at bay and a buck that was feeding not far away lifted his antlered head to listen with weary alertness from somewhere on the heights came the cry of a mountain lion and at the sound the night was suddenly as still as death the man shuddered and quickly threw more wood on the dying fire again he lay down to cower in his blankets to sleep restlessly and to dream his troubled dreams in the first faint light of the morning a dark form might have been seen moving stealthily down the mountain above the stranger's camp the buck with a snort of fear leaped away crashing through the brush the prowling coyote fled down the canyon on every side the wild creatures of the night slunk into the dense covers of manzanita and buckthorn and cat claw silently as the gray shadows through which he crept natichi the indian drew near the place where the white man lay from behind a nearby bush the indian observed every detail of the camp when the form wrapped in the blanket did not stir the indian stole from his sheltering screen and with soft-footed noiseless movements inspected the stranger's outfit he even bent over the sleeping man to see his face the man moved tossing an arm and muttering swift as a fox the indian slipped away silent as a ghost he disappeared among the bushes 
the gray of the morning sky changed to saffron and rose and flaming red the shadowy trees and bushes assumed definite shapes the detail of the rocks emerged from the gloom the man awoke he had just finished breakfast when he heard the sound of horses hoofs on the road with a startled cry he leaped to his feet the lizard was riding toward him like a hunted creature the man drew back half crouching as if to escape but it was too late pale and trembling he stood waiting as the horseman drew up beside the road on the bank above the creek and sat looking down upon him and his camp end of chapter six the stranger's quest what's your name where are you from what are you doing here the lizard's preliminary inspection of the stranger and his camp might or might not have been prompted by a habit of caution when it was finished he called a loose-mouthed howdy and without waiting for a response to his greeting spurred his mount slipping and sliding with rolling stones and a cloud of dust down to the edge of the creek dismounting and throwing the bridle rein over his horse's head he slouched forward a vapid grin on his sallow weasel-like face i see you're smoking i loud as how i drop along and take a look at who's here bein as i war aimin to ride torical sometime to-day anyhow not as i've got anything particular to go thar fur nother cept it jest set in front of the store a spell and gas with the fellers there's allus a bunch hangin round of a sunday he looked curiously at the stranger's outfit and ignoring the fact that the camper had not spoken seated himself with the air of one taking his welcome for granted the stranger smiled the fear that had so shaken him a few moments before was gone and there was relief in his voice as he bade his visitor a quite unnecessary welcome you're a footin hit be ye the lizard continued with garrulous ease wall that's one way o goin but i'll take a good hoss for mine a feller'll jist naturally wear out quicker enough no matter how keerful he be never loud i had airy call to take an plum walk myself to death on purpose them's good blankets you've got thar need em to these nights if tis spring that thar coffee pot ain't no count though not for me that is wouldn't hold half what i'd take three times a day reg'lar he laughed loudly as if a good joke were hidden somewhere in his remarks if only the other were clever enough to find it you live in this neighbourhood do you the stranger asked what me oh sure my name's bill jansen live down the canyon a piece just below war the road comes in pa and ma and me live thar together we drifted in from arkansas eight years ago come this fall what's your name whar are ye from what are ye a doin here the stranger hesitated before he answered slowly my name is edwards hugh edwards i came here from tucson i want to prospect look for gold you know i heard there were some ah uh, places i think you call them in this canyon the lizard grinned a wide mouthed grin of superior knowledge it's plumb easy to see you know all about prospectin you're some educated i judge been to school in them thar college places a right smart lot ain't you now the other replied with some sharpness i suppose it is not impossible for one to learn how to dig for gold even if one has learned to read and write is it the lizard responded heartily but with tolerant superiority larn sure ain't nothin to pan and gold cept a lot of hard work and mighty poor pay anybody'll larn ye take the partners up yonder old bob hill and thad grove they'd he checked himself suddenly and slapped a lean thigh by glory i'll bet a pretty you've done come to find that thar old lost mine with the iron door eh ain't ye now 
he leered at the stranger with shifty close-set eyes his long head with its narrow sloping brow cocked sideways with what was meant to be a very knowing i have you now sir sort of air the man who had given his name as hugh edwards laughed really i can't say but i would object to finding any old mind if it was a good one would you the lizard shook his head solemnly and with a voice and manner that was nicely calculated to invite confidence replied thar's been a lot of people one time and another a huntin this mine with iron door thar was one bunch that come clean from spain and they had a map and everything you ain't got no map nor writin of any sort now have you no returned the stranger but i suppose it is true that there is gold to be found here the lizard was plainly disappointed but evidently deemed it unwise to press his inquiry oh sure thar's gold here's some for them what likes to work for it they've allus been a diggin in this here canyon and in these here mountains as ye can see by their old prospect holes everywhere but nobody ain't never made no big strikes yet thar's one fella a livin in these hills what don't dig no gold though and they do say too as how he knows more bout the old lost mine than ary other man a livin some says he even knows whar it's at the lizard shook his head solemnly you sure want to watch out for him too he's plumb bad that's what i'm a tellin you yes said hugh edwards encouragingly uh-huh he ain't no white man neither he's injun calls hisself natachi whatever that is he's one of these here school injuns gone wild again lives all alone way up in the upper part of the canyon somewhere whar he so blamed rough a goat couldn't get round and togs himself up with the sort of things them old-time injuns used to wear won't even use a gun just packs a bow and arrows i ain't got no use for an injun no how this here's a white man's country i say and this here natachi he's the worst i ever did see he'd plunk one of them thar errors of his'n into you error slit your throat any old time if he das i can't say for sure whether he knows about this mine with iron door or not but it's certain sure you got to watch him it's all right for that thar saint jimmy and them old partners to be friends with him if they like it but i know what i know hugh edwards did not overlook this opportunity to learn something of the people who lived in the canyon of gold and the lizard was more than willing to tell all he knew perhaps even to add something for good measure when at last the lizard arose reluctantly the stranger had heard every current version of the history and relationship of the two old prospectors and their partnership daughter with copious comments on their characters sidelights on their personal affairs their intercourse with their neighbors their business and every possible theory explaining them not that thar's anybody what really knows anything the lizard was careful to make this clear cept of course that old story about them a findin the gal somewheres when she warn't much more'n a baby which as i say ain't no way natural enough for anybody to believe cause babies like her ain't just found picked up anywhere as you may say without no pa nor ma nor nothin and if thar warn't something wrong about it what would them two old devils be so close mouthed fur why sir one time when i asked em about it just sort of interested and neighbourly like they rise up like they was a fixin to climb all over me yes they did ye can see yourself it ain't all straight whatever it is even a fellow like you can't help puttin two and two together if he's got any sense at all well he concluded regretfully i sure got to be gettin on't or oracle or hit won't be no use for me to go nohow he moved slowly toward his horse better come along he added this here trail toracle goes right past the partner's place and st jimmy's and george wheeler's best come along and see the country and get acquainted thanks said edwards but really i can't go to-day i want to get settled somewhere before i take much time for purely social matters you see huh grunted the lizard gettin settled ain't nothin it's all day till tomorrow ain't it 
then as if suddenly inspired by the possibilities of having a friend at the very source of so much interesting of speculative information the lizard added i'll tell you what ye do you come along with me as fur as the pardoner's place they'll help ye to get located they're all right that away and there ain't nothin them two old-timers don't know about the prospecting game and right up the canyon not more than half a quarter from them is an old cabin you could take it war built by some prospector long time ago george wheeler he told me seems the feller lived thar fur two or three year and then went away and didn't never come back you might have to fix the shack up a bit but that wouldn't be no work and there is allus some gold to be found up on down the creek the partners they'll you larn you how and maybe you can larn something bout them and that thar gal of theirn thank you returned edwards but i really can't go now i'm not packed yet you see but the lizard was not to be deprived of the advantage of his opportunity ah shucks what's the matter with ye grab your stuff and come along ye can't be standoffish with me because there seemed to be no way of refusing the invitation the stranger hastily threw his things together and with his pack on his back and set out up the canyon in company with the lizard on the steep side of the mountain above natachi creeping like a dark shadow among the rocks and bushes followed the two men saint jimmy that sunday morning was sitting with a book by the window but mother burton looking through the door from their tiny kitchen where she was busy with her household work could see that her son was not reading jimmy's book was open but his eyes were fixed upon the far distant horizon where the desert with its dreamy maze of colors becomes a faint blue shadow against the sky and jimmy's mother knew that his thoughts were as far from the printed page as that shadowy skyline was distant from the window where he sat often she had seen him in those moods sitting so still that the spirit seemed to have gone out from its temporary dwelling-place to visit for a little those places which lie so far beyond the horizon of all fleshly vision and earthly hopes and aspirations of what was he thinking she wondered if indeed it could be said at such times that he was thinking at all what was he seeing with that far-away look in his eyes as of one whose vision had been trained in the schools of suffering of disappointments and failures and disillusions to a more than physical strength was he communing with some one over there in that world beyond the skyline of material things was he merely dreaming of what might have been or was he living in what might be wise mother burton to know that there were certain rooms in her son's being that even her mother love could not unlock wise mother burton to understand to know when to speak and when to be still saint jimmy was aroused at last by the clatter of iron shod hoofs on the canyon trail an instant later nugget running with glorious strength and ease dashed into view and marta's joyous self came between the man at the window and the distant skyline another moment and the girl stood in the open doorway end of chapter seven the new neighbor but what a man is that is a matter of concern to every one who is called by circumstance to associate with him with a merry greeting to saint jimmy martyr ran straight to the welcoming arms of mother burton goodness me child the older woman exclaimed when she had kissed her and held her close for a moment as such mothers do you look as if as if you were going to jump right out of your skin i do declare and saint jimmy watching them silently agreed with his mother thinking that he had never seen the girl quite so animated her vivid flame-like beauty seemed to fill the house with joyous warmth and light while her laughter in quick response to mrs burton's words rang with such happy abandon and thrilled with such tingling excitement that her teacher knew something unusual must have happened what is it cried mother burton shaking the girl playfully and laughing with her what is the matter with you what are you so excited about have fad and bob struck it rich at last marta shook her head no but it is something almost as good we have a new neighbor mother burton looked from marta to her son 
inquiringly as if mildly puzzled to know why the mere arrival of a newcomer in the neighbourhood unusual as it was should cause such manifestations st jimmy smiling asked what is his name where is he from and what is he like the girl's face was glowing with colour and her eyes were bright as she answered his name is hugh edwards he came here from tucson i didn't quite understand where he lived before he went to tucson she paused and the ghost of a troubled frown fell across her brow but it was somewhere she finished brightly quite likely you are right said jimmy grave as a judge on the bench yes she continued and he has come here to stay he is awfully poor poorer than any of us why he hasn't even a burrow to pack his outfit had to pack it himself on his back and he has been sick too but he doesn't look a bit sick now she laughed a little laugh of charming confusion he looks as if as if oh as if he could do just anything you know what i mean you make it very clear murmured st jimmy mother burden made a curious little noise in her throat marta looked from one to the other suspiciously then a bit defiantly she said i don't care he does and he is different from anybody that ever came to the Kenyatta del oro before for that matter he is different from anybody that i have ever seen anywhere dear me murmured mother burton how interesting but how is he different dear the girl answered honestly i can't exactly tell what it is for one thing it is easy to see that he is educated but of course jimmy is too so it can't be that i'm sure too that he has lived in a big city somewhere and has known lots of nice people but so has jimmy i don't know what it is i judge she is not then one of our typical old prospectors said st jimmy again the girl's joyous unaffected laughter bubbled forth old he is no older than you are i suspect not quite so old and he has the nicest eyes almost as nice as you jimmy only only different somehow nice in another way i mean and he knows absolutely nothing about prospecting he is so green it is funny but he's going to live in the old dolphin cabin right next door to us and we're going to teach him fine said st jimmy with proper enthusiasm and managed somehow to hide the queer sinking pain that made itself felt suddenly deep down inside of him st jimmy was skilled by long practice in hiding pain dear me exclaimed mother burton this is interesting but i must finish my morning work she added moving toward the kitchen i'll help volunteered marta quickly and started after the older woman but mother burton answered no no i was almost finished when you came then catching the girl in her arms impulsively and looking toward her son whose face was turned again to the far-off horizon she added in a hurried whisper get him out of doors dear he has been sitting like that all this blessed morning make him go for a walk marta led her teacher straight to their favourite spot on the mountain side some distance from the house here in the shade of a gnarled and twisted cedar that for a century or more had looked down upon the varied life that moved through the canyon of gold below they had spent many an hour over the girls studies against the bowl of the tree they had contrived a rude shelf and pegs for hats and wraps mrs burton had contributed an old kitchen table and two chairs that neither rain nor sun could injure and there was a large flat-topped rock that served as bookcase and desk or for a variety of other purposes as it might happen on this occasion marta converted the rock into a couch by throwing herself full length upon it with the unconscious freedom of a schoolboy st jimmy seated himself in a chair and in defiance of all schoolmaster propriety elevated his feet to the table top they talked a while as neighbours will of the small affairs of the countryside but dr burton could see the martyr's thoughts were not of the things they were saying and so presently from her rocky couch the girl spoke again of the stranger who had come to be her nearest neighbour she described him now in fuller detail his eyes his voice his smile she contrasted him with the partners the lizard and with other men whom she had seen she imagined fanciful stories for his past and invented for him various wonderful futures and always she came back to the curious assertion that he was like her teacher only different and st jimmy as he listened 
asked an occasional encouraging question and studied her as in his old professional days he might have studied a patient never before had he seen the girl in such a mood it was as if something deep buried in her inner self was striving to break its way through to the surface of her being as a deep buried seed when its time comes forces its way through the dark earth to the light and sun then for some time the girl was silent with her head pillowed on one arm and her eyes half closed she lay as if she had drifted with the currents of her wandering thoughts into the quietude of dreams dreams that were as intangible yet as real as the blue haze and purple shadows through which she saw the distant desert and mountains and st jimmy too was still while his face was turned away toward the far-off horizon as if he saw there things which he might not talk about on the pine-clad heights of mount lemon there were a few scattered patches of snow that had not yet yielded to the spring but the air was soft and fragrant with the perfumes of warm earth and growing plants and opening blossoms there was the low hum of the bees that were mining in the fragrant cat-claw bushes for the gold they stored in their wild treasure houses in the cliffs not far away a gambrel partridge gallantly assured his plump gray mate who sat on the nest in the shelter of a tall mescal plant that there was no danger a sonora pigeon from the top of a lone sawaro called his soft deep-throated mating call and a vermilion flycatcher sprang into the air from his perch near by and climbed higher and higher into the blue and then after holding himself aloft for a moment puffed out his red feathers and twittering in a mad love ecstasy came drifting back like a brilliant coloured thistle bloom or an oversized and fiery tinted dandelion tuft martyr's teacher had not forgotten that the partners had trusted him to tell their girl the things that they st jimmy and his mother were agreed she should know and st jimmy meant to tell her but somehow this did not seem to be the time he stole a look at the girl lying on the rocks no this was not the time he could not tell her just now he would wait some other time perhaps it would be easier jimmy said the girl at last and her words came slowly as if she spoke out of the haze of her dreams when you went to school i don't mean when you were just a little boy but when you were almost a man was it a big school st jimmy did not answer at once then without taking his eyes from whatever it was that he was looking at in the distance he said why yes it was a fairly large school and were there both men and women students yes there were a good many women in the university and a few in the medical school where i finally finished i expect you had lots of friends didn't you jimmy i should think you would men and women friends both and i suppose there were all kinds of good times parties and dances and picnics dr burton turned suddenly to look at her what in the world are you driving at now please jimmy she said wistfully i want to know and something made him look away again i suppose i had my share of friends he answered and there was a reasonable amount of fun as there always is at school you know but we most of us worked hard too yes she returned quickly and you dreamed and planned the great things you would do in the world when your school days should be over and in spite of all your friends and the good times you could hardly wait to begin yes i am sure that is the way it would be st jimmy did not speak and when your school days were finished and you were actually a doctor in a big city you still had lots of men and women friends and you found a little time now and then for parties and and dinners and such things didn't you jimmy st jimmy smiled a patient shadowy smile as he answered my practice at first certainly left me plenty of time for other things the girl did not notice the smile because she was not looking at her companion you lived in a nice house too with books and pictures and and carpets on the floors do you know i think i have wanted more than anything else in the world to live in a house with carpets on the floors that is i mean i have wanted it ever since i knew there were such things do you know jimmy i never saw a house with carpets until the first day i came to see you and mother burton she laughed a little that was a long long time ago wasn't it and i couldn't much more than read then gee how scared i was of you and mother burton you have made a wonderful progress in your studies and in every way said jimmy proudly yes she returned the carpets did it the carpets and you and mother burton i don't see how you ever managed to teach me though i guess you just learned by 
doctoring so many sick people it must be a wonderful satisfying work helping people i mean like a doctor or a teacher or any work like that it's not like just finding gold in the ground even though you do have to work so hard to get the gold it's not like like working for people or with people getting gold out of the ground seems to take you away from people you don't seem to be doing anything for anybody but only just for yourself prospectors and workers like that most always live alone i've noticed i don't think many of them are very happy either i've seen quite a lot of prospectors in my time you know jimmy in fact except for you prospectors and that sort are the only kind of men i have ever known until now st jimmy was watching her closely yes he said softly as if he did not wish to disturb her mood i suspect it was pretty hard wasn't it jimmy when you got your sick yourself and had to give up your work and all your plans and leave your nice home and all your friends and everything and come away out here to get well and then to find that you never could go back but must stay here always poor jimmy it must have been mighty hard it wasn't exactly easy he said slowly not at first i fought a good deal till i learned better after that it was not so hard only at times perhaps even now i rebel occasionally but not for long which was as near a complaint as any one had ever heard from dr jimmy burton jimmy said marta earnestly i think that you are the most wonderful man that ever was that ever could be st jimmy shrugged his shoulders and waved a protesting hand but you are she insisted and you know how i love you don't you not merely because you have helped me as you have but because you are you you do know don't you jimmy there was an odd note in jimmy's voice now it might have been gladness it might have been protest or perhaps it was both with a hint of pain marta i he stopped as if he found himself suddenly unable to finish whatever it was that he had started to say it may be that this was one of the times when st jimmy was not wholly reconciled to the part that life had assigned to him apparently marta did not notice her teacher's manner her thoughts must have been centred elsewhere because she said quite as if she had been considering it all the time i feel sure that mr edwards has been hurt some way just as you have jimmy i mean that he has been to school and had a world of nice friends in good times and then started his real work and all that and now for some reason has had to give up his work and home and friends and everything and come out here he didn't tell us much but you could sort of feel that he was that kind of a man you can feel those things about men can't you jimmy jimmy nodded i suppose so i don't know why he didn't tell us more about himself about before he came to tucson i mean perhaps he will some day but he acts as if he didn't like to think about it now you know what i mean don't you yes i know it is rather important that one have a past isn't it jimmy she smiled as she added rather important that one have the right kind of a past i mean to my mind it is quite important answered jimmy soberly and suddenly he remembered again the story that the partners had told she nodded thoughtfully you have talked to me a lot about heredity and breeding and good blood and early environment and those things i suspect it is your being a doctor that makes you consider them as you do and mother burton she has told me a lot too about your ancestors away back and so i can see that it is your past and the things you have to remember that make you the kind of man you are if you didn't have the father and mother that you had and the fathers and mothers that they had and if you hadn't had the schools and the friends and the home with carpets and the work of helping people that you have had why you wouldn't be you at all would you jimmy st jimmy moved uneasily he wished now in the light of the partner's story and their conclusion as to the birth and parentage of this girl that he had not included some subjects in his pupil's course of study marta continued as if scarcely conscious of her companion's presence she were thinking aloud and so if if any one else did have the same kind of things to remember that you have he would be the same kind of a man that you are not exactly of course he might not be a doctor or might not be sick but on the whole well you see what i mean don't you jimmy st jimmy was quite sure that he saw her meaning in fact dr burton was fast being convinced that he realized more clearly than marta herself the real meaning of her unusual mood her next words confirmed his fast-growing suspicion that however scientifically right he had been in his teaching he had not been altogether kind in stressing certain truths 
it's funny but i never really thought of it before she said but i don't seem to have any past at all all i can remember is just moving around with my two fathers who of course are not my fathers at all at least not both of them and if it were not for you and mother burton we wouldn't have stayed here any longer than we did the other places i think i must have been born while my real father and mother were moving somewhere and never cared much about it before jimmy but somehow i wish now that i that i knew who i am i wish i wish i had things to remember such as you and mr edwards have schools and friends and good times and a home with carpets i mean there was a suspicious brightness in the frank eyes and her lips were trembling a little a state of affairs very unusual to the pardoner's daughter st jimmy realized that it was going to be even harder than he had foreseen to make known to this girl the things he had promised to tell her certainly he could not tell her just now his voice was gentle as he finally said i wouldn't worry about all that if i were you dear you see it doesn't really matter so much whether you know or not your people must have been the best kind of people because you are what you are and after all it is what you are right now that counts it is your own dear self and not what you might have been that matters don't you see why you have a better education already than most girls of your age as for the rest the friends and all that those will come in time i am sure she smiled her gratitude bravely then jimmy may i ask you something more something real personal as personal as you like he answered gravely well among all your friends at school and among all the people you met and knew afterwards was there ever was there ever one who was more than all the others one girl or woman i mean jimmy considered then deliberately you mean in my school days and before i was forced to give up my work she nodded no said jimmy readily once or twice i thought there might be but i soon found out that i was mistaken of course i'm glad now that i found it out but didn't you in all your plans and dreams for your life and work didn't you ever include someone didn't you ever plan for a for well for she finished triumphantly for two little boys like the wheelers have i looked forward in a general way to a home and children as i think every man does he answered she caught him up eagerly you really think that every man includes such things in his plans at least he replied i fail to see how any normal right-thinking man can ignore such things in his life plans i wonder if that could be it said martha you wonder what if mr edwards came to the Kenyatta del oro because his plans included someone who refused to be included good lord ejaculated st jimmy under his breath no she continued i don't believe that is it he doesn't act as though that was the reason suddenly her mood changed she seemed to awaken to some hitherto unrealized possibilities of her life and to grasp with startled fierceness a defiant truth jimmy she cried just because i have no past is no reason why i should not have a future is it before he could find an answer she went on and her words came rushing tumbling hurrying out as if the floodgate of her emotions were suddenly lifted and the passionate spirit of her released i can see now that i have always been like our canyon creek in summer just playing along any old way taking things as they are without even caring whether i stopped or not but now now i feel like the creek is to-day with its springtime life boiling and roaring and leaping i won't i won't be like the creek though that for all its strength and fuss and fury just fades away at last into nothing out there in the desert i want to keep on going and going and going i don't know where i don't care where just on and on and on she sprang to her feet and stood before him in all the radiant vigorous beauty of her young womanhood and with reckless abandon challenged jimmy let's run away let's go away off somewhere beyond the farthest line yonder that you are always looking at and then let's keep on going just you and i wouldn't it be fun if we were to be married why shouldn't we you're not too old i'm not too young we could live in a little house somewhere a house with carpets jimmy and books and pictures and you could make music and i would take care of you oh such good care of you jimmy i'd cook all the things you like and ought to eat and wash for you and mend your things and you could go on teaching me and scolding me when i forgot to use the right words and and wouldn't it be fun jimmy of course after a while mother burton would come too and perhaps there would be a place somewhere near for my daddies to prospect oh jimmy jimmy let's go 
dr burton laughed and it was well for the girl that she was still too much of a child to know how often grim tragedy wears a mask of mirth when the stranger had told the pardoners and their daughter his simple story how he had been ill and could find no work in tucson and so had come to the cañada del oro with the hope of finding enough gold to live by and marta had ridden away to spend the sunday with st jimmy and mother burton tad said doubtfully i don't see as there is much we can do we can't learn nobody to find gold war it ain't and if we knowed war it was we certain sure would stake out some claims for ourselves wouldn't we i don't take no stock in there being anything more than a colour mebby round that old dalton cabin yonder gold is where you find it remarked bob cheerfully you can't never tell when or where you're going to strike it rich that's all right retorted fad but it stands to reason that if the feller what built that cabin hadn't have worked out his claim he'd be there working on it yet wouldn't he he quit and vamoosed because he'd worked it out i'm telling you bob returned with energy and i'm maintaining that no claim or mine or nothing else was ever worked out folks just quit working on em that's all there's many and many a mine been abandoned when three hours more or one more shot mebby would a opened up a bonanza this young man may go right up there in the creek and stick in his pick a foot from where the other fellow took out his last shovel of dirt and turn up a regular glory hole don't you let him give you the dumps mr edwards he's the worst old pessimist you ever see there's enough gold in this neighbourhood to buy all the bacon and beans you'll need long as you live if you're willing to scratch around for it and you've got just as good a chance as there is to strike a real mine and make your everlasting fortune too if you want my honest opinion mr edwards said fad solemnly as if his partner had not spoken you'll be a fool to spend any time here the younger man smiled but you see mr grove i'm rather forced to do something right now as i told you i'm not in a position to spend much time tramping about the country looking for what might be a better place all my capital all my worldly possessions in fact are in that pack there after all you know the old saying he finished laughingly it takes a fool for luck that ain't so growled fad cause of it was my partner there would be as rich as rockefeller and morgan and the rest of them billionaires all rolled into one bob grinned at edwards reassuringly then he said to fad now that you've got that off your mind suppose we just turn in and do what we can for the boy here this here is sunday ain't it returned thad doubtfully didn't my gal tell us yesterday that we couldn't your gal interrupted bob fiercely your gal huh i'm here to tell you that you'd best keep within your rights thad grove even if me and you be partners she's my gal this week beginning at sun-up this morning and you know it and besides there's good scripture for us helping mr edwards here to get located even if tis sunday scripture said thad scornfully what scripture it's that there part where the lord is lining em up about what they did and what they didn't do explained bob says he to one bunch when i was dead broke and hungry and thirsty and all but petered out you ornery skunks wouldn't turn a hand to give me a lift and so you don't need a to figure that you're going to get in on the ground floor with me now that i've struck pay dirt or words to that effect and then to the other bunch he says you're all right partners come on in and make your pile along with me cause i ain't forgot how when i was a stranger you took me in you grub staked me when i was down and out and for that all i've got now is yourn leastways that's the general meaning of it whereupon thad conceded that while it would be wrong actually to work on the day of rest it might be safe for them to show the stranger around and sort of talk things over and all that day while the two old prospectors were conducting him to the cabin that for the following months was to be his home while they were showing him about the neighbourhood and advising him in general way about his work and as they sat at the dinner which marta had left prepared for them hugh edwards felt that he was being weighed measured analysed nor did he in any way attempt to avoid or shirk the ordeal fairly and squarely with neither hesitation nor evasion he met those keen old eyes that for so many years had searched for the precious metal that is hidden in the sands and rocks and gravel of desert wastes and lonely canyons and those mountain places that are far remote from the haunts of less hardy and courageous men they did not ask many questions about his past for it is not the way of such men to pry into another's past by their code a man's personal history is his own most private affair to be given or withheld as he himself elects but what a man is that is a matter of concern to every one who is called by circumstance to associate with him 
they were not particularly interested in what this man who had given his name as hugh edwards had been they were mightily interested in discerning what sort of a man hugh edwards at that moment was well partner said bob later in the afternoon when edwards with sincere expression of his gratitude had left them to go to the cabin which by common consent they now called his what do you make of him old fad rubbing his bald head answered in for him an unusual vein he's a right likable chap ain't he bob if i'd ever had a boy of my own that is supposin first i'd ever had a wife i think i'd like him to be just about what i sense this lad is then as if alarmed at this betrayal of what might be considered sentiment the old prospector suddenly stiffened and added in his usual manner you can't tell what he is some sort of a sneakin' coyote like as not a tryin to pass hisself off as a harmless little cotton-tail i'm for layin low and watchin his smoke mighty careful he'll assay purty high-grade or i'm a-thinkin said bob time enough to invest when said assay has been made retorted thad it looks funny to me that a man of his education would be a-comin up here in this old canyon to waste his time trying to do something that he don't know no more about than a baby hard work too and anybody can see he ain't never done much of that he's been sick returned bob thad grunted huh if he was it was a long time ago did you notice the weight of that pack he's a totin it like a warrant nothin at all he looks kind of pale when his hat is off said bob to which thad returned he's mighty particular about where he was and what he was doin for a livin before he blew into tucson as for that returned bob there's been some things happened since me and you was first partners that we ain't just exactly a wavin in the wind and look at us now thad's dry retort was inevitable yes just look at us bob chuckled you ain't so mighty much to look at i admit well said thad as long as my gal thinks i'm all right you my gal my gal snapped bob why have you allus got to be a tryin to do me out of my rights you know well as i do this is my week excuse me pard the other apologized in all seriousness and that leads me to remark that your gal didn't appear altogether indifferent and uninterested in this young prospect and neighbor of ours you took notice too i reckon i ain't blind be i answered bob and why wouldn't she take notice my gal ain't no wizened up old mummy like me and you why wouldn't she take notice of a fine upstandin clean-eyed straight-limbed fair-spoken youngster like him eh it's natural enough and right enough too i reckon old thad with sudden rage shook his long finger at his partner and in a voice that was high-pitched and trembling with emotion cried natural enough you poor old thick-headed ossified wreck of manhood you natural enough holy cats it's too natural that's what i'm a-meanin it's too natural whether it's all right or all wrong it's too almighty natural that's what it is later when marta had returned to her home in the canyon of gold when the sun was down and the shadow of the approaching night was deepening over desert and mesa mountain a cowboy on his way to the home ranch stopped to listen at as the music of st jimmy's flute came soft and clear through the quiet of the evening from that spot beneath the old cedar tree high on the mountain side a wandering mexican camped near juniper spring below heard and crossed himself natichi the indian who was following a faint trail toward the wild upper canyon heard and smiled jimmy's mother heard and her eyes filled with tears End of chapter eight gold is where you find it as the ocean calls the water of the rivers and the rivers call the creeks and springs so this story of a treasure hidden in a mine that is lost has called many people to the canyon of gold the canyon of gold was still in the shadow of the mountains the next morning when the partners went to give their new neighbor his first lesson in the work that was to occupy him for months to come hugh edwards greeted them without a trace of the hesitating fear that he had shown during the first moments of their meeting the day before his eyes now met theirs fairly with no hint of questioning dread it was as if the restful peace and strengthening quiet of that retreat which was hidden so far from the overcrowded highways of life had begun already to effect in the troubled spirit of this stranger a magic healing well said thad gruffly we're here where's your pick and shovel and pan when the younger man had produced those implements which were so new and strange to him bob asked kindly if he had had a good night's sleep if he found the cabin 
comfortable and if he had fortified himself for the day's work with a proper breakfast hugh edwards laughed and with his face lifted to the mountain heights that towered above them squared his shoulders and drew a long deep breath i haven't had such a sleep since i can remember as for breakfast well if i eat like this every day i will exhaust my supplies before i even learn to know gold when i see it i feel as if i could move that hill over there into the canyon bob chuckled you'll find you've got to move a lot of it son before you make enough at this gold hunting game to buy your grub that's the trouble with prospectin in this here kenyatta del oro country said thad the harder you work the more you eat and the more you eat the harder you got to work come on let's get a goin for several hours the old partners labored with their pupil beside the creek then with hearty assurance of further help from time to time as he made progress they left him and went to their own little mine some five hundred yards down the canyon the afternoon was nearly gone when edwards who was kneeling over the gravel and sand in his pan at the edge of the stream looked up on a boulder not more than five steps from the amateur prospector sat an indian with an exclamation the white man sprang to his feet the indian did not move dressed as he was in the wild fashion of his fathers and with his primitive bow and arrows he seemed more like some sculptured bit of the past than a creature of living flesh hugh edwards standing as one ready to run at the crack of the starter's pistol swiftly surveyed the immediate vicinity his face was white and he was trembling with fear with grave interest the red man silently observed the perturbed stranger then as edwards again turned his frightened eyes toward him the indian raised his hand in the old-time peace sign and in a deep musical voice spoke the one word of the old-time greeting how edwards broke into a short nervous laugh how do you do by george but you gave me a start some small animal a pack rat or a ground squirrel made a rustling sound in the bushes on the bank above and with a low cry the frightened man wheeled and again started as if to escape the indian watching saw the meaning in every move the stranger made and read every expression of his face with an effort edwards controlled himself are you alone he asked i mean he caught himself up quickly that is have you no horse i'm always alone the indian answered calmly then as if to put the other more at ease he continued in excellent english night before last when the sun went down i was up there on san maniego ridge he pointed with singular grace there on that rock near the dead saguaro and i saw you as you came up the old road into the canyon hugh edwards again betrayed himself by the eagerness of his next question did you see any one else there was no one on your trail returned the indian at this the stranger seemed to realize suddenly that he was permitting his fears to reveal too much and as one will he sought to amend his error with a half laughing excuse really you know i didn't suppose there was any one following me he indicated his work with a gesture i'm not exactly used to this sort of life you see and well i confess the loneliness the strangeness of my surroundings and all have rather got on my nerves quite natural i suppose the indian bowed assent as if determined to correct any impression he might have made by his unguarded manner edwards abruptly dropped the subject and with an air of enthusiastic delight spoke of his surroundings finishing with the courteous question you live in this neighborhood do you there was a quick gleam of savage light in the dark eyes that were fixed with bold pride upon the questioning white man and the indian answered more in the manner of his people in the years that are past my fathers came to these mountains to hunt and to make war like men they come now with the squaws to gather acorns when the white man gives them permission i live here yes as a homeless dog lives in one of your cities my name is natichi the deep musical voice of the red man revealed such bitter feeling 
that hugh edwards was moved to pity and then as he stood there in the silence that had fallen upon them a strange thing happened it was as if the spirit of the indian had somehow touched the inner self of the stranger and had quickened in him a kindred savage lusting for revenge upon some enemy who had brought upon him too humiliation and shame and suffering beyond expression the white man's hands were clenched his breast heaved with laboured breathing his face was black with passion his eyes were dreadful with the scowling light of anger and hate a faint smile came like a swift shadow over the face of the watching indian then he spoke with deliberate meaning and why have you come to the Cañada del oro why should a man like you wish to live here in the canyon of gold hugh edwards gained control of himself with an effort i came to look for gold as you see he said at last again that faint smile like a quick shadow touched the face of the red man and this time the other saw it looking straight into the eyes of the indian he said coldly and you what do you do for a living natichi returning look for look answered simply i live as my fathers live i've heard about you i think said edwards the indian's deep voice was charged with scorn yes the lizard called it your damp you would hear about every one from the lizard he told me that you were educated natichi answered sadly it is true i attended the white man's school what i learned there made me return to the desert and the mountains to live as my fathers live and to die as my people must die when the white man seemingly could find no words with which to reply the indian spoke again if it is gold that brought you here to the cañada del oro why do you not search for the lost mine with the iron door hugh edwards remembering what the lizard had said smiled and is there really such a mine there is a story of such a mine do many people come to look for it natichi answered gravely and with that dignity so characteristic of a red man while his words though spoken in english were the words of an indian too many people come as the ocean calls the water of the rivers and the rivers call the creeks and springs so this story of a treasure hidden in a mine that is lost has called many people to the canyon of gold for many years they have been coming for many years they will continue to come the white people say they do not believe there ever was such a mine and they laugh about it they look for it just the same even the pardoners who dig for gold in their own little hole down there laugh but i know that they too believe even as they laugh that is always the white man's way always he is searching for the thing which he says does not exist and at which he laughs but what about you asked hugh edwards do you believe in this lost mine the indian's face was a bronze mask as he answered of what importance is an indian's belief to a white man when the winds heed the dead leaves they toss and scatter when the fire heeds the dry grass in its path then will a white man heed the words of an indian oh i wouldn't say it was as bad as that returned edwards easily and as he spoke he went to bend over his pan again mine or no mine he continued as he examined the sand and gravel he had been washing i think i have some real gold here when there was no answer he said you must know gold when you see it will you look at this and tell me what you think still there was no answer with the gold pan in his hand the white man turned to face his visitor the indian had disappeared in amazement hugh edwards stood staring at the spot where the indian had been sitting but a moment before then while his eyes searched the vicinity for some movement in the brush he listened for a sound not a leaf or a twig or blossom stirred not a sound betrayed the way the red man had gone with an odd feeling that the whole incident of the indian's visit was as unreal as a dream the man had again turned his attention to the contents of his gold pan when a gay voice came from the top of the bank well neighbor have you struck it rich looking up he saw marta i have struck something all right or rather something struck me he laughed as she joined him beside the creek then he told her about the indian yes she said that was natichi he always comes and goes like that everybody says he is harmless he and st jimmy are quite good friends but he gives me the creeps she shrugged her shoulders ugh i always feel as if he were wishing that he could scalp every one of us to tell the truth returned edwards i feel a little that way myself that evening as hugh edwards sat with the partners and their girl on the porch he asked the old prospectors about the mine with the iron door they laughed as natichi had said but edwards caught an odd note of wistfulness in their merriment thad answered his question with a brave pretence of scorn there's lost mines all over arizona son 
better stick to your pick and shovel if you want to eat reg'lar you won't pan out so mighty much mebby but what you do get will be real but this here mine with the iron door is different some ways from all them others said bob and again edwards caught that wistful note in the old-timer's voice you mean that you believe there is such a mine he said holy cats no growled thad we don't believe in nothing till we got it where we can cash it in bob was thoughtfully refilling his pipe they say it was made by the old padres away back a hundred years before any of us prospectors ever hit this country i know one thing that you can see for yourself easy there's the ruins of a mighty old settlement or camp or something on the side of the mountain of up above the steam pump ranch they say it was there that the papagos what worked the mine before the priests lived the papagos and the padres always was friendly you know the padres have got a big mission san xavier down in the papago country right now built something like three hundred years ago it was i ain't never been able myself to just figure their idea in fixing up the mine with that iron door mebby it was on account of them only working it by spells like when they was needin something extra for their mission or for their church back home in spain where they all come from and so wanted to shut it up when they was gone away then one time the story goes along come one of these here earthquakes and tumbled a whole blame mountain down on top of the works the old priests and their papago miners figured it out that the landslide was an act of god in being displeased with the way they was running things or something and so they was scared ever even to try to dig her up again and so you see after all these years the trees and brush growed over the mountain again and the old mine got to be plumb lost for certain sure and so far as we're consarned added the other partner emphatically it's going to stay lost this ain't no country for a big mine no how mineralized all right but look at the way she's all shot to pieces busted forty ways for sunday ain't nothing regular nowhere unless you was to go down a thousand or two feet mebby and that ain't no prospect for a poor man i'm a-tellin you find a little place of dirt yes and you might strike a good pocket once in a lifetime or so but that ain't to say real mining take my advice son and don't let this lost mine get to workin on you or you'll go hungry that's all true enough pardner said bob but you know how tis you can't never tell gold is where you find it end of chapter nine summer daddy says she hugh has changed a lot since he come to us ain't he the weeks of the spring passed the gleaming snow-fields vanished from the dark pine heights of mount lemon the creek which ran through the canyon of gold with such boisterous strength that day when the stranger came and marta talked with saint jimmy under the old cedar on the mountainside crept lazily now with scarce a murmur pausing often to rest in the shady quiet of an overhanging rock or to sleep half hidden among the roots of a giant sycamore the sonora pigeon his mission accomplished had long since ceased to give his mating call the nest in the mesquite thicket had been filled and was empty again the partridge was leading her half-grown covey far from the mescal plant where they were born the vermilion flycatcher was too busy with his exacting parental duties even to think of indulging in those fantastic exhibitions which ultimately had placed the burdens of fatherhood upon his shoulders there was not a day of those passing months that the partners and the girl did not in some way come in touch with their neighbor sometimes edwards would go to council with the two old prospectors as they worked in their little mine again they would go over to his place to advise him with their years of experience in his small operations often he would spend the evening with them on the porch in neighborly fashion or they would go to smoke with him before the door of his tiny cabin occasionally it was no more than a shout of greeting across the three hundred or more yards that separated the two places but always the contact that had been established that day when the lizard brought 
the stranger to the pardoner's door was maintained hugh edwards might have gone from the place where he laboured to the pardoner's mine along the creek under the high bank without passing their house at all but he never did that is he never both went and returned by the creek route either going or coming he would always climb out of the deep cut made by the stream to the level of the main floor of the canyon where the house stood except of course when marta had gone to the store at oracle or to see st jimmy and mother burton the girl was always included too in those evenings on the porch or before his cabin door always on her way to the store she stopped to see if she could bring him anything for him and often with the freedom of the rude environment she had known since she could remember and with the frank innocence of her boyish nature marta would run over to give him a lesson in the arts of the kitchen or perhaps to contribute something of her own cooking a pie or cake or pudding that would be quite beyond the range of his poor culinary skill it was indeed all very natural perhaps as thad had said that first day it was too darned natural to the partners hugh edwards was an object of continued speculative interest a subject of endless and somewhat violent arguments and it must be added a never-failing source of amusement and delight the genuineness and depth of this friendship for their young neighbor was evidenced at last by their telling him the story of their partnership daughter as they had told it to st jimmy and mother burton it was not long after this mark of their confidence that the old prospectors were led into a characteristic discussion of their observations hugh had gone to them at their mine with a bit of quartz which he had picked up in the bed of the creek the consultation was over and the two old prospectors were sitting in the shade of the tunnel opening watching the younger man as he climbed up the steep bank toward the house old bob was grinning he sure thought he had found something good this time didn't he the boy's all right don't never show a sign of being sore when his rich rocks turn out to be just nothing but rock just keeps right on trying don't seem to care a cuss how many blanks he draws thad chuckled if hard work will get him anything he's sure due to strike it rich hits it up from crack of day till plum dark and acts like he hated even to think of sleepin or eatin it's funny too said bob cause you remember at first he didn't peer to take no interest at all just poked along in a come day go day god send sunday sort of a gait as if all he wanted was to get his powder back with what frijoles bacon and coffee he had to have he's sure come alive though i wonder thad was rubbing his bald head with a slow speculative movement had you took notice how he allus goes up to the house when he brings them pieces of full rock to us my gal she says to me the other evening your gal your gal martyr's father shouted this here's my week and you know it blamed well you old love pirate you can't you never be satisfied with your share have you got to be all us trying to euchre me out of my rights i apologize pardner i forgot i apologize plenty said thad hurriedly as i was meanin to say that gal of yourn she says to me daddy last saturday it was so she had a right to call me daddy daddy says she hugh has changed a lot since he come to us ain't he well returned bob what if my daughter did make such a remark it she was my daughter then interrupted thad sternly she's mine right now retorted bob with equal force what if she did say it i maintain it only goes to show what a smart 
observin gal she's growed up to be fad grunted disgustedly it's almighty plain that she didn't inherit none of her observin powers from you bob glared at him well what are you seein that i ain't he demanded something that's wrong i'll bet by smoke fad if you was to happen to get into heaven by any hook or crook so ever you'd set yourself first off to suspicion and them there angels of high gradin the gold they say the streets up there is paved with the other returned with withering contempt you've said it but don't it signify nothin to you when your gal when any gal takes notice of how a feller is lookin different from what he did when she first met up with him ain't it got no meanin for you when she says since he come to us come to us to us can't you see nothin if i was as dumb as you be i'd set off a stick of powder under myself to see if i couldn't get some sort of what i heard dr jimmy once call a reaction bob laughed i figure on gettin all the reactions i need from you without wastin any powder hugh did come to us didn't he even if that measly lizard did fetch him far as the gate oh sure grumbled the other with fine sarcasm hugh he didn't come to this here kenyatta del oro not a tall he just come to us bob continued as if the other had not spoken as far as his not bein the same as when he come well he ain't anybody can see that tain't only that he's started in to work and all at once like he just naturally had to get rich he's different in a lot of ways take his looks for instance he used to be kind of white like you remember and now he's tanned as black as any of us old desert rats he's sturdier and heavier like every way hard work agrees with him peers like tain't only that said fad sure his hair ain't so short no more there's more than hair and bein tanned said fad yep there is agreed bob do you mind how when he first come he acted sort of scared like right at the very first i mean that's it returned fad his eyes was like he was expectin one or t'other or both of us to throw down a gun on him and yet i sensed somehow after the first minute that it wasn't us he was afraid of he sure walks up to a man now though like he could jump down his throat if he had to i'll bet my pal he would too if he was called chuckled bob and have you noticed how easy he laughs and the way he sings and whistles over there when he's fussin round his shack of a mornin or evenin he sure seems contented enough said fat and that's another thing i've noticed too he added slowly the boy ain't been out of the canyon since he come ain't no reason for him to go said bob we take out what little gold he pans with ourn don't we and it's easy for martyr to buy his supplies for him while she's buyin for us there ain't nobody at oracle that he'd be wantin to see mebbe that's it said thad mebbe what's it demanded bob that there ain't nobody at oracle that he wants to see or that he don't want to see him whichever way you like to say it there you go again said bob can't talk more in a minute on any subject without hintin that something is wrong the boy's all right i tell you well holy cats who said he warn't cried thad I, I wouldn't hold it against him much if he never went to oracle or nowhere else just stuck in this here canyon till he died hidin out in the brush somewhere every time anybody strange showed up nearer than george wheeler's you and me has both suffered from the same sort of sickness more than once or i'm a losin my memory you're allus makin out that i'm thinkin evil when i'm only just tryin to look at things as they actually are if i'd intimated that the boy was a hoss thief or a claim jumper or something like that you'd have reason to climb on to me but i'm likin him and believin in him as much as ever you or anybody else ever dared to bob grinned it's funny how we're all agreed on that ain't it he is sure a likable cuss i was a warnin him the other day about handlin his powder you don't want to forget son says i that there's enough in one of them sticks to blow you so high that you'd think you was one of them heavenly bodies up yonder he laughed and says says he that's being the case it would be mighty comfortin to know there was no one to dock me for the time i was up in the air wouldn't it huh grunted that that's an old one sure it's an old one retorted bob but nobody can't say it ain't a good one and i'm here to maintain that you can tell a heap more about a man by the jokes he laughs at than you can by the religions he frames to believe in yes retorted thad grimly i've allus took notice too that them's 
that's all the time see and evil and whatever anybody does is dead but immortal certain to be having a lot of their own doings that need to be kept in the dark as for this game of looking for some sort of insinuations in everything a body says it's like a looking-glass what you see is mostly yourself that's what i'm meanin hugh is a good boy all right said bob he's all of that and then some said thad the truth of the matter is hugh edwards had found in the cañada del oro something more than the gold for which he worked so laboriously through the long days and which he had come to hoard with such miserly care in the canyon of gold he had found more than rugged health more than a sanctuary from whatever it was that had driven him from the world to which he belonged into the lonely seclusion of that wild country into his loneliness had come a sweet companionship that had grown every day more dear in this new joy and gladness bitterness and pain had ceased to darken his hours with hatred and with useless and vengeful longings crushed and beaten humiliated and shamed his every hour an hour of dread he had found inspiration and spirit to plan his life anew out of his hopelessness a glorious new hope had come he had learned again to dream and he had gained strength to labor for his dreams but he had not told marta what it was that he had found he could not tell her yet before he could tell her he must have gold and he must have not merely an amount that would satisfy the bare necessities of life he must have much more than that he was not so foolish as to feel that he must be in a position to offer this girl the extravagant luxuries of life but his need was born of a dire necessity a necessity as vital as the need of food without gold the realization of his dream was an impossibility his only hope of happiness was in the possibility of his success in finding a quantity of the yellow metal for which through the centuries so many men had labored as he was laboring now in the canyon del oro he could not explain to marta he could only dream and hope and work as those others before him had dreamed and hoped and worked in the canyon of gold and so with a strength that was like the strength of st jimmy this man was resolutely hiding the love that had recreated him marta must not know not now but marta knew knew and yet did not know the girl whose womanhood had developed into the peculiarly sexless environment that had been hers since she could remember had formed no habit of self-analysis she was wholly inexperienced in those innocent but emotionally instructive friendships which girls and young women normally have with boys and men of their own age except for her father's and st jimmy she had had no contact with men in her childlike ignorance she asked of herself no questions she gave no more thought to the meaning of her interest in hugh edwards than a wild bird gives to its mating instinct but as their friendship grew and ripened this girl of the desert and mountains knew that she was happy as she had never been happy before she felt a kinship with the wild life about her that thrilled her with its poignant mystery the flowers had never before bloomed in such passionate profusion the birds had never voiced such melodies the very winds were freighted with perfumes that filled her with strange delight the days indeed flew by on wings of sunshine the nights were haunted with shadowy promises as vague and intangible as they were sweet now that she as the weeks passed seemed to develop a strange interest in the man who was so obviously from a world that is far indeed from the haunts of the lonely red man frequently the indian called at the little cabin to spend an hour or more always he appeared suddenly at the most unexpected moments as if he were a spirit materialized that instant from an invisible world and always he disappeared in the same startling fashion sometimes when he was with edwards and the partners he would discuss matters of general interest with the speech and manner of any well-bred college man save for his savage costume his dusky countenance and a certain touch of poetic feeling in his choice of words and figures of speech there would be nothing on these occasions to mark him as different in any way from his white companions but on other occasions when natachee and edwards were alone the red man would for the moment cast aside every mark of his training in the schools and with the voice words and gestures peculiar to his race express thoughts and emotions that were purely indian much of the time however he would sit silently watching the white man at his work often he would come and go without a word he would sometimes appear too when marta and edwards were together and on these occasions save for a courteous greeting he was rarely more than a silent observer the lizard had at first endeavored to cultivate the stranger's friendship but receiving no encouragement had soon limited his attention to a sullen howdy when he passed on his way to or from oracle but st jimmy had not yet met the man who was living next door to martyr often the girl begged her teacher to go with her to call on the new neighbor mother burton frequently scolded him gently for his discourtesy to the stranger 
and st jimmy promised many times that he would call but he invariably postponed the date of his visit he would set out on his social mission in all good faith but invariably when he came within sight of the cabin so near to martyr's home he would stop and instead of going on would spend the hours alone on the mountain side looking out over the desert had st jimmy been other than the gentle spirit he was he might have said that he heard quite enough about hugh edwards from martyr without going to visit him many times too st jimmy thought to tell martyr the story her fathers had entrusted to him but for some reason he always found it as difficult to talk to his pupil about the mystery of her early childhood as he found it hard to call on this man in whom she was so interested often he said to his mother that he would delay no longer that he would tell the girl the next time she came to see them but each time he put it off the girl was always so radiantly happy so overflowing with the joy of life perhaps st jimmy told himself perhaps it might never be necessary for her to know the dry season of the summer passed the summer rains came and again the desert the foothills and mountain sides were bright with blossoms it was during this little spring as the indians called this second blossoming time of the year the St. jimmy finally called on hugh edwards and it was the lizard who brought it about End of chapter ten chapter eleven the lizard no said dr burton slowly i've heard nothing about mr edwards nothing wrong i mean the lizard was on his way to oracle that day when he turned aside from the more direct trail to take the path that led past the little white house on the mountain side approaching the burton home he pulled his horse down to a walk and as he rode slowly up the winding way his shifty eyes searched the vicinity on every side it was not long before he saw dr burton who was seated with his back comfortably against a rock in the shade of a juniper tree reading as the lizard left the trail and rode toward him st jimmy glanced up from his book with a look of mild interest he watched as the horse with its rider climbed the steep side of the mountain when he had come quite near the lizard stopped and slouching down in the saddle looked at the man seated on the ground with a wide grin while the horse with a long breath of relief dropped his head and settled himself sleepily as if understanding from long experience that his master would have no further use for him for some time to come how do you do said jimmy smiling bout as usual returned the horseman i'm eatin regular loud hid war time i rode by to see how you was a makin hit these days i see you're still alive he laughed in his loose-mouthed way i'm doing very well returned st jimmy wondering what the real object of the fellow's call might be your ma's well too i reckon yes thank you been over torco lately i was there yesterday uh-huh i was up to the store myself day before hear anything new did ye nothing startling smiled st jimmy your father and mother are well are they bout as usual ain't see george wheeler lately have he er any of his folks george was at our house a few days ago returned jimmy stopped in a few minutes on his way home from the upper ranch uh -huh. george say anything did he no nothing in particular the lizard shifted his slouching weight in the saddle i met up with one of george's punchers t'other day bud gordon hit war he says as how the lines is a gittin bout all of george's mule colts up round this his place above so george was telling us it's too bad you ranchers will be planning another hunt soon i suppose the lizard shook his head solemnly then leered at st jimmy with an evil grin thar's varmints in this here neighborhood what needs a huntin a mighty sight more'n lions and coyotes and sich jimmy waited you say you ain't heerd nothin demanded the lizard about what about that there new prospector was located in the old cabin down thar by the pardoner's place no said dr burton slowly i've heard nothing about mr edwards nothing wrong i mean well if ye ain't hit's cause ye ain't been round much or cause ye ain't 
listen very close maybe though folks would be kind o slow like sayin anything to you seein's how you'd likely be more interested in anybody else st jimmy was not smiling now i think you are mistaken about my interest he said curtly i've no desire to listen to you or to any one else on the subject oh ye ain't day the man on the horse returned with a sneer i loud as how ye'd be quite mighty quick to listen seein's how this new fellow's cut you out with the gal like he has when st jimmy did not speak the lizard continued with virtuous indignation things was bad enough as they was but now since new this new feller's come she's a carryin on past all reason you can find em together at his shack or down in the creek where he's a friend attendin to work er out in the brush somewhere most any time and when she ain't over tis place er out with him somewhere he's dead certain to be at her house i seed em together when i passed on my way up here she's too good to speak to me what's been neighbor to her ever since she come into this country but she can take up with this stranger quick enough dr burton was on his feet that's enough he said sharply you might as well go on your way now you have evidently said what you came to say oh i don't know returned the lizard with insolent superiority there ain't no use in your trying to be so high and mighty with me she's throwed me down for you often enough now that you're getting the same thing ye ought to be a grain more friendly peers to me as for this other fellow he'll sure get what's a-comin to him and so will she jimmy caught his breath what do you mean i mean that folks are a-talkin and that they'll likely do more than talk this time we've allus had our doubts about the gal who wouldn't have her bein raised by them two old mavericks like she war and bein named for both and both claimin to be her daddy and nobody knowin a foreign thing bout who her real pa and ma was or even whether she ever had any but folks has put up with her and you cause you was supposed to be a teachin her and cause you are saint jimmy he laughed saint jimmy mighty pretty eh but this new fellow that's got her now edwards he calls hisself he ain't pretendin nothin him and her they dr burton started forward his eyes were blazing and his voice rang shut up if you open your foul mouth again i'll drag you from that horse and choke the dirty life out of you the lizard amazed at the usually gentle-mannered st jimmy straightened himself in the saddle and caught up the reins get out continued the man on the ground go find some filthy-minded scandal-monger like yourself to listen to your vile rot i've had enough the lizard snarled down at him if you warn't a poor lunger i'd but as st jimmy reached for him he touched his horse with the spur and the animal leaped away twenty minutes later dr burton was on his way to the cabin in the canyon marta was at home sitting on the porch with her sewing when our teacher rode down into the canyon of gold she saw him as he turned aside toward the neighboring cabin and was on the ground in time to introduce the two men End of chapter eleven ghosts the canyon of gold is haunted by the ghosts of these disappointed ones i natichi know these things because i am an indian marta could not have explained even to herself why she was so anxious to see st jimmy and hugh edwards together certainly she made no effort to find an explanation through the years that he had been her teacher st jimmy had come to personify as it were her spiritual or intellectual ideal and why not since it was st jimmy who had helped her form her spiritual or intellectual ideals and why not since it was st jimmy who had helped her form her spiritual and intellectual ideals their daily association their friendship their love for she did love st jimmy had all been grounded and developed in an atmosphere of books and study that was purely platonic in her teacher she had come to see embodied the essential truths which he had taught she had never for a moment thought of dr burton and herself as a man and a woman he was simply st jimmy she was his grateful pupil who loved him dearly because he was st jimmy but from the very first moment of their meeting marta was conscious that the appeal of hugh edwards personality 
was an appeal that to her was new and strange she was conscious that he had made an impression upon her such as no man had ever before made for that matter she had never before met such a man as she had said so many times he made her think of st jimmy and yet he was different and because the experience was so foreign to anything that she had ever known she did not understand because hugh edwards made her think so often of st jimmy and because he was so different from st jimmy she was anxious to see the two men together nor could the girl understand her teacher's persistent failure to call on their new neighbour it was not at all like st jimmy nothing perhaps revealed quite so fully martha's lack of experience in such things as her failure to understand why st jimmy was so slow in making the acquaintance of hugh edwards and now at last her wish to see these two men together was gratified the girl's radiant face revealed her excitement her voice was jubilant her laughter rang out with delicious abandon she was tingling with animation and lively interest her two friends could no more resist the impulse to laugh with her than one could refrain from smiling at the glee of a winsome child as they shook hands she watched them looking from one to the other with an expression of such eager anxious inquiry on her glowing countenance that the men were just a little embarrassed i really should have come to see you long ago said st jimmy the right sort of neighbours are not so plentiful in the cañada del oro that we can afford to neglect them i have heard so much about you though that i feel as if you were really an old-timer whom i have known for years he looked smilingly at marta hugh edwards did not appear at all displeased at the suggestion that the girl had been talking about him and i he returned with an equally significant glance and marta have heard so much about dr burton that if there was ever a time when i didn't know him i had forgotten it marta was delighted she could not mistake the fact that the two men as it sometimes happens liked each other instantly they seemed to know and understand each other instinctively the truth is that the men themselves were just a little relieved to find this to be the fact dr burton saw in marta's neighbour a man of more than ordinary personality that one of such character and education should choose to live as edwards was living amid surroundings so foreign to the environment in which he had so evidently been born and reared and should be content to occupy himself with such menial labour was to st jimmy a puzzling thing but st jimmy was too broad in his sympathies too big in his understanding of life to be suspicious of everything that puzzled him it would indeed have been difficult for any healthy-minded clean-thinking person to be suspicious of hugh edwards and hugh edwards recognized instantly in marta's teacher that quality which led all men except such poor characterless creatures as the lizard to speak in his presence with instinctive gentleness and deference when they were seated in the shade of the cabin and the two men who were to her so like and yet so unlike were exchanging the usual small talk with which all friendships however close and enduring commonly begin marta watched and listened she was right she thought proudly they were alike and yet they were different what was it too frank to dissemble too untrained in such things to deceive too natural and innocent to hide her interest she compared contrasted analyzed but while she was seeking an answer to the thing that puzzled her there was in her mind and heart not the faintest shadow of a suggestion that she was choosing there was no occasion for choice indeed she was not in reality thinking she was feeling and the men while more apt in hiding their emotions were scarcely less conscious of the situation suddenly dr burton saw the girl's face change she was looking past them as they sat facing her toward the corner of the cabin her expression of eager animation vanished and in its stead came a look of almost fear in the same instant jimmy was conscious that edwards too had noticed the girl's change of countenance and that a quick shadow of dread and apprehension had fallen upon him the two men turned quickly natichi was standing at the corner of the cabin for a long moment no one spoke then with a suggestion of a smile as if for some reason he was pleased with the situation the indian raised his hand and uttered his customary word of greeting howl they returned his salutation and he came forward to accept the chair offered by edwards and though his dress as usual was that of a primitive savage 
his manner at the moment was in no way different from the bearing of any white man with a background of educational and social advantages as he seated himself he smiled again as if finding these three people together gave him a peculiar satisfaction dr burton spoke with the easy familiarity of an old friend natichi why on earth can't you act more like a human being and less like a disembodied spirit you always come and go as silently as a ghost i am as god made me the indian returned lightly then he added with mocking deference to the three white people except for a few improvements added by your civilization it is odd is it not he continued how the noble red man of your so highly civilized writers and painters and uplifters of various sorts become so often an ignoble vagabond once you have subjected him to those same civilizing influences certainly no one would accuse you of having acquired too much civilization retorted jimmy i hope not i am sure returned the indian quietly and turning to the others he said graciously you will pardon us for this little exchange of compliments we are not really being rude to each other just friendly that is all with me st jimmy always drops his mask of saintliness and becomes a savage and i cease being a savage and become if not a saint at least an imitator of the white man's virtues it is the privilege of our friendship you are an old fraud declared st jimmy you flatter me returned natichi my white teachers would be proud of the honor you confer they tried so hard you know to educate me edwards was amazed he had never before heard natichi talk in this bantering vein with him the indian had always spoken gravely he had seldom smiled and had never laughed the white man felt too that underlying the playfulness of the indian's words and the seeming pleasant humor of his mood there was a savage interest a cruel certainty in the final outcome of some game in which he was taking a grim part he seemed to be playing as a cat plays with the victim of its brutal and superior cunning while edwards was thinking these things and watching the red man with an odd feeling of dread which made him recall martyrs saying that the indian always gave her the creeps natichi addressed the girl with grave courtesy it is really time that your teacher called upon your good neighbor isn't it i was beginning to fear that our saint was harboring some hidden grievance that provoked him to forget the social obligations of his exalted position martyr made no reply save a nervous laugh of embarrassment dr burton flushed and said hurriedly i was just asking mr edwards natichi when you materialized so unexpectedly how he liked living in the Kenyatta del oro and i was about to reply said edwards with enthusiasm that it is the most beautiful the most wonderfully satisfying place i have ever known the indian smiled and his dark eyes glanced from martyr to st jimmy as he said our canyon is being very good to mr edwards i think he is giving him health gold enough for the necessities of life and that peace which passeth all understanding with the possibility of acquiring great wealth it delights him with the beauty and the grandeur of nature it bestows upon him the blessings of a charming and delightful companionship and last but not least it affords him a sanctuary from his enemies if he has any what more could any man ask of any place hugh edwards moved uneasily the expression of martyr's face was that of a wandering half-frightened child st jimmy looked at the indian intently as if he too had caught the feeling of a hidden sinister meaning beneath the red man's courteous manner and half jesting words natichi he said slowly i've often wondered just what does the kenyatta del oro mean to you at the doctor's simple question or perhaps at the tone of his voice the countenance of the indian suddenly became as cold and impassive as a face of iron sitting there before them clothed in the wild dress of his savage ancestors with his dark features framed in that jet-black hair with that single drooping feather he seemed all at once to have thrown off every vestige of his contact with the schools of civilization when he had been speaking in the manner of a white man there had been something pathetic in his appearance only his native dignity had saved him from being ridiculous but now he was the living spirit of the untamed deserts and mountains that on every side shut in the canyon of gold his dark eyes filled with the brooding memories of a vanishing race turned slowly from face to face the three white people waited with a strange feeling of uneasiness for him to speak you say that i natichi come and go as a ghost well perhaps i am a ghost why not it would not be held beyond the belief of some of your philosophers that the spirit of one who once long ago dwelt amid these scenes 
should return again in this body that you call me natiji the indian the cañada del oro is peopled with ghosts those who in the years that are gone lived here in the canyon of gold were as the blossoms on the mountain sides in spring in the summer months when there was no rain the blossoms disappeared then the rains came the little spring is here and look the flowers are everywhere in this canyon from the desert below to the pines above there are holes by the thousands where men have dug for gold climb the mountains and go among the cliffs and crags and there are more and more of these holes that were made by those who sought the yellow wealth walk the ridges and make your way into the hidden ravines and gorges everywhere you will find them these holes that men have dug in their search for treasure and every hole every stroke of a pick every shovel of dirt every pan of gravel was a dream that did not come true a hope that was not fulfilled the canyon of gold is haunted by the ghosts of these disappointed ones they are the shadows that move upon the mountain sides when the sun is down and the timid stars creep forth in the lonely sky they are the lights that come and go in the canyon depths when the frightened moon tries to hide in the pines of mount Lemon. there are the voices that we hear in the night-time whispering murmuring moaning weary spirits that cannot rest troubled souls that find no peace the disappointed ones and you are dear to dream and hope and labor here in the canyon of gold to-day as those thousands who dare to dream and hope and labor here before you what are you but living ghosts among these restless spirits of the dead what are you to-day but shadows among the shades of yesterday you dr burton are only a memory of dreams that did not come true you mr edwards are but the ghost of the man you once planned to be you miss hillgrove are but the living embodiment of hopes that were never fulfilled as the shadow of an eagle passes you came and you shall go as the trail of the eagle in the air so shall your dreams your hopes and your labor be i natichi know these things but because i am an indian i dream no dreams i have no hopes he arose and for a moment stood silent before them then he said natichi the indian lives among the ghosts in the canyon of gold before they could speak he was gone as silently as he had come he disappeared around the corner of the cabin the two men and the girl had sat as if under a spell and in the heart of each there was a strange sadness and a shadow of fear as dr burton made his way homeward he wished more than ever that he had told martha the things that the pardoners had related to him ever since that day when she had first talked to him of the stranger st jimmy had watched carefully the girl's growing interest in her new neighbor and while martha herself had been wholly unconscious of the true meaning of those emotions which so disturbed her her teacher had understood that the womanhood of his child pupil was beginning to assert itself he was too wise not to know also that the time was approaching when martyr herself would understand through all her girlhood she had been no more conscious of herself than were the wild creatures that she knew so much better than she knew her own human kind she had lived in accepted life without a thought of the part that as a woman she would some day be called upon to play in it because of this freedom from self she had not been deeply concerned about the beginnings of her life but with the arousing of those instincts that were to her so strange would come inevitably a tremendous quickening of her interest in herself this new and vital interest in herself would as surely force her to inquire with determined and fearful persistency into her past who was she who were her parents under what circumstances was she born dr burton knew the fine pride and the sensitive nature of his pupil too well not to realize that when the time did come for the girl to ask these questions her happiness might well depend upon the answers the lizard's loose mouth gossip had brought him suddenly face to face with a situation which was to his mind filled with real danger to martyr's future his meeting with hugh edwards his quick observation of the comradeship that had developed between martha and her neighbor the uneasy forebodings aroused by the indian's words all combined now to make him resolve that at any cost to himself he no longer would put off telling the girl what she ought to know if hugh edwards were not the type of man he was or if martyr were not the kind of girl she was it would not perhaps make so much difference to-morrow martyr was going to oracle she would stop at the little white house on the mountain side on her way home st jimmy promised himself that he would surely tell her then End of chapter 12 the awakening she understood now why the old prospectors had never talked to her of her parents or told her how she happened to be there 
partnership daughter marta began that day with such buoyant happiness that even her fathers accustomed as they were to her habitually joyous nature commented on it the air was tingling with the fresh and vigorous sweetness of the early morning from the kitchen door as she prepared breakfast she saw the mountain tops golden in the first waves of the sunshine flood that a few hours later would fill the sky from rim to rim and cover the earth from horizon to horizon with its dazzling beauty from some shelf on the canyon wall a canyon wren loosed a flood of joyous silvery music gracing his song with runs and flourishes rich and vibrant as if the very spirit of the hour was in his melody and while the canyon echoed and re-echoed to the wondrous ringing music of the tiny minstrel and the girl with happy eyes and smiling lips listened she saw a thin column of smoke rise from that neighboring cabin and knew that her neighbor too was beginning his day like the puff of air that stirred the yellow blossom of the whispering bells beside the creek the thought came was he enjoying with her the beauty and the sweetness of the morning was he sharing her happiness in the new day then as she watched hugh appeared in the cabin doorway with a bucket in his hand he was going for water to make his coffee she saw him pause and look toward her and her face was radiant with gladness as her voice rang out in merry greeting all that forenoon she went about her household work with a singing heart when the midday meal was over her father's saddled nugget and as soon as she had washed the dishes she set out for oracle to purchase some needed supplies when the girl stopped at his cabin as she always did to ask if she could bring anything for him from the store edwards thought she had never looked so radiantly beautiful glowing with the color of her superb health and rich vitality animated and eager with the fervor of her joyous spirit she was so alluring that the man was sorely tempted to say to her those things that he had sternly forbidden himself even to think lest his eyes betray the feeling he had sentenced himself to suppress he made pretext of giving some small attention to her horse's bridle so that from the saddle she could not see his face as she rode on up the trail he stood there watching her when she had passed from sight around a sharp angle of the canyon wall he went slowly to the place where through the long days he labored in his search for the grains of yellow metal that had come to mean so much more to him than mere daily bread where the trail to the little white house on the hill branches off from the main road to oracle marta checked her horse she wanted to go to st jimmy and mother burton she wanted them to know and share her happiness she wanted to tell them how grateful she was for their love for all that they had done to save her from the ignorant undisciplined and dangerously impulsive creature she would have been but for their patient teaching in the fullness of her heart she told herself that without st jimmy and his mother she could never have known the joy and gladness that had come to her without conscious reasoning she realized that it was their teaching their love their understanding of her needs that had fitted her for that time of her awakening to the glad call of those deeper emotions that now moved her young womanhood but above mount lemon and back of rice peak huge cumulus clouds were rolling up and the girl knew she must continue on the more direct way if she would finish her errand at the store and return before the storm that might come later in the day on her way back she could stop at the burtons for then if the storm came it would not so much matter through narrow rocky ravines and tree shaded draws and sandy washes up the steep sides of mountain spurs and along the ridges nugget carried her out of the canyon of gold to the higher levels and everywhere about her as she rode the mountain sides were bright with the blossoms of the little spring seagull lilies and sulphur flowers 
wild buckwheat thistle poppies and bee plant and most exquisitely beautiful of all perhaps the violet tinted blue larkspur espuela del caballero cavalier spur the early spaniards called it in george wheeler's pasture not far from the corrals with the windmill and the water tank she met the sturdy red-cheeked wheeler boys and turquoise one of the ranch dogs playing indian from their ambush behind a granite rock they shot at her with their make-believe guns and charged with such savage fury and fierce war whoops the nugget danced in quick excitement while she was laughing with them and they were courteously opening the big gate for her their father shouted a genial greeting from the barn and mrs wheeler from the front porch called a cheery invitation for her to stop a while but she answered that it looked as if it were going to rain and that she must be home in time for supper and rode on her way to the little mountain village in the wide space in front of the store a group of saddle horses stood with heads down and hanging bridle reins waiting with sleepy patience for their riders who were lounging on the high platform that with steps at either end was built across the front of the building as she drew near marta recognized the lizard then as they watched her approaching she saw the lizard say something to his companions and the company of idlers broke into loud laughter the girl's face flushed with the uncomfortable feeling that she was the victim of the fellow's uncouth wit two of the men arose and stood a little apart from the lizard and his fellow loungers when the girl stopped her horse a sudden hush fell over the group and as she dismounted she was conscious that every eye was fixed upon her with burning cheeks and every nerve in her body smarting with indignant embarrassment the girl went quickly up the steps and into the store as she passed them the two cowboys who stood apart lifted their hats the girl was just inside the open doorway when the lizard spoke again and again his companions roared with unclean mirth at the vulgar jest and this time marta heard she stopped as if some one had struck her stunned with the shock she stood hesitating trembling not knowing what to do for the first time in her life the girl was frightened and ashamed two women of the village who were buying groceries regarded her coldly for a moment then turning their backs whispered together timidly the girl went to the farther end of the room where to hide her emotions until she could gain control of herself she pretended an interest in the contents of a showcase before the laughter of the lizard's crowd had ceased one of the cowboys who had raised his hat walked up to them with an expression of unspeakable disgust and contempt upon his bronzed face the rider looked the lizard up and down those who had laughed sat motionless and silent slowly the man from arkansas got to his feet the cowboy spoke in a low voice as if not wishing his words to be heard in the store that'll be about all from you you stinkin' son of a polecat never mind your gun he added sharply as the lizard's hand crept toward the leg of his chaps there ain't goin to be no trouble not here and now i'm just tellin you this time that such remarks are out of order a heap here in arizona they may be customary back where you come from but they won't make you popular in this country except maybe with varmints of your own sort he included the lizard's friends in his look of cool readiness not a man moved the cowboy carefully rolled his cigarette calmly he lighted a match and with the first deep inhalation of smoke flipped the burnt bit of wood at the lizard to the others he said i notice you hombres are thinking it over you'd best keep right on thinking as for you he again looked the man from arkansas up and down with slow contemptuous eyes then without another word he deliberately turned his back upon the lizard and his friends and walked leisurely to his horse as the cowboy and his companion rode away another chorus of laughter came from the group of idlers and this time their merriment was caused not by anything the lizard said but was directed at the lizard himself better not let steve brodie catch you again advised one he'll sure climb your frame if he does said another steve's a ridin for the three c now ain't he asked another seemingly anxious to change the subject ah uh -huh, good man steve came from another with an oath the lizard slouched away to his horse and mounting rode off in the direction of his home 
in the store martyr struggled desperately to regain at least a semblance of composure the two women when they had made their purchases were in no haste to go and under the pretext of taking advantage of their meeting for a friendly chat furtively watched the partner's girl martyr pretending to examine some dress goods displayed on a table behind the stove tried to hide herself when the kindly clerk came to wait on her she started and blushed trembling and confused she could not remember what it was that she had come to buy the clerk looked at her curiously the women whispered again and tittered at last in desperation the girl stammered that she did not want anything that she must go that she would come in again before she started home with downcast eyes and burning cheeks she fled as she passed the men on the platform and walked swiftly to her horse she kept her eyes on the ground she was so weak that she could scarcely raise herself to the saddle but the men were not watching her now with their faces turned away they were with one accord interested in something that held their gaze in another direction perplexed and troubled marta made her way slowly back toward the canyon when nugget thinking quite likely of his supper perhaps observing the dark storm clouds that now hid the mountain tops would have broken into a swifter pace she pulled him down to a walk annoyed at the unusual restraint the little horse fretted tossed his head and tugged at the bit but she would not let him go the girl wanted to think she felt that she must think what was the meaning of that incident at the store why did those men laugh in just that way when they first saw her why had they watched her like that when she dismounted why had they looked at her so as she passed them why did those women refuse to speak to her they knew her and what had they whispered after turning their backs upon her she had never before been conscious of anything like this all her life she had met rough men she had not been unaccustomed to rude jests she had been in the presence of men like a young boy unconscious of her sex the only close association with men she had ever known was with st jimmy and her father's until edwards came it could not be that these people were any different to-day than on other days when she had gone to the store it must be that she herself was different yes she told herself at last she was different just as she had found a deeper happiness than she had ever known before she had found a new consciousness a new capacity for feeling that had made her blush when the men looked at her that had made her ashamed when she had heard the lizard's jest and then her mind went back to consider things which she had always accepted as a matter of course without question or particular thought as she had accepted her two fathers why had she never been invited to the parties and dances at oracle why was it that except for mother burton and good mrs wheeler she had no women friends only men had attempted to be friendly with her and they had approached her only when she met them by chance alone she knew them all they all knew her suddenly she remembered how st jimmy had warned her once long before hugh edwards had come to the cunada del oro you must be always very careful in your friendships dear before you permit an acquaintance with any man to develop into anything like intimacy you must know about his past and by past i mean parentage family ancestors as well as his own personal record for let me tell you that no one can escape these things we are all what the past has made us the inevitable question came in a flash what was her own past her parentage her family the conclusion came as quickly she understood now why the old prospectors had never talked to her of her own parents nor told her how she had happened to be their partnership daughter she understood now the significance of her name hillgrove her two fathers had given her their names because she had no name of her own nothing else could so clearly explain the attitude of the people which had been so forcefully impressed upon her by her new consciousness just as the young woman reached this point in her reasoning her horse stopped of his own volition the girl had been so engrossed with her thoughts that she had not seen the lizard ride from behind a thick screen of low cedars beside the trail and check his horse directly across the path she was not at all frightened when she looked up and saw him waiting there boring her way indeed she regarded the fellow with a new interest it was as if one factor in her sad problem had suddenly presented itself in a very definite and tangible form well she said at last what do you want the lizard's wide mouth leering grin was not in the least reassuring i knowed ye'd be a comin along directly he said and la loud we'd ride together but what if i do not care to ride with you she returned curiously oh that ain't a botherin me none i ain't no ways thin-skinned he returned reining his horse aside from the trail to make room for her 
come along ye might as well be sociable like i know i can't make much of a showin in education and fine school talk like you've been used to but i'm just as good as that lunger st jimmy air that their fancy neighbor of yourn any day something in the fellow's face or some quality in his tone brought the blood to martyr's cheeks thank you she said curtly but i prefer to ride alone she lifted the bridle rein and nugget started forward but the lizard again pulled his mount across the trail and the man's rat-like face was twisted now with sudden rage oh you do do you well let me tell you i've stood all i'm a-goin to stand on your account to-day why what do you mean she demanded amazed never you mind what i mean my lady you just listen to what i got to say you've been a-playin the high and mighty with me long enough do you think i don't know what you are do you think i don't know all about your carryin on my god a mighty hits a disgrace to any decent neighbourhood a pretty one you are to be a puttin on airs with me why well, you poor little fool everybody knows what you are who's your father who's your mother decent people has got decent folks and you you ain't got none you ain't even got a name of your own hill grove two fathers you're just low-down trash nobody that's decent won't have nothing to do with you you prefer to ride alone do you all right my fine lady you needn't worry none you're going to ride alone all right i wouldn't be seen within a mile of you with the last brutal word he whirled his horse about and set off down the trail as fast as the animal could run the girl with her head bowed low over the saddle-horn sat very still her trembling fingers nervously twisted a lock of nugget's mane here was confirmation indeed of all the doubts and fears to which she had been led by her own painful thoughts here was the answer to all her questions here at last was the explanation of those emotions which were to her so new and strange End of chapter thirteen the storm there ain't a god almighty thing that we can do till the mornin the old partners when their day's work was finished climbed slowly down from the mouth of the tunnel to the creek and crossing the little stream climbed as slowly up to the level above as his head and shoulders came above the top of the steep bank thad who was in the lead stopped what's the matter called bob who was close behind in the narrow path with his head on a level with his partner's feet gittin so old you can't make the grade without takin a rest be you whar's the little pinto hoss demanded thad in an injured tone as if the absence of nugget was a personal grievance bob climbed to his partner's side looks like marta ain't back yet she ought to be said thad with an anxious eye on the threatening clouds that now hung dark and heavy over the upper canyon stopped at st jimmy's i reckon returned bob who was also studying the angry sky goin to storm some ain't it the gal sure can't miss seein that returned the other and she ought to know that when we do get a storm this time of the year it's always a buster i wish she was home mebbe she's over to edwards said bob hopefully they went on toward the house until they gained an unobstructed view of the neighboring cabin and premises her hoss ain't there neither said thad and again he looked up at the dark rolling clouds oh she'll be comin along in a minute or two offered bob soothingly but his voice betrayed the anxiety his words were meant to hide marta was no novice in the mountains and the old partners knew that it was not like their girl to ignore the near approach of a storm that would in a few moments change the murmuring canyon creek into a wild roaring flood that no living horse could ford or swim the trail on its course from her home to the burtons and to oracle crossed and recrossed the creek many times and should the storm break in the upper canyon at the right moment it would easily be possible for the girl to be trapped at some point between the canyon walls and the bends of the stream and forced to spend at least the night there more than this there was a place where the trail followed for some distance up the narrow sandy bed of the creek itself between sheer cliffs 
the partners and marta have more than once seen a rolling plunging raging wall of water come thundering down the canyon from a storm above with a mad force that no power on earth could check or face and with a swiftness that no horse could outrun a few scattered drops of rain came pattering down the partners without another word hurried over to edward's cabin the younger man who was coming up the path from his work greeted them with a cheery hello neighbors looks like we're goin to have a shower then as he came closer and saw their faces his own countenance changed and the old look of fear came into his eyes why what's the matter what has happened he glanced quickly around as if half expecting to see someone else near by marta ain't come home said thad and in the same instant bob asked did she say anything to you about being specially late getting back to-day edwards drew a long breath of relief no she said nothing to me about her plans but really there's no cause for worry is there she always stops at the burtons with the mail on her way back you know perhaps she stayed longer than she realized come on in out of the wet he added as the pattery drops of rain grew more plentiful she will be along presently i am sure with a glance at the fast approaching storm fad said quickly you don't understand son we ain't worried about the gal gettin wet and then in a few words he explained the grave possibilities of the situation if she stops at st jimmy's it'll be all right but if she's trying to make it home and gets caught in the canyon a gust of wind and a swirling dash of rain punctuated his words old bob started for the canyon trail the others followed at his heels when they reached the narrow road a short distance away they halted for a second there's fresh hoss tracks said bob somebody's been riding this way tain't the pinto though it's the lizard probably said edwards i saw him pass on his way up the canyon this forenoon half running they hurried on before they reached the first turn in the canyon a fierce downpour drenched them to the skin the falling flood of water driven by the blast that swept down from the mountain heights and swirled around the cliffs and angles of the canyon walls hissed and roared with fury there goes any chance of striking her trail shouted thad grimly the three men bent their heads and broke into a run at the beginning of that stretch of the trail which follows the bed of the creek bob stopped abruptly look here he said to the others we've got to use some sense and go at this thing right if we all of us go ahead like this we'll all be caught on t'other side of the creek when the rise gets here if she ain't already in the canyon she might be at st jimmy's and she might not there's a chance that the gal got started home from the store late and was afraid to try comin this way and so left oracle by the tucson highway figurin to cut across the hills somewheres to the old canyon road and try crossin the creek lower down like we do sometimes it'll be plum dark pretty quick and if she ain't at st jimmy's there are to two of us cover both the one by burton's and the one that goes direct and there ought to one of us stay on this side of the creek in case she has made it the other way round you won't be much good no how son he continued to edwards if it comes to huntin the hills out cause you don't know the country like we do suppose you go back down to the lower crossin where the old road comes into the canyon you know the way you come if she don't show up there in another hour or two you'll know she didn't go that way there ain't another thing that you can do till daylight you men know best said edwards and turned to go thad caught the younger man by the arm wait for a second he paused then spoke slowly it might not be a bad idea while you're down that way to drop in on the lizard come on cried bob we sure got to run for it if we beat the rise into this cut the partners disappeared in the gray swirling downpour edwards with a new fear in his heart ran with all his strength down the canyon but it was not alone the thought of the coming flood that made his heart sink with sickening dread it was the memory of the lizard's face that day when the fellow had first told him of marta by the time he reached the cabin hugh heard the roaring thunder of the flood for an instant he paused had the two old prospectors gained the higher ground beyond the stretch of trail in the creek bottom in time he turned as if to go back then came the thought he could not now retrace his steps beyond the first crossing whether the partners were safe or were caught by the flood it was too late now for human aid to reach them 
again he hurried on down the canyon when he came to the place where he had made his camp the, that first night in the canyon of gold it was almost dark but over the spot where he had built his fire and spread his blanket bed he could see a leaping racing torrent that filled the channel of the creek from bank to bank for nearly three hours he waited where the old road crossed the stream convinced at last that marta had not come that way he went on down the canyon to the adobe house where the lizard lived with his parents it was late now but there was a light in the window the dogs filled the night with their clamor as he approached and he stopped at the dilapidated gate to shout hello hello the door opened and a long lane of light cut through the darkness the lizard's voice followed the light hello yourself what do you want who be you i'm edwards from up the canyon call off your dogs will you from the gate he could see the fellow in the doorway turned to consult with someone inside then the lizard called to the dogs and shouted come on in neighbor little late for ye to be out ain't it he added as edwards approached then who you got with you there's no one with me returned edwards as he paused in the light before the door come in you're welcome come right in and set by the fire you're some wet i reckon as the lizard spoke he drew aside from the doorway and as edwards entered he saw the man place a rifle which he had held against the wall an old woman sat beside the open fire smoking a cob pipe the lizard's father stood with his back to the wall at the far end of the room they greeted the visitor with a brief howdy the lizard offered a broken-backed chair thank you said edwards but i can't stop to sit down i came to ask if you have seen miss hillgrove this afternoon the lizard and his father looked at each other the old mother answered what's the matter come up missin has she edwards told them in a few words the old woman spat in the fire and laughed she's most likely out in the brush somewheres with some no-account feller like herself sarves her right if she gets caught by the creek sich triflin hussies ought ter get drowned i say all us a tryin to coax decent folks inter meanness best not waste your time a huntin sich as her young man edward spoke sharply to the lizard who was grinning with satisfaction did you see miss hillgrove this afternoon anywhere on the trail between here and oracle the father answered in a voice shrill with vicious anger well and what ef he did who be you to be a-comin here at this time o the night wantin to know ef my boy has or hain't seed nobody hugh edwards forced himself to speak calmly i am asking a several question which your son should be glad to answer he again faced the lizard did you see her an insolent wide-mouthed grin was the lizard's only reply the old woman by the fire looked over her shoulder tell him boy tell him she croaked you ain't got no call to be skeered o such as him shocks ma said the son i ain't skeered o nothin i'm just a havin a little fun that's all he addressed edwards you bet your life i seed her bout a mile this side o wheeler's pasture it was we sure had a nice little visit to you and that thar st jimmy needn't to think you're the only ones before edwards could speak the old woman cried again tell him son why don't ye tell him what ye said the lizard grinned i sure told her enough i'd been a aimin to lay her out first chance i got when i got through with her you can bet she knowed more about herself than she'd ever knowed before she sure knows now what she is and what folks is a-thinkin about her and her carryin on with that there lunger and you his voice rose and his rat eyes glistened with triumph she wouldn't ride with me oh no prefer to ride alone says she and i says says i when i'd finished a tellin her what she was and how she didn't have no folks nor name nor nothin you needn't to worry none there wouldn't no decent man be seen within a mile of you and then i left her settin there like she'd been whipped hugh edwards moved a step near it seemed impossible to him that any man could do a thing so vile are you in earnest he asked did you really say such things to miss hillgrove i sure did returned the lizard proudly i believe in lettin such people know whar they stand she's been a-playin the high and mighty with me long enough then edwards struck with every ounce of his strength behind it the blow landed fair on the point of the lizard's chin the loose mouth was open at the instant the slack jaw received the impact with no resistance the effect was terrific the fellow's head snapped back as if his neck were broken he fell limp and senseless halfway across the room the old woman screeched to her man get him joel get him 
the lizard's father started forward and edwards saw a knife a quick leap and hugh caught up the rifle that the lizard had placed against the wall covering the man with the knife the visitor said coolly to the woman not to-night madam i'm sorry to disappoint you but he isn't going to get any one just now he backed to the door and opened it with his face toward them and his weapon ready i will leave this gun at the gate he said if you are as wise as i think you are you will not leave this room until you are sure that i am gone he pulled the door shut as he backed across the threshold as hugh edwards made his way back upon the canyon he reflected on what the lizard had said one thing was certain marta had not started home by the highway but where was she now at st jimmy's edwards doubted that the girl would go to her friends after such an experience nor did he believe that she would come directly home he knew too well the sensitive pride that was under all the frank boyishness of her nature no one was better fitted than he to appreciate the possible effects of the lizard's cruelty hugh edwards knew the dreadful power of humiliation and shame he knew the burning withering torture of unexpected and unjust public exposure and of undeserved popular condemnation he knew the horror and despair of innocence subjected to the unspeakable cruelty of those evil-minded gossips whose one hope is that the venomous news they spread may be true so that they will not be deprived of their vicious pleasure better than any one hugh edwards knew why martyr had not come home after meeting the lizard like a hunted creature wounded and spent this man had come as so many had come before him to the cañada del oro he had come to the canyon of gold to forget and to be forgotten and he had found martyr in the frankness and fearlessness of her innocence the girl had not known how to keep her love from him and seeing her love hungering for that love as a starving man hungers for food as a soul in torment hungers for peace he had resolutely forbidden himself to speak the words that would make her his when he had first come to the canyon he had hoped only to find gold enough to secure the bare necessities of life and when out of their daily companionship his love had come with such distracting power he had been the more miserable but when he had heard from the partners their story of how they found the girl he had seen that there was no reason save his own ill-starred past why if he could win freedom from that past he might not claim her that freedom the freedom from the thing that had driven him to hide in the cañada del oro the freedom to tell her his love could only be had in the gold for which he toiled in the sand and gravel and rocks beside the canyon creek as men through all the years have sought gold for love so he had worked in that place of broken hopes and vanished dreams every day when she was with him he had sternly forced himself to wait every night he had dreamed in his lonely cabin of the time when he should be free every morning he had gone to his work at sunrise buoyed with the hope that before dark his pick and shovel would uncover a rich pocket of the yellow metal every evening at sunset as he climbed up the steep path from the place of his labor he had whispered to himself to-morrow and now it had all come to this with the knowledge of what the lizard had done and the full realization of all that might so easily result the man's control of himself was broken he was beside himself with anxiety if marta was not safe with her friends at the little white house on the mountain side where was she had the partners found her was she wandering half insane with shame and despair through the storm and darkness had she been caught in that plunging flood that was roaring with such wild fury down the canyon was her beautiful body that had been so vivid so radiant with life at that moment being crushed and torn by the grinding boulders and jagged walls of rocks perhaps the partners too had been met by that rushing wall of water before they could escape from the trap into which he had seen them disappear as these thoughts crowded upon him the man broke into a run there must be something something that he could do the sense of his utter uselessness was maddening at the gate to martyr's home he stopped and in the agony of his fears he shouted her name again and again he called until the loneliness of the dark house and the sullen grinding crashing roar of the creek drove him on at the first crossing above his own cabin the stream barred his way again he cried with all his might marta marta thad bob but the sound of his voice was lost beaten down overwhelmed by the wild tumult of the plunging torrent at last weary and spent with his efforts and realizing dully the foolishness of such a useless waste of his strength he returned to martyr's home he did not stop at his own cabin something seemed to lead him on to that house to which he had drifted months before 
as a broken and battered ship drifts into a safe harbor from the storm that has left it nearly a wreck since the first hour of his coming that home had been his refuge every morning from his own cabin door he had looked for the chimney smoke as a wretched castaway watches for a signal of hope and cheer every night in his loneliness he had looked for the lights as one lost in the desert looks at a guiding star he could not bear the thought now of those dark windows and empty rooms as the partners were climbing out of the creek bed where the trail leaves the canyon for the higher levels they heard the thundering roar of the coming flood thank god we know that won't get her anyhow gasped old fat that their run just about winded me bob panting heavily managed a sickly grin like as not we'll find her safe and dry eatin supper at st jimmy's and ready to laugh with us for a pair of old fools gettin ourselves so worked up over nothin here's hopin returned the other but it's bound to be a bad night for the boy back there pity there won't be no way to get word to him till mornin they could not go very fast and it was pitch dark before they reached the little white house but at the sight of the lighted windows they hurried as best they could stumbling over the loose rocks and slipping in the mud up the narrow zigzag trail in less than ten minutes from the time st jimmy opened the door in answer to their knock they were again starting out into the night and this time they separated thad returned to the point where the path leads by the burton place branches off from the main trail to make his way from there on while bob continued on the path from the white house which joins again the main trail at wheeler's pasture gate another hour and the storm was passed through the ragged clouds the stars peered timidly but every ravine and draw and wash was a channel for a roaring freshet a little way from wheeler's corral in the pasture thad met his partner coming back he was riding and leading another horse saddled she didn't start home on the highway said bob they seen her at wheeler's did they yes george saw her himself when she was going and when she come back george he saddled up and gone on into oracle to pass the word he'll be out with a bunch of riders at sun-up thad climbed stiffly into the saddle and for some minutes the two old prospectors sat on their horses without speaking while over their heads the wind-torn clouds swept past as if hurrying to some meeting-place beyond the distant hills there ain't a god almighty thing that we can do till the morning said bob at last slowly and in silence they rode back to the little white house on the mountain side there to wait with st jimmy and mother burton for the coming of the day the two old prospectors who had spent the greater part of their lives amid scenes of hardship and danger and whose years had been years of disappointment and failure in their vain search for treasure of gold had given themselves without reserve to the child that chance had so strangely placed in their keeping lacking the home love and the fatherhood that spurs the millions of toiling men to their tasks and glorifies the burden of their labors bob and fat had spent themselves in their love for their partnership daughter but because these men had been schooled in silence by the deserts of the mountains they made no outward show of their anxiety and fear they did not cry out in wild protest and vain regrets and idle conjectures they did not walk the floor or wring their hands they sat motionless in stolid silence waiting mother burton in the seclusion of her own room found relief for her overwrought nerves and quiet tears and carried the burden of her anxious aching mother heart to the god of motherhood st jimmy paced the floor with slow measured steps pausing now and then to look from the window into the night or to stand in the open doorway with his face lifted to the wind-swept sky listening listening for a voice in the darkness in martyr's home beside the roaring creek alone amid the dear intimate things of her daily life the man who had been made to live again in her love waited waited for the eternity of the night to lift from the canyon of gold End of chapter fourteen martyr's flight she did not know where she was going she did not care what did it matter where she went the victim of the lizard's unspeakable brutality was as one dazed by an unexpected blow coming as the fellow's vicious attack did so close upon her own uneasy thoughts it seemed to answer all her troubled questions and she accepted every cruel word as the truth nugget wondering perhaps why his rider remained so motionless 
when the other horse and rider had gone on essayed an inquiring step or two forward when his mistress gave no heed to his movement he tossed his head and pulled at the slack bridle rein invitingly what's the matter he seemed to say come on why don't we go but still she gave no sign of life slowly as if still wondering and a bit doubtful the little horse moved on down the familiar way toward home at the pasture gate the pinto without a sign from his rider placed himself so that she could reach the latch mechanically she opened the gate and the knowing animal helped her close it from the other side but when nugget would have taken the trail which goes past that white house on the mountain side by which they always went home from oracle martyr reined him back with a sudden start she could not go that way now she remembered with a wave of hot shame how she had proposed to st jimmy that they be married and run away somewhere and how she had pictured their home she understood now why he had laughed in that queer strained way it would have seemed funny to any man like dr burton with such a family name and birth and breeding that a girl like her born as she was without a name with no right to be born at all even would dare to suggest such a thing st jimmy and mother burton had been good to her yes they would be good to any one like that they had pitied her and had wanted to help her but of course st jimmy had laughed when she asked him to marry her she would love those dear friends always but at the thought of ever meeting them again she shook with terror she felt that she would die with shame as she rode on the girl gave no heed to the heavy storm clouds that were massing above the upper canyon at any other time she would have seen and would have pushed her horse to his utmost speed in a race with the coming flood but now she was too occupied to think of the approaching danger in fact her thoughts of st jimmy and mother burton were only momentary when her horse had turned into the direct trail to the canyon she was fighting to keep herself from thinking of the man who lived in the cabin so close to her home she was telling herself over and over that she must not think of him and yet she did and her thoughts burned like coals of fire marta knew now with terrifying certainty that she loved hugh edwards not indeed with the love that she gave st jimmy and which until edwards came was the only kind of love she knew but with that other love the love that a woman gives to the one man she chooses above all others to be her man for all time to come in the lives of her children their children her happiness that morning had been born of the certainty that the man she had chosen wanted her he had never spoken a word of love to her but she knew in a thousand ways he had told her his very efforts to keep from speaking had made her more sure in her happiness she had not understood she had not even realized why she had wanted him to speak she had only felt instinctively that she belonged to him and that he wanted her but that for some reason he hesitated but now the lizard had explained it all she knew now that her love for edwards was an evil love she knew that her instinctive answer to him was a wicked thing she knew that the emotions stirred by him were vile she understood at last why he had not spoken the words she hungered to hear he would never speak he was like st jimmy the mother of hugh edwards sons must not be a nameless nobody a creature of shameful birth and evil desires a woman upon whom decent women turn their backs and at whom men like the lizard laughed in scorn the girl was almost inside of hugh's cabin when with sudden energy she sat erect and again checked her horse around that next turn in the canyon wall he would be waiting she could not go on a barrier invisible but mightier than any mountain wall had fallen across her way she was separated shut out she was unclean she must not go near the one she loved wheeling her horse the girl rode away up the canyon straight toward the storm that was gathering in the mountains above she did not know where she was going she did not care what did it matter where she went she would go anywhere but there where he was waiting blindly she rode into that stretch of the trail that lies in the channel of the creek between the sheer walls but when at the end of the hall like passage her horse would have followed the trail out of the canyon she pulled him back the pinto fretted and tried to turn once more toward home but she forced him to leave the trail and go on up the creek for some time the little horse labored through the sand and gravel or picked his way as a mountain horse will around boulders and over the rocks so that when those first few drops of rain came pattering down 
the girl was already a considerable distance up the canyon again nugget protested and again she forced him on she had reached a point beyond where the canyon turns back toward the south when the storm broke and the rain came swirling down the mountain in torrents the fierce downpour driven by the heavy gusts of wind forced her to bend low in the saddle on every side the dense gray curtain enveloped her her horse broke in open rebellion nugget knew if his rider had forgotten the grave danger of their position in the creek bed and he proceeded to take such action as would at least ensure their immediate safety there were a few preliminary bounds then a scrambling rush with flying gravel and rolling rocks and tearing brush with plunging leaps and straining heavy lifts during which the girl rider could do little more than cling to the saddle when her horse finally consented again to the control of the bit and stood trembling with heaving flanks on the steep side of the mountain marta had lost all sense of direction in the terrific downpour she could not see a hundred yards wrapped in the gray folds of that wind-blown curtain every detail of the landscape save the near-by bushes was obscure beyond recognition no familiar peak or skyline could be seen suddenly nugget threw up his head his ears pointed inquiringly the girl too looked and listened then above the hiss of the rain on the rocks and bushes and the roar of the wind along the mountain slope she heard the thunder of the coming flood nearer and louder came the sound until presently that rolling crest of the flood freighted with crushing grinding boulders swept past of the gray depths of the canyon below her horse's feet were filled with the wild uproar marta knew that to go back the way she had come was impossible she realized dully that nugget had saved both her life and his it did not much matter but she was glad that the little horse was not down there in the bed of the creek they might as well go on somewhere she thought perhaps nugget could find some place where he at least would be more comfortable giving her horse the signal to start she dropped the bridle rein on his neck thus permitting him to choose his own course with sure-footed care the little horse picked his way along the mountain side always climbing a little higher until finally they reached what the girl knew must be the top of the ridge or spur of the main range following this ridge which led always upward but at, at an easy grade the pinto moved with greater freedom they came at last to a low gap through which nugget went without a sign of hesitation and again he was making his way along the steep side of the mountain it was nearly dark when the girl became aware that her horse was following a faint trail she did not know when they had come into this trail it was so faintly marked that it could scarcely be distinguished if at all but nugget seemed perfectly content and confident and because there was no reason for doing otherwise and because she did not care she let the horse go the way he had chosen the night came swiftly down the great curtain deepened to black the girl did not even try to guess where she was except that she knew she must be somewhere on one of the mountain slopes that formed the upper part of the cañada del oro the wildest and most remote section of the santa catalina range she was exhausted with the stress of her emotions and numb with her rain-soaked clothing in the cool air of the altitude to which they had climbed as the light failed and the black wall of the night closed in about her she swayed half fainting in her saddle nugget stopped and the girl slipped to the ground clinging to the saddle for support peering into the gloom she could barely distinguish the mass of a mountain cedar a little farther on wearily she stumbled and crept forward until she could crawl beneath the low sodden branches the girl felt herself sinking into a thick darkness that was not the darkness of the night End of chapter fifteen natichi my gifts are only the gifts of an indian miss hillgrove i see with the eyes of a red man that is all as consciousness returned to marta her first sensation was that of physical comfort she thought that she was in her own bed at home awakening from a dream slowly she opened her eyes instead of her own familiar room she saw the rough unhewn rafters the log walls and the rude furnishings of an apartment that was strange wonderingly without moving she looked at the unfamiliar details at the fireplace of uncut rocks with a generous fire blazing on the hearth the lighted lamp on the table the rough board cupboard in the far corner the cooking utensils hanging beside the fireplace and at the skins of mountain lion and lynx and fox 
and wolf and bear that hung upon the walls it all seemed real enough and yet she felt that it must be a part of her dream she would awaken presently she thought how curious how real it was she put a hand and arm out from under the covers and touched not the familiar blankets of her own bed but a fur robe the effect was as if she had come in contact with an electric wire in the same instant she saw the sleeve of her jacket and realized that she was not in her own bed at all but was lying fully dressed on a rude couch that her clothing was still wet from a storm that was not a dream storm and that everything else was as real but where was she who had brought her to this strange place fully awake now the girl made a more careful survey of the room and this time saw hanging on a peg in the log wall near the fireplace a bow with a sheaf of arrows and on the floor beneath a pair of moccasins natachi with a shudder as if from a sudden chill martyr threw back the fur robe and sat up she was not frightened it is doubtful if martyr had ever in her life known real fear but there was something about the indian that always as she had expressed it gave her the creeps swiftly her mind reviewed the hours that had passed since she left her home to go to oracle her good-bye to edwards her happiness as she rode over the familiar trail her meeting with the wheeler children and their parents the incident at the store her troubled thoughts as she started homeward and then the crushing shame the horror of the things that the lizard had made known to her of her actual movements after the lizard left her she remembered almost nothing clearly that part of her experience remained to her still as a dream but that one dominant necessity which had driven her into the storm and the night that stood clear in all its naked and hideous reality she could not with the burning certainty of her shame she could not see st jimmy nor hugh edwards again rising she went to the fireplace and stood before the blaze to dry her still damp clothing she was calmer now the wild uncontrolled storm of her emotions had passed with her physical exhaustion had come a sort of relief from her emotional strain she could think now as she stood looking down into the fire she told herself with a degree of calmness that she must think she must plan she must decide what should she do she was standing there with her eyes fixed on the blazing logs in the fireplace when she became aware that she was not alone as clearly as if she had seen it she felt a presence in the room she turned to look over her shoulder natachi stood just inside the closed door of the cabin he had entered opening and closing the heavy door without a sound as she whirled to face him the indian bowed with grave courtesy i beg your pardon miss hillgrove i did not mean to startle you but i thought you might be sleeping there was nothing either in the indian's face or in his manner to alarm her save for his savage dress he might have been any well-bred college or university man nor did the girl in the least fear him she only felt that curious creepy feeling that she always experienced in his presence as if to put her more at ease natachi went to bring a rustic chair from the other end of the room saying in a matter-of-fact tone i've been out taking care of your little horse he will be comfortable for the night i think he placed the chair before the fire and drew back won't you be seated you could dry your boots so much better marta sat down and holding her wet feet to the blaze looked again into the ruddy flames the indian standing at the other side of the room waited motionless as a graven image for her to speak thank you she said at last at her words or rather at her air of utter hopelessness a flash of cruel satisfaction gleamed for an instant in the sombre eyes of the red man but marta did not see it is nothing said the indian and his deep voice gave no hint of the fire that had for the instant blazed in his dark impassive countenance it is a pleasure to be of any service and then with a smile which again the girl did not see he added i was caught in the storm myself without raising her eyes marta said wearily as if it did not in the least matter it was you who found me and brought me here 
i was on my way home from the canyon below when i chanced to catch a glimpse of you and your horse against the sky naturally i was curious to know who it was that rode in these unfrequented mountains through such a storm and at such an hour i managed to follow you and so found your horse then i found you and brought you here when the girl was silent he continued my poor little hut is not much i know but it is a shelter at least and i assure you you are as welcome as if it were the home of your dreams at this the girl threw up her head with a start staring at him with wide questioning eyes she said wonderingly the home of my dreams what do you know of my dreams natichi bowed his head i beg your pardon my choice of words was unfortunate but unintentional i assure you and yet he finished with quiet dignity it would be difficult for any one to imagine a woman like you being without a dream home with a shudder the girl turned back to the fire again that gleam of savage pleasure flashed in the eyes of the indian but i am forgetting he said you have had nothing to eat since noon and it is now past midnight this is a poor sort of hospitality indeed as he spoke he went to the cupboard and began putting dishes and food on the table the girl watched him curiously his every movement was so sure so complete and positive there was no show of haste and yet every motion was as quick as the movements of a deer he gave the impression of tremendous strength and energy yet his touch was as light as the hand of a child and his step as noiseless as the step of that great cat the cougar indeed as he went to and fro between the table the cupboard and the fireplace marta thought of a mountain lion and how do you know that i have had nothing to eat since noon she asked presently without looking up from the venison steak he was preparing he answered you went to oracle early in the afternoon you did not stop at the wheeler ranch on your way back you did not go to st jimmy's you did not go to hugh edwards you did not go home the girl's cheeks flushed as she persisted but how do you know have you some supernatural gift that enables you to see what people are doing no matter where you are natichi laughed my gifts are only the gifts of an indian miss hillgrove i see with the eyes of a red man that is all the girl looked again into the fire i wish you did have the gift of second sight she said speaking half to herself the indian flashed a look at her that would have startled her had she seen it why because she answered slowly because then perhaps you could tell me something that i want very much to know the indian who was behind her smiled dinner is served he said really i i don't think i can eat a thing she faltered looking up at him i know he returned gravely but perhaps if you try he placed a chair for her and stood expectantly and marta felt herself compelled to obey his unspoken will perhaps because of the strange effect of the indian's personality upon her or perhaps because she sought relief from the pain of thoughts which she could not express the girl encouraged the red man to talk of his life in the mountains and natichi as if courteously willing to serve her purpose followed her conversational leadings with no mention of her own life in the cañada del oro or of her friends over their simple meal of which marta managed to partake because she felt she must he told her of his hunting experiences and drew from his seemingly inexhaustible store of desert and mountain lore many strange and interesting things nor was there in anything that he said or in his way of speaking the slightest hint of his indian nature as they left the table and marta resumed her seat before the fire she said but i do not understand how a man educated as you are can be satisfied to live like she hesitated like an indian he finished for her well yes there was a long moment of silence before he replied with a marked change in his voice i live like an indian because i am an indian because if i would i could not be anything else as he spoke he came to the other side of the fireplace and seated himself on the floor and the act had for the girl the odd effect of a deliberate renunciation of the civilization which she in her chair seemed for the moment to personify it was as if in answering her question he had cast off the habit of his white man's schooling had thrown aside mask and cloak and placed before her his true self as he sat there in the picturesque garb of his savage fathers with the ruddy light of the fire playing on his bronze impassive countenance and glinting in the sombre depths of his steady eyes the young white woman looking down upon him could detect no trace of the white man's training 
and yet she said this cabin this room does not look like any indian's home that i ever saw he answered with the native imagery of a red man the cougar that has been taught to jump through a hoop at the crack of his trainer's whip is still a cougar the eagle in a white man's cage never acquires the spirit of a dove but i should think that with your education you would live among your people and teach them gazing steadfastly into the fire he answered grimly and what would you have me teach my people why teach them what you've learned teach them how to live the indian looked at her and the girl saw something in his countenance that made her feel all at once very weak and helpless she was embarrassed as if caught in some petty meanness in her confusion she began to stammer an apology but the red man raised his hand you a white woman shall hear an indian i natichi will speak it would be easier to number the drops of water that fell in the storm to-night than to tell the years of these mountains that look down upon the cañada del oro and the desert beyond they have seen the ages pass as the cloud shadows that race across their foothills when the spring winds blow before the beginnings of what you white people call history they had watched many races of men rise to the fullness of their strength and pride and fall as the flowers of the thistle poppies fall in the desert dust in the time appointed the indians came from the peaks of these mountains natachi the indian can see far from the place where the sun rises in the east to the mountains behind which he goes down in the west and from the farthest range that lies like a soft blue shadow in the north to that line in the south where the desert and the sky become one this land was the homeland of my indian fathers since the god of all life placed us here it has been our home what has the indian to-day was there a place where the tall pines grew and the winter snows lingered long into the dry season to feed the streams where the wild creatures drink i want those trees they are mine said the white man and he cut them down and sold them for gold and the naked mountains held no snows to feed the creeks and the meadows that god made became barren wastes lifeless was there a spring of water it is mine cried the white man and he built a fence around it and made a law to punish any thirsty creature that might dare to drink without paying him in this homeland of my fathers the wild life was as the grass on the mesas the indian took what he needed it was here for all the white man saw the antelopes in the foothills the deer on the mountain slopes the bear in the canyon the sheep among the peaks and he shouted they are mine all mine and every man in his white madness for fear some brother would destroy one more wild thing than he himself could count among his spoils killed and killed and killed and only the buzzards profited by the slaughter but i natichi an indian here in this homeland of my fathers because i dared to kill the deer from which we had our meat this evening am a violator of the white man's laws and subject to the white man's punishment you tell me that i should teach my people how to live by that you mean that i should teach them the ways of the white people is it the duty of one who has been robbed of all that was his to accept the thief as his schoolmaster and spiritual guide would you say that one who had been tricked and cheated out of his birthright must adopt the principles and customs of the trickster could you expect one who had been humiliated and shamed and broken to set up the author of his degradation as his ideal and pattern the schools of the white people taught me nothing that would cause the white people to permit me ever to make a place for myself among them as their equal no education can ever in the eyes of the white man make a white man of an indian all kinds of animals are educated for the circus ring and the show bench and the vaudeville stage if they prove clever enough you applaud them you reward them for amusing you you educate the indian if he be clever enough you give him a place in your social circus so long as he amuses you but do you permit him to become one of you in your homes your professions 
your law-making your business no he is no more one of you than the performing bear is one of you do you think that i natichi do not know these things do you think my people do not know that when one of their boys is put in the white man's schools he grows up to be something that is neither a white man nor an indian it is because they do know that they look upon me natichi as an outcast of the tribe would the outcast without place or people in the world teach others the things that made him an outcast the only thing that an indian can teach an indian is to die in the day of their strength and pride my fathers in these mountains saw the smoke from the first camp-fire made by a white man in the cañata del oro it was a signal smoke but no indian then could read its meaning we know now that it meant the time had come when the indians too must go into the shadows even as the many races that had passed before them but my people shall not be unavenged as the red man is going the white man too shall go the strength of the indian was the red strength of the mountains and deserts and forests and streams the indian is dying because the white man stole his red strength and turned it into a white man's strength which is yellow gold but the white man's yellow strength is his weakness in the golden flower of his greatness are the seeds of his decay for gold your people destroy the forests tear down the mountains dry up or poison the streams lay waste the grasslands and bring death to all life for gold they would rob degrade enslave and kill every race that is not of white blood for gold they rob degrade enslave and kill their own white brothers even the natural mating love of their men and women they have made into a thing to buy and sell for gold in this lust for gold their children are begotten and born to live for gold and of gold to perish the very diseases that rot the white man's bones wither his flesh dim his eyes and turn his blood to water are diseases which he buys with his gold and the only heaven that his religious teachers can conceive for his celestial happiness is a place where he may forever wear a crown of gold make music upon a harp of gold and walk upon streets of gold it was this gold which is both the white man's strength and his weakness that brought your race like a pestilence upon my people by this same gold for which the indian peoples have been destroyed shall the indians be revenged for by this gold shall the destroyers themselves in their turn be destroyed there is nothing left for the indian but to die i natichi have spoken at his closing words marta hillgrove caught her breath sharply nothing left but to die and you have you never dreamed of she could not speak her thought again that quick light of savage pleasure flashed across the dark face of the red man an indian has no right to dream of love he answered for love to an indian means children why should an indian wish to have children when the girl hid her face in her hands he continued with cruel purpose is it so hard for marta hillgrove to understand that there might be circumstances under which it would become a duty to deny oneself the happiness of loving if it is there are two men who could i'm sure make it clear to her for some time the indian sat watching the white woman as one of his ancestors might have watched an enemy undergoing the agony of torture then rising he said come it is time that you were taking your rest you have nearly reached the limit of your endurance you will sleep there on the couch i shall be within call in the morning i will take you home he threw more wood upon the fire and turned to leave the room you are very kind said the girl but i cannot go home natichi faced her and she saw the savage triumph that for the moment burned through the mask of stolid indifference which he habitually wore kind he said with cruel insolence kind and why should i natichi an indian be kind to you a white woman make no mistake miss hillgrove if i do not to-night treat you 
as my fathers treated the women of their enemies it is not because i am kind it is only because it will afford me a more enduring and keener pleasure to return you to your friends down there in the canyon of gold the girl cowering in her chair heard no sound when the indian left the room when morning came and natichi again appeared he was his usual stolid courteous self but marta knew now what fires of bitter hatred smouldered beneath the red man's calm exterior he made no reference to her statement that she could not go home nor did the girl dare to repeat what she had said she felt that she was powerless to do other than resign herself to the will of the indian who seemed to find a cruel satisfaction in returning her to st jimmy and hugh edwards when they had eaten breakfast natichi brought her horse the canyon creek below was still a roaring torrent impossible to cross but the red man led her by ways known only to himself around the head of the canyon and so at last to st jimmy and mother burton for the next two or three weeks marta avoided hugh edwards she saw him frequently at a distance and when he came to spend an evening hour on the porch she did not go to his cabin alone and always managed that her fathers were present when she talked with him in her own home edwards accepted the situation understandingly and said no word but worked harder than ever neither did she spend much time with st jimmy though she went nearly every day to see mother burton the girl was very gentle with the two old prospectors and with tender thoughtfulness sought to make them feel that she was their partnership girl exactly as she had been ever since she could remember but she would not go to oracle so either bob or thad was forced to go to the store whenever it was necessary for some one to bring supplies dr burton blamed himself bitterly for the whole affair but the partners insisted that the fault was theirs you can see yourself sir said bob that if we'd raise the gal up knowing all the time what she had to know some day it couldn't never a struck her like this and thad added the god almighty truth is that me and my partner was just too darned anxious to shirk what was plain enough our duty and so shifted the responsibility on to you it was a mean low-down trick and no way fair to you and you just got to see it that way we know how you feel about not tellin her cause we're feelin that way a heap ourselves but it ain't addin none to our comfort to have you tryin to shoulder the blame what belongs to us the two old men were so miserable that st jimmy's sympathy for them lessened somewhat his own suffering and the three agreed that the only thing they could do was as bob said to blame everybody in general and nobody in particular and make it up to the girl the best they could then came that eventful day when sheriff jim burks and two of his deputies rode into the kenyatta del oro End of chapter sixteen the sheriff's visit come to think of it it's generally a healthy proposition not to know too much about your neighbors the ones that you like i mean the partners were coming from their mine to the house for the midday meal when the officers stopped at the gate howdy jim called bob with a cheerful grin he kept for his friends which one of us are you wantin now the sheriff laughed as he shook hands with the two old prospectors if you'll give our horses a feed i'll let you both off this time how about yourselves asked thad would you fight if we was to try to force you to eat a bite i'll say we would not returned one of the deputies swinging from his saddle i'm that holler that i'd ring if anybody was to kick me drawl the other i'll have to hear what the boss says before i commit myself said the sheriff how about it marta he called to the girl who stood in the doorway are you backing the offer of these two daddies of yours you know i am mr burks she returned heartily you are always welcome here i'll be ready for you in a few minutes 
while they waited martyrs called to dinner the men exchanged news of general interest and talked together as old friends will and martyr in the kitchen could hear through the open window every word as clearly as if she had been sitting with them presently the sheriff made known his mission in the canyon of gold you haven't got any strangers in the neighborhood have you he asked casually nope said bob nary a stranger echoed thad that is amended bob not that we have seen or heard of this here kenyatta del oro is a pretty big piece of country jim and mighty rough and as you know and thad and me we stick kind of close to our diggin not had she been round lately oh he drops in once in a while same as always returned bob he was here yesterday not had she would sure know if there was any one around mused the officer there's nothing stirring in these mountains that indian don't see i'm looking for a convict who escaped from the florence penitentiary he continued the last trace we had of him he was headed this way he came into tucson and managed to get a sort of an outfit together and struck out for somewhere in this general direction at the officer's words old thad rubbed his bald head meditatively bob bent over to pick up a bit of rock which he proceeded to examine with minute care the girl in the kitchen caught at the table for support and faint and trembling with white face and horror-stricken eyes stared through the open door toward the neighboring cabin then she heard thad say we sure ain't seen nothing like a convict in these parts jim when did he make his break two weeks ago answered the sheriff the color returned to the girl's face and her trembling limbs became steady but as she turned again toward the stove where the meal for her guests was cooking she glanced through the open window and stood as if turned to stone not she was moving with noiseless step toward the group of men outside then she heard bob's laugh talking about the devil sheriff suppose you take a look behind you while the officers and the partners were exchanging greetings with the indian martyr going to the door summoned the hungry men they trooped into the house and natichi declining the invitation to join them at the table on the plea that he had eaten an early dinner seated himself just inside the open doorway to continue his part in the general conversation when the sheriff had explained his mission to the indian natichi with his eyes fixed on marta's face confirmed the partner's opinion that no stranger had recently come into the canyon of gold that's good enough for me said the sheriff and then to his men we'll swing over into the tortoyita country this afternoon no use wasting any more time here we can just about make it over to dale's ranch by dark returned one of the deputies we ain't due to strike no such meal as this at dale's said the other officer mournfully dale's batchin and with one accord they all smilingly expressed their appreciation of marta's cooking and acknowledged their gratitude for her hospitality while the girl happily assured them again of the welcome that always awaited them in her home for some time following this the hard-riding officers were too busy demonstrating their approval of the dinner to engage in conversation natichi waited at last the indian spoke casually you do not always succeed in finding these escaped convicts do you sheriff this is a big stretch of country to cover and it's not so very far to the mexican line i should think that a man would have a fairly good chance they have more than a fair chance returned the sheriff but still we get most of them a man must have food and water you know if our man knows this sort of country we can nearly always figure out about what he will do he put down his knife and fork and sat back in his chair with the genial air of one who is at peace with the world it's mostly the strangers that drift in from other parts that we never get added one of the deputies you can't tell what they'll do nohow generally they lose themselves and never show up rolling a cigarette the sheriff in a reminiscent mood continued that's right there was one that got away from san quentin over in california about six months ago and we lost him clean they traced him as far as phoenix and notified me to be on the lookout because it was reasonably sure that he was heading south 
but that's the last anybody ever heard of him he may show up yet if he's not dead we always try to keep them in mind you know the indian watching murder saw the terror that came into her eyes at the sheriff's words quietly she drew away from the group and slipped into the adjoining room where she stood just inside the half-open door listening the eyes of the partners were fixed upon the officer with intense interest natichi smiled what did this man look like the sheriff answered the description sent to me says he's a man of about twenty-two or three tall rather slender gray eyes brown hair clean-shaven good-looking well-educated well-appearing likable sort of a chap haven't seen him have you natichi i might run across him somewhere some day returned the indian there was a sound in the adjoining room and the sheriff who was sitting with his back toward the door turned his head inquiringly old bob spoke quickly what was he in for jim and thad asked in the same breath a killin was it the officer gave his attention again to his hosts from where he sat the indian through the open kitchen door saw marta running toward the neighboring cabin the sheriff was answering the old prospectors he was sent up for wrecking a big investment company in los angeles you remember the papers were full of the affair at the time hugh edwards did not know that his neighbors were entertaining visitors he was at work in the creek bed when the sheriff arrived and when he went up to his cabin for his noontime lunch the partners and their guests were on the far side of the house so that he could not see them he had returned to his work and was energetically wielding his pick when he heard marta's hurried step on the bank above the girl came running and sliding down the steep path at sight of marta's face edwards dropped his pick and ran to her marta dear what is the matter what has happened in his alarm for her he forgot himself for the moment and would have taken her in his arms but her first hurried words brought him back with a shock the sheriff she cried in a voice that trembled with fear and excitement hugh edward stood as if stunned by a sudden blow staring at her belly unable to speak don't you understand she said sharply the sheriff is here why don't you speak why don't you say something she caught him by the arm and shook him the sheriff is here i tell you he is looking for a man who escaped from prison hugh edwards drew a long shuddering breath and the girl saw him in obedience to his first impulse turn and start as if to run then as suddenly he checked himself and stood looking about in fearful indecision not knowing which way to go another moment and he had regained control of himself facing her with a steadiness which revealed the real strength of his character he said coolly this is interesting i'll admit but don't you think perhaps you are a little overexcited he smiled reassuringly suppose you tell me more calmed by his strength the girl answered sheriff burks and the and two of his men are searching for a convict who escaped from the florence penitentiary two weeks ago they stopped at our house to inquire if we had seen any strangers in the canyon recently and we asked them to stay for dinner of course that did she happened in as he always does when any one from outside comes to the canyon and and while they were all eating and talking i slipped out of the front door and ran over here to tell you edwards laughed a convict escaped from florence two weeks ago well he certainly is not in the cañada del oro or natuchi would know the girl looked at him pleadingly i i am afraid natuchi does know she shuddered he it would be just like him to bring the sheriff and his men here please please won't you go for my sake won't you at this edwards looked at her searchingly go where he said at last what do you think the indian knows why should i go anywhere you you do not understand the girl faltered you must hide somewhere quick please hugh they may come any minute again edwards looked about as if while prompted to yield to her entreaty he was still undecided as to the best course to pursue but surely you know that i did not escape from florence two weeks ago he said slowly i know i know she cried but there was another another yes a man who escaped from san quentin six months ago they followed him as far as phoenix he was coming this way he was twenty-two or twenty-three years old tall slender gray eyes brown hair well educated oh hugh hugh don't stand there looking at me like that you must do something you must go quick somewhere anywhere where these men won't see you with a low cry of horror 
and despair the man leaped away running like a startled deer up the creek but before he had gone a hundred feet he stopped as suddenly as he had started and faced back toward the girl holding out his arms in an unmistakable gesture of love and longing but marta did not see she had dropped to the ground where she crouched with her face buried in her hands still holding out his arms the man went slowly toward her then again he stopped to stand for a moment irresolute as one fighting with all the strength of his will against himself and then once more he faced the other way and stooping low with head down ran as if in fear for his life when marta had recovered a little of her self-control she realized that she must not be seen near edward's cabin by the officers who by this time must have finished their dinner hurriedly she stole away down the creek thinking that if she was seen coming up the path that led from the pardoner's mine to the house no one would question as to where she had been when she had gained the top of the bank she saw her father's just outside the kitchen door deep in a heated argument there was no one else in sight catching her breath sharply the girl hurried on until she could gain an unobstructed view of the neighboring cabin there was no one there with a sob of relief she almost ran the remaining distance to the pardoners who were by now watching her expectantly as if wondering what she would do or say where are they have they gone she cried as she came up to them the two men looked at each other questioningly go ahead you old fool she's your gal ain't she said bob what's the use in your standin there lookin at me like that i ain't done nothin holy cats ejaculated thad can't a man even look at you without you goin mad I ain't a worryin none about what you've done or about what anybody's done if it comes to that it's what you're likely to do that's got me layin awake nights he turned to the girl and in a very different tone said sure they are gone jim figured that if the man they wanted was in the cañada del oro natichi would have seen him and so as long as the indian hadn't seen nobody strange in these parts they pulled out for the tortoyitas jim said to tell you good-bye and that they sure enjoyed your cooking to the utter amazement of the two old prospectors their partnership girl burst into a joyous ringing laugh and throwing her arms around each leathery wrinkled old neck in turn she kissed them and ran into the house bob looked at thad thad looked at bob together they looked toward the kitchen door through which their girl had disappeared holy cats murmured thad softly as he rubbed his bald head now what in seven states of blessedness do you make of that she must know said bob she must a heard what jim said she ain't a plum fool if she is your gal he shook his head i'd give it up listen to that will you marta busy with her after-dinner kitchen work was singing one thing is certain sure said thad softly whatever trouble the boy may have got himself into it's a dead immortal cinch that he ain't in no way different now from what he was before jim burks happened to eat dinner with us and that blamed indian began asking fool questions about what ain't none of his business that's fair enough returned bob we didn't ever take to hugh for what some judge that we never saw or heard tell of said he was or wasn't we threw it with him for what he is and if we're such a pair of bone as us to be livin with him like we have all this time without findin out more about what he really is than any judge that ever sat on a bench well we ought to be sentenced ourselves that's what i'm sayin thad rubbed his bald head at that he said mournfully it wouldn't be the first time by several that we'd ought to have been sentenced would it if young edwards was to go to prime into our records huh i'll bet he wouldn't feel proud of his neighbors no matter what he's done hisself old bob grinned cheerfully you've said it partner by smoke if he was to know the youngster would be hitting it out of this cañada del oro so fast you wouldn't see mount lemon for dust come to think of it it's generally a healthy proposition not to know too much about your neighbors the ones that you like i mean what is it the good book says where ignorance is bliss a man's a darn fool to poke around trying to find out things as for my gal it's plain to be seen that she's plum tickled at the way it's all turnin out and your gal thrilled that your gal there you go again holy cats have you got to be allus trying to gouge me out of my rights can't you never give me a fair break excuse me partner i forgot as i was about to say in my opinion you'd better let that gal of yourn work her own way out of this it's easy to see that she's in too deep for us and considerin everything considerin everything i say it might not turn out so bad after all 
to which thad replied however it looks and however it turns out my gal knows a heap more about it than us two old sad rats ever could we're bankin on the boy and we're trustin the gal and we're mindin our own business you bet to which bud responded fervently you bet End of chapter seventeen an indian's advice he felt that an indian was playing some kind of a game a game which the red man seemed rather to enjoy but which left the white man very much in the dark less than a mile up the canyon creek hugh edwards stopped it was useless he told himself to go farther he would wait there until night when under cover of the darkness he could return to his cabin and secure food in the small store of gold he had accumulated seating himself on a rock in the shade of a sycamore where he could watch and listen for any one attempting to follow his tracks he gave himself up to troubled thoughts true the sheriff had not come for him this time but the officers might while in the neighborhood learn of his presence in the canyon of gold and return to investigate suppose for instance they should meet and talk with the lizard his supply of gold would not take him far but he must go as far as he could as for his dream and marta what a fool he had been to think that he could ever find gold enough to a hand touched his shoulder with a cry he leaped to his feet and like a wild animal caught in a trap whirled to fight natichi made the peace sign the indian was smiling as he had smiled that night when marta was in his cabin the white man's nerves were on edge he glared at the indian angrily what do you mean by sneaking up on a man like that he demanded you'll get yourself killed for that trick some day natichi laughed and there was a touch of scorn in his voice as he returned not by you hugh edwards and why not by me demanded the other goaded by the indian's tone and by the slight emphasis which the red man placed on his name because said natichi coolly you are not the killing kind and because if you should in a moment of wild madness attempt such a thing i he paused then with an abrupt change in his tone and manner said i'm sorry that i startled you it was unpardonably rude i'll admit and you have every reason for being angry i did not stop to think it is nothing returned edwards it was a fool to fly up i was a fool to fly up over such a thing i i'm a bit upset just now that's all forget it he resumed his seat on the rock the indian seated himself on the ground near by edwards was thinking marta had said that natichi had come to the house while the officers were there how much of the sheriff's talk had the indian heard how much had he guessed what was he doing here almost as if to answer the white man's thoughts the indian said casually i happened to in at the partner's place a while ago and found sheriff burks and two deputies there i'm going to tucson tomorrow and dropped in to see if i could do any errand for them or for miss hillgrove then i called at your place to offer a like service but you were not at home i happened to see you sitting on the rock here as i came up the canyon the indian did not explain how before the officers were out of sight he had made his way with the noiseless speed of a fox to a point where from behind rocks and bushes he had witnessed the close of the interview between marta and edwards and how after the girl had returned to her home he had trailed the white man neither did he explain that he had had no thought of going to tucson when from the mountain side he saw sheriff burks and his men ride up to the partner's place thank you said edwards there is nothing you can do for me in tucson natiji waited several moments before he spoke again and the uncomfortable thought flashed into edward's mind that the indian seemed particularly pleased that he the white man had nothing to say edward's in an agony of suspense wondering fearing perplexed baffled dared not speak at last the indian said softly the sheriff and his men have gone away they are satisfied that the man they are looking for is not here 
i assured them that there was no stranger in the Kenyatta del oro they are gone said edwards doubtfully as if he feared the indian were playing him some cruel trick for this time natichi said gravely you you think they will come again the indian looked away and answered with odd deliberation who can say there's always that possibility any day any hour they may come but if in spite of what i told sheriff burks the man they wanted by him is in the Kenyatta del oro my advice to that man would be that he stay right where he is hugh edwards hesitated he felt that the indian was playing some kind of a game a game which the red man seemed rather to enjoy but which left the white man very much in the dark you don't think then that he that the man could get away out of this part of the country i mean he said at last the sheriff and his deputies will be watching every place but the Kenyatta del oro returned the indian because they are just now satisfied that their man is not here this is the one safe place for him and if they should by any chance return what cried edwards eagerly what if the officers should return still without looking at his companion natichi answered there are places in the Kenyatta del oro where a man if he knew these mountains as i know them could hide from all the sheriffs in arizona haltingly but with trembling eagerness hugh edwards asked the inevitable question and would you natichi help such a man under such circumstances i might at this non-committal answer hugh edwards moved in uneasily do you know he said at last i fancied sometimes that you being an indian hated all white people bitterly natichi made no reply edwards continued as one feeling his way over dangerous ground and yet you seem to enjoy the company of saint jimmy the indian rose to his feet and stood looking down upon the white man and something in his face a shadow of a cruel smile a gleam of savage light in his dark eyes something made edwards rise and draw back a step i do enjoy the company of dr burton said the red man he is suffering he is dying slowly he is in torment i am natajee the indian why should i not enjoy the company of any white man who is like your saint jimmy or who can be made to suffer in any way for a moment he paused then in a voice that made his words almost a command he added i will return from tucson in three days in the meantime if it should be necessary for you to go into the upper part of this canyon find my hut if you can and make yourself at home you will be very welcome if you should not find my place if you should get yourself lost for instance have no fear i will find you but if i were you i would not leave my cabin and my friends down yonder unless it were absolutely necessary without waiting for a reply the indian turned and climbing the steep bank of the creek with amazing ease and quickness disappeared hugh edwards went slowly back to his cabin marta who was watching saw him coming and ran joyously to meet him End of chapter eighteen on equal terms she did not know what it was that had made the man she loved a fugitive from the law she did not care she was glad glad because now her dream of happiness with him was possible as martyr ran to meet him hugh edwards could not but see that she was elated and happy not since that morning before the storm had she been in such a joyous mood the depression that since her meeting with the lizard had been so marked was gone she was again her own frank radiant self but edwards did not respond to the girl's happiness when she would have spoken of the sheriff and the escaped convict he coldly prevented her concealing every hint of emotion under a mask of formal politeness he repelled every advance and received her loving overtures of sympathy and loyal comradeship in silence in those months when his friendship for marta had ripened into love it had not been easy for hugh edwards to deny himself 
the happiness which the girl in her love had so innocently offered with all the strength of his will he had fought to do the thing that he knew to be right a thousand times he had told himself that to speak the words that would make her share the black shame of the fate that hung over him would be the part of a selfish coward he must protect her from himself when he had won gold enough to ensure his freedom from the life of a convict then he would tell her everything with gold enough he could escape to a foreign land and martyr when she knew his story would go with him but until he could assure himself that complete and final safety from the prison that threatened was within his reach both for his own sake and for hers he would not speak of his love and now suddenly the girl had learned a part of the truth and it had only made her love for him more evident at the same time the incident that had revealed to her his real purpose in coming to the cañada del oro had shown him that his fancied security in the canyon of gold was fancy indeed any day any hour any moment the officers might come for him the lizard the indian a chance unguarded word of the pardoners any one of a hundred things might happen to put the men of the law upon his track he must not he must not say the word that would bring upon the girl he loved the shame and misery that so surely awaited him if the sheriff should find him more than ever now he was determined to save martyr from himself but it was not easy it had been hard before martyr knew what sheriff burke's visit had revealed to her it was harder now if only he could find the gold but nothing could dampen the girl's spirit she was as sure of hugh edward's love as if he had spoken when she had believed that her own nameless unquestionable birth was the reason for his refusal to declare his love she had been miserable but now that his own disgrace had been revealed she felt that the shame of her unknown parentage need be no longer a barrier between them she did not know what it was that had made the man she loved a fugitive from the law she did not care she was glad glad because now her dream of happiness with him was possible she saw now that the thing which had kept him from telling his love was not her lack of an honourable name but the dishonour of his own he had been shielding her from himself his silence had not been to save himself from the shame that she might bring to him but rather to save her from the shame that was already his and which an avowal of his love would have led her to share and so she tried in every way to win through the guard he had set against her and to restore the dear comradeship which had been broken first by the lizard and now through the visit of sheriff burke's with every wile of her womanhood with every art of her sex with all the frankness of her unspoiled nature she offered herself secure in the confidence of his love she tempted him to break the silence which he had with such fortitude imposed upon himself and while her loving generous heart was wrung with pity for his suffering she gloried in the strength that enabled him to endure against her and rejoiced in the knowledge that his self-imposed torture was for love of her when she tried to make him talk to her of his past he was silent when she told him of her own history he answered bitterly that she was fortunate in having no parents to disgrace no name to dishonour when she asserted her belief in him no matter what he was in the eyes of the law he smiled grimly and remarked that while he appreciated and was grateful for her confidence her opinion could in no way alter the hard facts of the case and every day from the first light of the morning until it was so dark that he could no longer see he toiled with desperate strength for the gold that would enable him to escape and by ensuring his freedom make it possible for him to ask marta to share his future he no longer saw the beauty and the grandeur of the mountains the flowers no longer bloomed for him he did not hear the birds that filled the canyon of gold with music he did not now glory in the vigorous freshness of the morning he no longer knew the peace of the restful nights his every thought was of gold 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 because gold to him meant marta as so many men in the canyon of gold had whispered in the night after a day of heavy fruitless toil to-morrow perhaps this man in the night whispered to himself to-morrow perhaps then came that night when hugh edwards was startled out of his dream of the golden possibilities of to-morrow by a sound at his cabin door springing to his feet he stood trembling with fear and dread had the officers come again came the sound of someone knocking lightly on the door with white lips he whispered to himself 
it's only thad or bob or marta it's not late yet but he knew that it was late he had seen the light in marta's window go out two hours ago again the knocking sounded in desperation he threw open the door it was natichi end of chapter nineteen the only chance the rabbit that is caught by the fox does not dictate to his captor silently the white man drew back the indian stepped into the cabin and softly closed the door edwards waited for his visitor to speak while the red man gazed at him with a hint of that fleeting shadowy smile of cruel pleasure and satisfaction i returned from tucson this afternoon he said at last i came back to my place another way over the mountains from the south when the sun was gone i came down here to you edwards did not know what to say he realized that natichi's visit at that hour of the night was more than a mere social call he felt that for some reason he the white man had suddenly become of more than mere passing interest to the indian recalling the indian's manner at the time of their last meeting he waited anxiously for what was to come he managed to murmur a few commonplace words of welcome natichi said gravely i have something to tell you something which i think will be of interest edwards nervously offered a chair when they were seated the indian said perhaps i should tell you that i went to tucson in your interest he smiled as he added in your interest and for my pleasure i can't see how my interests have anything to do with your pleasure returned the white man stung by the touch of mockery in the indian's tone no i suppose you can't but you will understand presently said the other as if he enjoyed the situation and would prolong the pleasure it afforded him to witness the white man's uneasy fears suppose you explain yourself and be done with it said edwards shortly you white men are all so impatient murmured natichi with taunting deliberation really you should learn a lesson of patience from the indians an indian has need to be patient he must wait and watch long and untiringly for his few opportunities and then when his opportunity at last comes he must not fail through ill-advised haste to make the most of it the white man squanders his pleasures as he squanders his wealth with reckless headlong swinish eagerness to drink his fill at one gulp he spills his cup of happiness before he has really tasted it the indian takes his pleasures with careful deliberation as he compels his enemies to bear the pain of the torture and so he enjoys in its fullness to the last drop whatever drink his gods are pleased to set before him for god's sake say what you have come to say and be done with it cried edwards the indian laughed many a white man in the old days has begged an indian to end it all quickly and have done with it but he added with triumphant insolence the rabbit that is caught by the fox does not dictate to his captor i natichi the indian in my own way will tell you donald payne what i have come to say as the indian spoke that name the man known as hugh edwards sprang to his feet with a cry natichi watched the effect of his words with cruel satisfaction when the indian's victim had gained some control of his tortured nerves and had dropped weakly into his chair again the red man said with savage irony i regret in a way that miss hillgrove is not here to listen to my story the white man with his head bowed in his hands winced it would add much to my pleasure if i could watch her enjoying it with you hugh edwards groaned as one in torment but all that in good time continued the indian i must explain now how it came about that the rabbit donald payne is under the paw of the indian fox when sheriff burks described the criminal who escaped from the california penitentiary i saw a possible opportunity that promised me natichi no little pleasure and satisfaction an opportunity for which i have been waiting 
miss hillgrove's agitation her going to you and your own action confirm my opinion as to where the convict who had so far escaped the officers was to be found but i realized that it might be well to learn more thinking it unwise to appear too interested before the sheriff i went to tucson first making sure that you would be here when i returned in the white man's city clothed properly in the white man's costume with careful white man's manners i was permitted to search the files of the white man's newspapers and thanks to my white education to read the shameful account of this escaped convict's crime i learned how donald payne a promising young business man and a graduate of the california university had held an important position of trust in a certain investment company this company had been specifically planned and organized to attract the savings of small investors its appeal was to the better class of workmen who out of their meagre earnings were ambitious to put by something for the better education of their children widows with a little life insurance money upon the income of which they must exist school teachers who must save against that dread day when they could no longer work stenographers clerks and that class of poor whose education and taste were above their earnings and in whose hearts hope was kept alive by the promise of safe and honest returns from their hard saved pennies every dollar in that institution of trust represented honest human effort and worthy ambition and heroic self-sacrifice oh it was a white man's enterprise born of a white man's devilish cunning and carried out with a white man's remorseless cruelty to its damnable end when the people's confidence had been won and they had been persuaded to place enough of their savings in the hands of these spoilers to make it worth while the company failed the investors lost everything the promoters the principals of the company gained everything but donald payne the brilliant young financial genius whose manipulation brought about the wreck went to san quentin prison he had served eighteen months of his sentence when he escaped his mother a widow broken-hearted over the shame and dishonor scorned and ostracized by her neighbors and friends humiliated by the cruel publicity died in less than a month after her son was pronounced guilty donald payne is without doubt the most hated the most despised name in this decade the man who during the indian's deliberate recital had sat cowering in his chair raised his haggard face his eyes were dull with anguish his lips were drawn and white but in spite of his ghastly appearance there was a strange air of dignity in his manner as he said hoarsely and is that all you know the indian waited a little as if to give the greatest possible significance to his answer then no not quite all i know that this escaped convict donald payne has learned to love a woman and i know that this woman loves this man who is hiding from the officers who would send him back to prison yes said the white man hoarsely that is true if it is any satisfaction to you i confess my love for marta hillgrove i have every reason to believe in her love for me and i dare not for her sake tell her of my love he rose to his feet and stood before the indian with a dignity and strength that won a gleam of admiration from the dark eyes of his tormentor and in a voice ringing with passionate earnestness cried but listen you damned red savage you do not yet know all the truth donald payne was never guilty of the crime for which he was sentenced i was an innocent tool in the hands of the real criminal it was a part of his plan from the first that some one should be offered a sacrifice to satisfy the public he schemed far ahead to prove some one guilty and thus secure himself i was chosen for that end i was promoted to a position of trust with my sacrifice in view it was all planned arranged and carried out the man who robbed the people and for whose crime i was sent to prison is to-day living in los angeles in safety and luxury with the wealth he acquired through the company which he promoted and wrecked the people who hate me because they believe me guilty do not know the papers that branded me with shame and heralded my disgrace to every corner of the world do not know the jury that convicted me did not know the judge did not know my mother did not know the penitentiary does not know 
the officers who would drag me back to it all do not know but i know i know i know he stood madly superbly defiant uplifted for the moment by the strength of his own asserted innocence then suddenly as a beef animal falls under the blow of the butcher's killing maul he dropped into his chair where he writhed in an agony greater than any physical suffering could have wrought the deep voice of the watching indian broke the silence good it is even better than i could have believed in my wildest dreams i never hoped to see a white man suffer such unmerited torture in time perhaps you will even come to a degree of sympathy for an indian and to understand a little his feeling toward the white race when hugh edwards was able to speak again he said with dreary hopelessness they will come for me in the morning i suppose they who the officers have you not told them natichi laughed i tell the officers what i know about you i give you up for them to take you back to the penitentiary no no you do not seem to have grasped the purpose of my efforts in your behalf i shall keep you for myself i have too much pleasure in you to permit any one to take you away from me you shall go with me and together we the two outcasts we who are outcasts because of nothing that we have done but only because someone wished by our misfortune and suffering to gain riches we shall enjoy life together as we can the note of exultation that was in his voice or some hint of a sinister purpose in his manner aroused the white man you mean that you are going to help me to escape from your white man's laws yes from me no not yet not until i am through with you explain yourself demanded the other what is it that you propose i don't understand it is this returned the indian you cannot stay here because any day to-morrow even the sheriff may come for you you cannot go from this canyon of gold because you would surely be caught unless you could leave this country and that you cannot do because you have no money you shall come with me with me you will be safe from the law no one will know where you are no one shall ever find you i natichi know these mountains as no white man can ever know them i will hide you there was something in the indian's face that made hugh edwards gaze at him in wondering silence the indian continued i will show you where you can dig more gold than ever you would find here who knows perhaps you may even find the mine with the iron door with gold enough you could make your way to safety you could even take the woman you love with you and so you shall work and dream and dream and i natichi i will help you to dream if your dream never comes true if your labor is all in vain if you never find the mine with the iron door or if while you are toiling for the gold you need the woman you love should become the wife of your friend st jimmy why that will not be my fault i will help you to dream it will be for you to find the gold that will make your dream come true if you can the indian spoke those last three words with fiendish deliberation and sinister meaning that was unmistakable hugh edwards understood you are a devil no i am natichi the indian you are a white man you would save me from prison so that you might feast your damned revengeful spirit on my suffering it is a help for you to understand exactly my purpose returned the indian what if i refuse to go with you you will not refuse why if you go with me you take your only possible chance for the future you might you know find the gold if you do not go i shall send you back to prison i will go good but you must understand you will leave here with me to-night there will be no message no hint to tell any one why you have gone or where or that you will ever come again as long as you are with me you will be as one dead to all who have ever known you but marta miss hillgrove cried the other drawing himself up with an air of a conqueror the indian answered coldly i natichi have spoken when morning came marta saw no smoke rising from the chimney of hugh edwards cabin at first she told herself with a laugh that hugh was sleeping later than usual and went happily about her own early morning work but as the hours passed and there was no sign of life about the neighbouring cabin she became uneasy by the time breakfast was over and the pardoners had gone to their work the girl was fully convinced that all was not right and went to investigate 
knocking at the cabin door she called hugh oh hugh there was no answer she went hurriedly to the top of the bank above the place where he worked he was not there running back to the cabin she knocked again hugh oh hugh what is the matter there was no sound pushing open the door she stood on the threshold the room was empty the truth forced itself upon the girl with overwhelming weight hugh edwards was gone he had not merely left his cabin for an hour or a day he had not stepped out somewhere to return again presently he was gone sometime during the night he had packed his things and had disappeared with no parting word no good-bye no promise leaving no message he had vanished the girl was stunned she argued with herself dully that she must be mistaken that it could not be so hugh her hugh would never do such a cruel cruel thing from the open doorway she looked out at the familiar scene at the canyon walls the mountain ridges and peaks her home nothing was changed she turned again to the empty silent room hugh was gone but there must be something some word to tell her to explain carefully with slow leaden movements she searched every corner of the bare room she looked in the cupboard under the bunk in every crevice of the walls she even searched with a stick among the dead ashes in the fireplace there was nothing she did not cry out the hurt was too deep she sat on the threshold of the empty cabin and tried to make it all seem real it was two hours later when saint jimmy found her sitting there End of chapter twenty the way of a red man the dark clouds of the white man's lust for gold have hidden all the stars in the red man's sky the weeks of the little spring passed the blossoms vanished from mountain and foothill and mesa and desert the air grew crisp with the tang of frost on the higher elevations the cold winds moaned through the junipers and cedars wailed among the peaks and shrieked about the cliffs and crags again on mount lemon the snow gleamed white and cold among the sombre pines in the wild remote region of the upper kenyatta del oro the man known to his friends in the canyon of gold as hugh edwards lived with his captor natichi the indian the white man was not a prisoner of force rather was he a captive of circumstance but captive and prisoner he was none the less he was held by the red man's threat to reveal his real name and identity as the convict who had escaped from san quentin together with that hope so cunningly offered by the indian the hope of finding the gold that would bring him freedom and the woman he loved every day the white man toiled with pick and shovel in the hidden gulch where the indian had shown to him a little gold in the sand and gravel every night before the fire in the indian's hut he brooded over his memories dreamed dreams of freedom and love or sat despondent with the meagre returns of his day's labor and always the indian held out to him the possibilities of to-morrow to-morrow he might at one stroke of his pick open a golden vein of such magnitude that the realization of all his dreams would be assured to-morrow to-morrow his small hoard of gold increased so slowly that unless he should strike a rich pocket it would be years before he could accumulate enough to win his freedom and his happiness but gold was his only hope and every day he found enough to justify the belief that all he needed was near to his hand if only he could find it he was held by that chain of to-morrows in the meantime what of marta would her love endure with no explanation of his sudden disappearance with no word of love from him no promise of his return no message to bid her hope would she wait for him was her faith in him strong enough to stand under such a cruel test many times during the first weeks of his strange captivity he begged the indian for permission to send some word to the woman he loved but the red man invariably answered no with the cold warning that if he made any attempt to communicate with any one he should be returned to prison when the white man realized that his importunities only served to give the indian a cruel pleasure he ceased to plead then one evening just at dusk the red man said come my friend this will not do at all you are not nearly so entertaining as you were you need inspiration come with me he led the way to a point on the mountain ridge not far above the hut the colors of the sunset were still bright in the western sky 
and behind them the higher peaks and crags were glowing in the light but far below in the canyon of gold and over the desert beyond the deepening dusk lay like a shadowy sea look said the indian pointing into the gloomy depths do you see it down there directly under that lone bright star almost as if it were a reflection of a star only not so cold do you mean that light yes you have good eyes for a white man answered the indian i am glad i feared you might not be able to see it he paused and the other watching the tiny red point in the darkness so far below waited that light is in the home of your friends the partners and their daughter the indian's victim muttered an exclamation in fact continued natchi slowly as if to make every word effective it shines through the window of miss hillgrove's room the white man stood with his eyes fixed on that distant light as one under a spell then suddenly he whirled about cursing his tormentor for bringing him there the indian smiled as in the old days one of his savage ancestors might have smiled in triumph at a cry of pain successfully wrung from a victim of the torture then he said with stern but melancholy dignity i natichi often come here to sit on this spot from which one may look so far over the homeland of my indian fathers but for natichi there is no light in the window of love where you a white man see the light the red man sees only darkness for natichi the indian there is no soft fire of a woman's love and home and happy children where the fires of the indian's home life and love once burned there are now only cold ashes and blackened embers i shall often see you up here watching your star that is so near but for me natichi there is no star the dark clouds of the white man's lust for gold have hidden all the stars in the red man's sky in spite of his own suffering hugh edwards was moved to pity on one occasion the indian told his victim of marta's visit to his hut that night of the storm he called attention to the fact that the very chair in which hugh was sitting was the chair in which he had sat before the fire the couch upon which hugh slept was the couch upon which she had slept hugh's place at the table had been her place invariably when he saw that the white man was nearing the limit of his endurance the indian would hold before him the promise of the future the love and happiness that would be his when he should find the gold the gold that he would perhaps strike to-morrow at times the indian would be gone for two or three days always he left with no word or hint that he was going the white man would awaken in the morning to find himself alone in the hut or perhaps the indian would disappear at a moment when hugh's back was turned or again edwards upon returning from his work in the evening would find that natichi had left the place some time during his absence invariably when the red man reappeared he came in the same unexpected and unannounced manner the white man never knew when to look for him or nor where often the captive would look up from his work to find the indian only a few feet away watching him at times when natichi returned from an absence of a day or more he would tell his victim of martyr how he had seen and talked with her how she looked what she was doing painting such true and vivid pictures of the girl that the captive's heart would ache with longing then the indian watching with devilish cunning the effect of his words would assure his victim that the girl loved him but that she believed he had left her because he did not care for her and that the grief of her disappointment and loneliness was seriously affecting her health what a pity the indian would say mockingly that you cannot find the gold and then he would picture the happiness that would come to this man and woman how they would go together to a place of peace and security how in the fullness of their love and in the joys of their companionship the pain and suffering would all be forgotten if he always added you could only find the gold again the red man with fiendish skill would tell how he had seen st jimmy and martyr together he would talk of st jimmy's love for her of his tender devotion and care and of the girl's affection for her teacher he would relate how they spent hours together how in her grief marta had sought the comforting companionship of her gentle friend i fear not that she would say that if you do not find the gold soon it will be too late what a tragedy it would be for you for dr burton and for the girl if when you are able to go to her you should find her the wife of your friend but to-morrow perhaps you will find the gold every evening at sunset when he thought that the indian was away somewhere in the mountains hugh edwards would climb to that place on the ridge from which he could see that tiny point of red light so far below in the dark depth of the canyon of gold and not infrequently when the light had at last gone out he would return to the hut to learn that the red man had been watching him when under the torment of the indian's cruel art the victim would rebel natichi talked of the prison of the future of shame and horror that awaited the returned convict if he should again fall into the clutches of the law 
reminded thus that his only chance was in finding gold the man would return to his labour with exhausting energy and hugh edwards with his lack of experience in such things never once dreamed that all the gold he dug in that hidden gulch was put there by the crafty indian night after night when the white man was sleeping not to chee stole from the hut to the place where his victim toiled and there salted the sand and gravel with a small quantity of the precious metal in her home in the canyon of gold martha waited as so many women have waited while their men toiled for the yellow treasure that meant happiness she could not understand but neither could she doubt hugh edwards love she only knew that some day he would come again with st jimmy and mother burton to help her she would be patient more than ever in those days of her waiting the partner's girl depended for strength and courage and guidance upon her two friends in that little white house on the mountain side more than ever they were dear to her the partners too had faith that their neighbour would return ah and when he comes said old bob you can bet your pile he's comin with bells on we don't know what it is that he has took him away so sudden like but whatever it is it ain't nothin that we'll be ashamed of when we know and thad with characteristic fervour added well holy cats there ain't no law leastwise in this here kenyatta del oro that says a man has got to advertise every time he makes a move you're tootin the boy'll come back and he'll come with head up and steppin high that's what i'm meanin it was on one of these occasions when the indian was taunting his victim with the assurance that more gold than he needed was within his reach if only he knew where to look that the white man turned on his tormentor with a contemptuous laugh do you think that i'm fool enough to believe that you actually know of any such rich deposit near here the words seemed to have a marked effect upon the indian hugh saw with a thrill of satisfaction and not a little wonder that he had by chance broken through the red man's armour of stoical composure natchi threw up his head and held himself stiffly erect with the pride of a savage conqueror while his eyes were gleaming with intense mental excitement and his voice rang with challenging force as he said you think that i natchi am lying when i say that i know where there is gold beyond even a white man's dream of wealth i know you are lying returned hugh coldly your talk of great wealth so near when i am finding so little is pure fiction because you know that i would almost give my soul to find a reasonably rich pocket even you have invented the story of this marvellously rich deposit to torture me if i believed it were true i might under the circumstances feel worked up over it but as it is you may as well save your breath you are not worrying me in the least good said natchi the night is very dark if the white man is not a coward he will come with me go with you exclaimed the other where you shall never know where replied the indian but you shall see that i natchi do not lie from a peg in the wall he took a short rope and from the cupboard drawer a cloth and two candles one of the candles he offered to hugh with an insolent smile if you are not afraid of the ghosts that in the night and the darkness haunt the canyon of gold the amazed white man snatching the candle motioned impatiently for the indian to proceed End of chapter twenty one the lost mine the hope that brought the first white man to the kenyatta del oro is your only hope you shall labor you shall find your gold if you can from the door of the hut the indian led the way into the darkness there was no friendly moon the sky was overcast with lowering clouds that shut out the light of the stars from the thick blackness of the canyon far below the sullen murmur of the creek came up like the growl of hungry voices from the depths of some black pit the mountains seemed to breathe like gigantic monsters in a weird dream world the very air was heavy with the mystery of the night they had not gone a hundred yards before the white men lost all sense of direction as they made their way down the steep side of the mountain he could scarcely distinguish the form of the indian who was within reach of his hand presently natchi stopped and lighting the candle he carried said see there is your pick and shovel are you satisfied that this is the place where you work certainly i can see that returned the other wonderingly good returned the indian now we will go only a little way from this place he extinguished the candlelight and the inky darkness enveloped them like a blanket but he added i must first make sure of your never again going as we shall go i will blindfold you and you will follow me by holding fast to this rope 
are you willing there was a taunting sneer in his tone that would have goaded the white man into any reckless adventure as you like he said shortly when the cloth was bound securely about hugh's eyes the indian caught him by the arms and whirled him about until he was completely bewildered then he felt one end of the rope thrust into his hand come said the indian and gave a slight pull on the rope it was impossible for the white men to form any idea as to their course at times they climbed upward then again they descended as rapidly at other times they made their way along some steep slope now and then the indian bade him go on hands and knees or warned him to move with care and to hold fast to the shrubs and bushes at last hugh edwards knew that they were entering a cavern by an opening barely large enough for them to crawl through he could not even guess the dimensions of this underground chamber but he imagined that it was a passage or tunnel for as they went on he touched a wall on his right and the indian cautioned him to keep his head down for some distance they walked in this fashion then natichi stopped and the white man heard him strike a match a moment later his blindfold was removed your candle said natichi sharply and lighted it from the one he himself held the white man gazed curiously about him look cried the indian look and say if i natichi lied when i told you of the gold that is so near the place where you work if only you knew where to find it natichi the indian had not lied thousands upon thousands of dollars in gold and value lay within the circle of the candlelight hugh edwards stood amazed he could not know the full extent of the vein but a fortune of staggering proportions was within sight the farther end of the chamber was an irregular mass of rocks and earth that had quite evidently fallen and slid from above but the remaining walls and ceiling were as obviously cut by human hands the white man looked at his companion inquiringly an old mine the indian with an air of triumph answered the mine with the iron door as one half dreaming feels for something real and tangible hugh edwards said hesitatingly but why knowing this have you not made use of it why do you leave such wealth buried here you forget that i am an indian the red man answered if i natichi were to tell the secret of the mine with the iron door would the white men permit me to retain this treasure or to use it for my people when has your race ever permitted an indian to have anything that a white man wanted for himself suppose it were possible for me to take this treasure without revealing the secret of the mine of what use would its gold be to me could i an indian use such wealth without bringing upon myself and my people envy hatred and persecution from those who say that this is a white man's country and suppose i could use this gold what would an indian do with gold the things that the white man buys with gold mean nothing to an indian we do not want the white man's things we do not want your factories and railroads and ships and banks and churches we do not want your music your art your libraries and schools an indian does not want any of the things that this yellow stuff means to the white man could i with this gold restore to my people the homeland of their fathers could i destroy your cities your government your laws and all the institutions of your civilization that you have built up in this the land that you have taken by force and treachery from my people could i natichi with this gold bring back the forests you have cut down the streams you have dried up or poisoned the lands you have made desolate could i bring back the antelope the deer and all the life that the white man has destroyed stooping he caught up a piece of the quartz that was heavy with the gold it carried holding it in the light of the candle he said before the white man came this to the indians was only a pretty stone of no more value than any other bright-coloured pebble if the red man used it at all it was as an ornament of trivial significance of no real worth but to the white man this is everything it is honour and renown 
it is achievement and success it is the beginning and the end of life it is sacrifice and hardship it is luxury and want it is bloody war with its murdered millions it is government it is law it is religion it is love and it was this this bit of worthless yellow dirt that brought the first white man to the indians for gold the white adventurers braved the dangers of an unknown ocean and forced their way into an unknown land for gold they have robbed and killed the people whose homeland they invaded until to-day we are as dead grass and withered leaves in the pathway of the fire of the white man's greed we are as a handful of desert dust in the whirlwind of your civilization he threw the piece of quartz aside with a gesture of loathing and stood for a moment with his head lowered in sorrow and once again hugh edwards in spite of the cruel torture to which the indian had subjected him felt a thrill of pity for his tormentor but before the white man could find words to express his emotions natuchi suddenly lifted his head and with the cruel light of savage exultation blazing in his eyes went a step toward his startled companion do you understand now why i have brought you here do you understand my purpose in permitting you to see with your own eyes the gold of the mine with the iron door your only hope of freedom from the hell to which you have been condemned through a white man's trickery and by your white man's laws is in gold only through the possession of gold can you hope to win the woman you love and who loves you you say you would give your soul for the gold which means so much to you good i believe you i'm glad here is the gold look at it handle it dream of all that it would bring you here is freedom from your hell here is love here is happiness here is the woman you love it is all here within reach of your hand and you shall never touch one grain of it if you had a hundred souls to offer in exchange you should not touch one grain of it because you are a white man and because i am an indian i natuchi have spoken the meaning of the indian's words burned in the white man's brain slowly he looked about that treasure chamber as if summing up in his mind all that it might mean to him his nerves and muscles were tense with agony beads of sweat glistened on his forehead his face was twisted in a grimace of pain and in the agony of his torture a dreadful purpose came the watching indian saw and his sinewy hand loosed the knife in his belt as his deep voice broke the silence of the old mine no you will not try that you are unarmed i would kill you before you could strike a blow there is no hope for you there your one chance is to dig for the gold you need you might strike it rich you know who can say to-morrow another stroke of your pick the hope that brought the first white man to the cunada del oro is your only hope as so many of your race have laboured in the canyon of gold you shall labour you shall find your gold if you can the white man bowed his head natuchi went to him with the cloth to bind his eyes quietly hugh edwards submitted to the bandage the indian extinguished the light of the candle and thrust the end of the rope into his victim's unresisting hand the white man is wise to take the one chance that is his said the indian come to-morrow perhaps you will find gold through the remaining weeks of the winter hugh edwards toiled with all his strength for the grains of yellow metal that the indians secretly permitted him to find day and night the knowledge of the mine with the iron door tortured him many times he was tempted to abandon all hope and by surrendering himself to the officers of the law escape at least the torment of his strange situation but always he was held by the one chance to-morrow he might find the gold that meant freedom and martyr and love and at last one day in spring when the mountain slopes again were bright with blossoms when the gold of the buck bean shone in the glades and whispering bells were nodding in the shadows of the canyon walls when the glory of the ocotillo the flaming sword was on the foothills and our lord's candles again fit the mesas with their torches of white hugh edwards looked up from his work in the gulch to see a stranger End of chapter twenty two sonora jack but here is the amazing thing sonora jack knows more about these two old prospectors and their partnership daughter than even you know when he saw that he was discovered the man who was watching hugh edwards came leisurely forward at the same instant 
hugh thought that he glimpsed another figure farther away on the mountain side the stranger explained his presence in the neighbourhood by saying that he was hunting and had wandered farther from his camp than he had intended for nearly an hour he and edwards visited in the manner of men who meet by chance in the lonely open places then with a careless adios he went on his way down the canyon when hugh at the close of his day's work went up to the cabin natichi was not at home but when the white man had finished his supper the indian appeared coming in his usual silent unexpected way as he set about preparing his own supper natichi said you had visitors to-day hugh was too accustomed to the red man's uncanny way of knowing things to be in the least surprised at his companion's remark he answered indifferently i had a visitor there were two in the neighbourhood returned natichi i saw their tracks just before dark hugh told how only one man had talked with him but that he thought he had caught a glimpse of another that was the lizard said natichi i would know his tracks anywhere i've seen them often his right foot turns in in a peculiar way and his boot heels are always worn on the inside hugh edwards caught his breath do you think they were after you natichi finished for him i can't say yet i might be what was the man who talked with you like hugh described the stranger medium height rather heavy black hair eyes very dark a mexican or at least part mexican i would say did he ask many questions about you no more than any one would naturally ask did he show any curiosity about me no you were not mentioned he said he was hunting but he seemed to be rather interested too in prospecting and mining and asked a lot of questions about the country up here as if he had a general idea of the lay of the land but was not exactly sure natichi said no more until he had finished his supper then going to a corner of the cabin at the head of his bed he pulled up a loose board in the floor and from the hiding-place took a revolver with its holster and belt of cartridges offering the weapon to the astounded white man he said with a meaning smile i brought this for you from tucson last fall but considering everything i thought that it might be just as well for you not to have it unless some occasion should arise i'm going to leave you for a little while until i return you must keep this gun within reach of your hand every minute day and night hugh took the weapon awkwardly do you know how to use it asked natichi sharply the other laughed oh yes i know how but i couldn't hit a flock of barns you must carry it just the same returned the indian but don't do any practising keep your eyes open for any one who may be prowling around and don't let them see you if you can avoid it this stranger may be a hunter or a prospector he may be an officer he may be something else i shall know before i see you again taking his bow and quiver of arrows the indian went out into the night for two days and nights hugh edwards was alone and natichi returned when the indian had eaten with the appetite of a man who has been long hours without food he said the man who talked with you is called sonora jack he is a half-breed mexican his real name is john richards for several years this sonora jack with a band of mexicans and white outlaws operated in this section of the southwest they rustled cattle robbed trains looted banks and stores and held up everybody they chanced to run across with their headquarters somewhere south of the line it was not so easy for the united states authorities to capture them but after a particularly cold-blooded murder of a poor old couple who were travelling by wagon through the country the officers and the people were so aroused that sonora jack with a large reward on his head moved on to other less dangerous hunting grounds it is generally believed that he went south somewhere in mexico but are you sure that it was this same sonora jack that called on me the indian smiled as sure as i am that you are donald payne hugh edwards flushed as he returned coldly please don't forget that donald payne is dead that depends retorted natichi dryly the white man did not overlook the indian's meaning for a time he did not speak then he asked but what has brought this outlaw here to the cañada del oro 
nettachi's face was grave as he answered the mind with the iron door hugh edwards uttered an exclamation you mean that he has come to look for the lost mine for several minutes the indian did not reply but sat as if lost in thought then he said as one reaching a grave decision listen i will tell you exactly what i have learned it is of very great importance to us both this sonora jack with a mexican who i am quite sure is a member of his old band first appeared in the canada del oro several days ago they came in by the oracle trail and called on dr burton and his mother telling them that they were prospectors i have talked to the burtons and they do not dream of the real characters or mission of the two strangers who camped at juniper spring apparently sonora jack and his companion met the lizard for they moved down the canyon and are now living with the lizard and his people the lizard seems to be helping them with his supposed knowledge of the country sonora jack has a map crudely drawn and evidently very old under the drawing in one corner is written la mina con la puerta de fierro en la cañata del oro the mine with the door of iron in the canyon of the gold again hugh edwards uttered an exclamation of astonishment but how in the world do you know all this he demanded the indian explained in the lizard's house the table is close under one of the windows while sonora jack and his mexican and the lizard were looking at the map and trying to determine the exact location of a certain gulch that was many years ago filled by a landslide i also looked but those dogs cried the white man they were ready to eat me one night when i happened to call there you are not an indian natchez she returned calmly bows and arrows make no sound the lizard will be short of dogs until he has an opportunity to steal some new curs fine said hugh natchez continued i not only saw their map but as it happens there is a little place under the sill of that particular window where the adobe wall has crumbled away from the wood and so i could hear what was said as clearly as if i had been sitting at the table with them the lizard told them all about the indian who is commonly supposed to know the secret of the lost mine some of the things he said i rather think you would agree with he also told them a good deal about you he knows you only by the name of hugh edwards but i must say that some of the things he reported were not what you might call complimentary i imagine not returned hugh again natchez for some time seemed to be weighing some matter of greater moment than the things he had related while the white man seeing the indian so absorbed in his own thoughts waited in silence there was something else that sonora jack and his companion talked about said natchez at last something that i cannot understand then looking straight into the white man's eyes he asked slowly will you tell me all that you know about miss hillgrove and her two fathers hugh edwards drew back and his face darkened the indian saw the effect of his words and raised his hand to check the white man's angry reply i understand your thought he said calmly but i assure you i am not amusing myself at your expense it is for your interest as well as for mine that i ask believing that the indian was speaking sincerely even though for some reason of his own and prompted by his alarm at this mention of marta hugh asked am i to understand that miss hillgrove was discussed by this outlaw and his companions yes said natachi the lizard told sonora jack all that he knew and perhaps more i am asking you so that we may know how much of the lizard's story is true in a few words hugh related how the partners had found marta when the girl was little more than a baby when he had finished the indian said i knew the story in a general way and the lizard told it substantially as you have but here is the amazing thing sonora jack knows more about these two old prospectors and their partnership daughter than even you know hugh edwards was speechless with astonishment the indian continued when the lizard first mentioned miss hillgrove's name it was in connection with you and sonora jack only laughed and made a coarse jest but when the lizard went on to tell of her relationship to bob and fab the outlaw was so excited that he almost shouted he asked question after question her age 
how long she and the partners had been in the Kenyatta del oro where they came from everything and as the lizard answered the outlaw would translate to his mexican companion who was as excited as sonora jack himself and when the lizard had told him all he could the two talked together in mexican a long time i cannot repeat all that was said but sonora jack cried many times it is the same girl jose the very same jesu cristo what luck what marvellous luck one thing is certain this outlaw in some way expects to make a fortune through the old partners and their girl i do not know how but sonora jack said to the mexican that whether they found the lost mine or not their coming to the Kenyatta del oro was certain now to make them both rich is it possible asked hugh that thad and bob were one time in any way mixed up with this sonora jack i thought of that returned natchitchee and the next day i watched to see if the outlaws went to the partners they did they spent nearly two hours talking with miss hillgrove and her fathers then they went with thad and bob down to their mine leaving the girl at the house they were with the partners over an hour hugh edwards was greatly disturbed by what natchitchee had learned his first fear that the stranger who had talked with him was an officer was as nothing compared with his fear now for marta all night he pondered over the situation with scarce an hour of sleep when morning came he told the indian that he was going back to his old cabin to be near the girl prison or no prison but can't you see what a foolish move that would be asked natchitchee the partners know who you are if they have been in the past connected with sonora jack which is very possible they will turn you over to the sheriff in short order to protect both the outlaw and themselves if that should happen either through them or through any one else you certainly would be in no position to help miss hillgrove you do not even know yet that miss hillgrove is in danger sonora jack will do nothing until he has satisfied himself about the lost mine which brought him into this country at the risk of his life you can depend on that while he is searching for the mine i may be able to learn more of his interest in the partners and their girl be patient or you will spoil everything and hugh because he felt that natchitchi for the time being was his ally listened to his advice the white man did not deceive himself as to the real reason for the indian's interest in the situation nor did the red man make any pretences but even at that hugh felt that he would be better able ultimately to protect martyr if for the present he fell in with the red man's plan to learn the exact nature of sonora jack's interest in the girl all that forenoon natchitchee did not leave his cabin but after their noonday meal he followed hugh down into the gulch where for a long time he sat on a rock watching the white man at his work then he went back to the hut on the mountain side above when edwards a little before sunset climbed the steep way from the place of his labor up to the cabin the indian was gone no second glance was needed to tell the white man that the cabin had been the scene of a terrific struggle End of chapter twenty three the way of a white man he was conscious of but one thing a thing that was born of his white man's soul with a cry of dismay hugh ran to the place where he kept hidden his hoard of gold his pitifully small earnings were untouched natchez's bow and quiver of arrows without which the indian never left the cabin were in their usual place his hunting knife which was always in his belt was lying on the floor it was not difficult for hugh to guess what had happened sonora jack unable with the help of his map to find the mine with the iron door and believing that natchez knew the location of the treasure had sought the indian to force him to reveal the secret while natchez was in the gulch with edwards sonora jack and his companions had entered the cabin and waiting there had taken the indian by surprise when he returned the ground in front of the cabin was trampled by horses and the tracks of their iron shoes were clear leading away down the mountain toward the lower canyon there was no doubt in hugh's mind but that the outlaws had taken natchez away with them 
without hesitation he set out to follow the tracks as fast as he could in the failing light he was wholly without experience in such matters but the ground was soft from the winter rains and the three horses left a trail that was easy enough to follow when it became too dark to see he was a mile or two from the cabin well down on the steep slope of what he thought must be a spur of san Diego ridge he had set out to follow the outlaws upon the impulse of the moment in his excitement he had not paused to think but now when he could no longer see the tracks he was forced to stop and consider the situation with more deliberation hugh edwards realized that he was in every way but poorly equipped to meet such an emergency what he asked himself could he do if he should succeed in finding the outlaws with their captive if it had been a question of meeting sonora jack alone and barehanded he would have no reason to hesitate certainly he would not fear to face such an issue hugh edwards was far from being either a weakling or a coward but sonora jack was not alone there were two others with him and they were undoubtedly well armed while their desperate characters were clearly evidenced by their successful attack on Natichi. hugh smiled grimly and touched the weapon at his side as he recalled how he had said to Natichi, i could not hit a flock of barns after all why should he concern himself with Natichi's affairs the red man had never professed anything even approaching friendship for him for weeks the indian had held him a prisoner and with all the cruelty and cunning of his savage fathers had tortured him why not abandon him now to his fate why not return to the hut take what gold he had accumulated and make his way out of the country but as quickly as these thoughts raced through his mind hugh edwards dismissed them marta if natichi had not told him of sonora jack's interest in the old prospectors and their partnership daughter it might perhaps have been possible for him to desert the indian now but in spite of his hatred for his tormentor and in spite of the bitter revengeful purpose which he knew inspired the red man's interest in his affairs and in the woman he loved hugh needed natchez's help perhaps even now at that very moment the indian was finding through sonora jack a key to the mystery of marta hillgrove's birth and parentage at any cost he hugh edwards must find the outlaws and their captive but how he could not go to thad and bob for help natchez had made the possible connection between the old prospectors and sonora jack too clear even if he could have found his way in the night to marta's home he would not dare appeal to them st jimmy george wheeler and his cowboys it would be worse than useless for one of hugh's inexperience to attempt to find his way such a distance through such a wild country in the darkness of the night he realized hopelessly that he did not even know which way to start he decided at last that the only course possible for him was to wait with what patience he could for the morning and then to continue following the tracks of the horses he had barely reached this decision and settled down in the poor shelter of a manzanita bush to pass the long cold hours of discomfort and anxiety when he saw it some distance down the mountain from where he sat a strange glow of light it was not a campfire it was too soft too diffused it was not like the light of that window which he had watched so many lonely hours it was not so steady and it was nearer much nearer he could see the trees and bushes that fringed the top of a cliff why that was it the light was from below there was a fire at the foot of that cliff he could not see the fire itself because why of course the cliff that was lighted from below was the other side of a narrow gorge he was too far away and the walls were too steep for him to see the bottom as quickly as possible but with every care to make his movements noiseless hugh edwards stole toward the light in a few minutes that seemed hours to him he was close to the rim of the gorge lying flat on the ground he crawled with even greater caution to the edge of the precipice where through the fringe of grass and bushes he looked down the place was as he had reasoned a deep narrow canyon with sheer walls of rock the cliffs on the side where he lay were fully fifty feet from base to rim and for about a hundred years they formed a half circle giving a width to the little canyon at that point of about the same distance at one end of this natural amphitheatre where a creek came tumbling down over granite ledges and boulders a man with his arms outstretched could almost touch both walls of the hall-like passage the lower end was wider with no rocks to obstruct the entrance except for the creek which ran close to the foot of the cliff opposite the semicircular side where hugh lay the floor was smooth and level with a number of mesquite trees and several 
giant cottonwoods it was in the more open centre of this arena that hugh edwards saw a thing that made him catch his breath with a shuddering gasp while his heart pounded and his hand went to the gun on his hip on a large altar-shaped rock that had been dislodged from the walls above by some force of nature natachi lay bound the indian was on his back with his arms and legs drawn down and tied securely to the rock so that save for his head he was held immovable but with no rope across his body sonora jack stood beside the rock giving directions to his companions the lizard and the mexican who were looking after the fire nearer the entrance to the amphitheatre were three saddle horses on the opposite side of the open space about the rock and beyond the fire the men had placed their rifles against the trunk of a cottonwood the eyes of the man on the rim of the canyon wall had barely noted these details when sonora jack turned from his companions by the fire to natachi well he said and every word carried distinctly to the man above how about it indio you got something to say yet natachi did not speak you not want to tell eh all right you're some bravo indio but you goin to beg me to let you talk fore i get through with you i got nothing against you but you know where that mine with the iron door is and sure as fire is hot you're goin to lead me to it i don't come all the way up here from mexico city just for nothing you show me the old mine and you can put in the rest of your years growin old nice and easy if you don't he paused significantly then called to his two helpers put plenty mesquite on the fire boys we want plenty good red coals this indio here needs a little warmin up i think bending over his victim he said again well how about it you goin to come through save for the glittering light in the dark eyes of the red man the outlaw might have been talking to a stone image enraged by the silent strength of that opposing will sonora jack went closer to the indian's side maybe you know sabi what i'm goin to do to you maybe you think i got you here on this rock just for a bluff not much i ain't if you don't come across and show me that mine i'm goin to put bout a hatful of them red coals right here with his open hand he slapped natchez's naked chest you do what i say or i burn the red heart out of you and i ain't a hurryin the job neither you ain't the first mule-head hombre i've made loosen up hugh edwards drew back from the edge of the cliff for a single instant he was sick with horror then the blood of his race surged through his veins with tingling strength in that moment it meant nothing to him that the man bound to the rock down there was an indian it made no difference that the red man with cunning cruelty had for weeks ingeniously tortured him to gratify a savage thirst for revenge against all white people he did not at that moment even remember marta and his need of natchez's help it mattered nothing that there were three of those fiends down there and that he was alone he was conscious of but one thing a thing that was born of his white man's soul that deed of unspeakable brutality must not should not be accomplished swiftly he made his way along the rim of the canyon toward the upper end of the semicircle he felt as if he were acting in a dream or as if some spirit over which he had no control dominated him but even as he moved a plan flashed before him and he saw clearly every detail of the only part he could play with the slightest hope of success the narrow passage through which the creek entered the amphitheatre was hidden from the men by the deep shadows of the trees their rifles were on that side of the fire a short distance above the scene of the impending tragedy he found a place where he could descend half sliding half falling to the creek while the noise of the stream covered any sound from that direction a moment more and he had let himself down over the rocks and boulders around which the waters roared and stood behind the trunk of one of the giant cottonwoods not a hundred feet from the outlaw and his companions with sheer strength of will he restrained his impulse to rush forward and throw himself upon those fiends in human form as they bent over their fire he must wait he must watch for the exact moment it was not long sonora jack from the indian's side called to his companions ya tito tre la lumbre bring the fire to natachi the outlaw said one more time i ask you indio are you going to take me to the mine there was no answer the lizard and the mexican raked a quantity of live coals from the fire on to a flat rock behind the tree hugh edwards crouched in readiness the two men who were kneeling at the fire rose and started toward the indian sonora jack faced toward his victim it was the moment for which the man behind the tree was waiting with all his strength hugh edwards ran for the tree against which the three rifles were standing he reached his goal at the same instant that the men with the coals of fire arrived at the rock with a shout hugh began emptying his revolver in the general direction of the outlaws the lizard with a scream of terror ran for the horses the mexican and sonora jack under the combined shock of the fusillade of shots from the direction of their rifles 
with those accompanying yells and the lizard screaming flight leaped for the safety of their mounts the horses in their fright added to the confusion dropping his revolver and snatching two of the rifles hugh ran forward to the indian by the time sonora jack and his companions had succeeded in mounting their struggling horses he had cut the ropes that bound natchitchi and the indian and the white man from the shelter of the rock were firing into the shadowy group of plunging animals and cursing men as the outlaws disappeared in the darkness beyond the entrance to the amphitheatre natchitchi caught his rescuer by the arm quick we must get out of this light before sonora jack gets hold of himself swiftly he led the way up the creek an hour later in the indian's cabin natchitchi stood before his white companion with an expression which hugh edwards had never before seen on that dark countenance the red man spoke in the manner of his people before the winter snows came a white rabbit was caught by an indian fox the snows are gone and the rabbit has become a mountain lion why has the lion saved his enemy the fox from sonora jack's fire why stammered hugh i i really you know i couldn't do anything else i saw the light then i saw what those devils were going to do and well i simply couldn't stand for it i natchitchi the indian have no claim on you a white man i've been your enemy i am an enemy to all of your blood i've tortured you in every way i knew i would have continued to torture you that has nothing to do with it retorted hugh coldly i didn't do what i did because i thought you were my friend the indian smiled with grave dignity the live oak never drops its leaves like the cottonwood the pine never blossoms like the palo verde a coyote in the skin of a bear would still act like a coyote a deer never forgets that it is not a wolf you hugh edwards saved me your enemy from the coals of fire because you could not forget your nature because you could not forget that you are a white man i natchitchi will not forget that i am an indian with these words he bowed his head and turning went to take his bow and quiver of arrows from beside the fireplace standing in the doorway he spoke again i must go sonora jack will not come here again to-night if he should i will be near sleep in peace when i return i will have something to tell you all the following day hugh edwards watched for another visit from sonora jack and his companions and waited with no little anxiety for natachi's return but the outlaws did not come again it was a little afternoon the second day when the indian finally appeared he was driving four burros equipped with pack saddles when hugh expressed surprise at sight of the pack animals natachi offered no explanation in stolid silence the indian prepared his dinner he ate as if he had not touched food for many hours when he had finished he said simply i must sleep in two hours i will awaken then we will talk do not go away from the cabin please watch if you see anything moving on the mountain side call me he threw himself on his couch and almost instantly was sound asleep hugh edwards sitting just outside the cabin door waited a gentle wind breathed through the trees of juniper and live oak and cedar and sighed among the cliffs and crags and from below faint and far away came the murmur of the distant creek he saw the sunlight warm on the green of the cottonwoods and willows in the canyon of gold he watched the cloud shadows drifting across the mountain slopes and ridges and looking up to the high peaks saw the sombre pines against the blue of the sky a rock wren from a boulder near by observed him with friendly eye and bobbed a cheerful greeting and a painted red start swung on a cat claw bush from somewhere on the side of the gulch where he worked came the exquisitely finished song of a grosbeak the towering cliffs behind the cabin echoed the hoarse croaking call of a raven and now and then there was a flash of black and white and a bullet-like whiz as a company of white-throated swifts shot past but no human being moved within the range of his vision as he watched he pondered the meaning of the indian's manner the red man had often remained silent for days at a time but now under the peculiar circumstances hugh felt that there was an unusual significance in natchitoches native reticence what had the indian been doing where had he been what had he learned what was the meaning of those four burrows the deep voice of the indian broke in upon his thoughts natchitoches was standing in the doorway End of chapter twenty four the ways of god listen carefully now and hear with your heart what i natchi shall say the indian spoke with that strange dignity of mingled pride and pathos that so often moved the white man to pity hugh edwards the mountain streams that are born up there among those peaks are obedient to the will of him from whose hand the snows fall from their cradles among the roots of the pines 
they start for the sea that lies many days beyond that faint blue line yonder where the earth and the sky become one nor is there any doubt but that the waters in the end reach the appointed place for which they set out but how or when no mortal can say for the creeks are forced to change their plans the clearly marked trail upon which they first set out comes to an end the waters that run with such noisy strength down the mountain's slopes sink into the desert and are lost for ever to human eyes it is so with the plans of men the will of him who sets the unknown ways by which these mountain waters shall reach the sea determines also the unknown ways that men shall go through this life even to that place where the spirit's journey ends the trail which at first is so clearly marked sinks from sight and is lost in a desert of things which no mortal can know i natichi in following the trail of my destiny have come to such a place the course which lay before me as plain as the bed of a mountain stream is changed i can no longer go the way i had planned i am an indian you have said many times that i am a devil good under certain circumstances every man is a devil change the circumstances and the devil becomes something else listen carefully now and hear with your heart what i natichi shall say sonora jack and his mexican have left the home of the lizard but the lizard has gone with them the three are camped in the foothills a few miles from the home of the pardoners and their girl they are hiding there because they do not know how many there were in the party that rescued me it was well that you made so much noise but sonora jack will not hide long when he is sure that he is not being followed by a posse he will move but he will not again attempt to find the mine with the iron door he fears to stay longer in the canyon of gold lest he be prevented from carrying out some other plan i could not learn what that other plan is i know only that it concerns marta hillgrove and the pardoners whatever sonora jack plans it is not good we must go at once that we may protect your woman you edward spoke as one who finds it hard to believe what he has heard you say that we must go that we must protect marta do you mean that you will help me to save her from whatever threatens through this sonora jack netta chi bowed his head for a moment and met the white man's eyes proudly did i not say that the trail which i natta chi was following had suddenly changed as the course of a mountain stream is lost in the desert sands when sonora jack and his companions caught me and tied me with their ropes to that rock i was as helpless as a dove in the coils of a snake do you think that i natta chi would have weakened under their torture fire sonora jack would have burned the heart out of the indian's breast but he never would have heard from the indian's lips the secret of the mine with the iron door it is not a new thing for an indian to be tortured for gold i natichi would have died as so many of my fathers have died without a word but you a white man obedient to your strange white man's nature offered your own life to save the life of natichi the indian who had for months been torturing you the trail of hatred and revenge that lay so clear before the red man is lost in the strange desert of the white man's ways i natichi cannot understand but who am i to disobey the life you save belongs to you hugh edwards i natichi am yours until i pay the debt can the heart of the white man understand the indian with an earnestness that left no doubt of his sincerity offered his hand and hugh edwards though he did not yet realize the full significance of the indian's words gladly accepted the proffered friendship saying as he grasped the indian's hand i am more than glad you feel that way about it natichi but really old man i am afraid you overrate what i did 
i can't believe yet that those fellows would have dared to go the limit with you they might have burned you pretty bad i'll grant but at the touch of the white man's hand and the hearty comradeship of his words natachi dropped his indian manner and became the natachi of the white man's schools smiling he said it is evident my friend that you do not know sonora jack and his methods i hold for your sake that if you are ever introduced to him you will kill him before he can identify you as the man who blocked his way as he thinks to the treasure which brought him from mexico at such a risk but no more of this he added we have work to do i went to see dr burton and told him everything everything except of our visit to the mine together we made a plan and he bade me assure you of martyr's love and tell you how glad he was for you then i called on the partners as the doctor and i had agreed was best they knew no more of sonora jack than every one who lives in this part of arizona knows i explained to the old prospectors and their girl why you had disappeared and how you'd been hiding with me this winter i told them of your innocence of the crime for which you are under sentence of your love for marta of your efforts to find the gold that would enable you to leave the country and take her with you i leave you to imagine the girl's happiness she would have come to you with me but i would not permit it i promised her that instead to-morrow you should go to her you edwards in a fever of longing and anxiety paced to and fro but why to-morrow he cried why not now this moment who can say what may happen while we wait natachi answered we have work to do first listen you are not safe for a day once you show yourself again the lizard has talked too much as i told you he would your disappearance set everybody to wondering then to questioning and guessing you can only save yourself a martyr by leaving the country before the sheriff learns that you are here and before sonora jack can carry out his plan whatever it is dr burton will have everything arranged to-morrow you will go but but stammered hugh i have no money there is not gold enough to buy even my own way out of the country much less to take martyr with me the indian laughed i told them you had struck the rich pocket that you have been working so hard to find bob and thad loaned me those burrows there to bring down the gold the partners will cash your gold as if they had found it in their own little mine dr burton and i planned it all he will advance money for your immediate needs until your own gold is in the bank but i tell you i have no gold you forget returned the indian calmly the mine with the iron door when it was dark natachi said come we must not lose an hour taking one of the burrows with a number of ore sacks which he had brought from the partners the indian led the way down into the gulch where he put hugh's pick on the pack saddle then tying the cloth over the white man's eyes and placing one end of the rope in his hand he went on hugh in turn leading the burrow when they arrived near the entrance to the mine they left the pack animal and went into the tunnel removing the cloth from his companion's eyes natachi said you shall remain here to dig the gold i will carry it out to the burrow and take it to the cabin i trust you not to leave this spot until i am ready to take you back as we came hugh laughed you may trust me i'll promise not to put my head out even i'll be too busy to waste any time investigating good said the indian and the two men fell to work all night long hugh edwards toiled with his pick while natachi sorted the ore selecting only the richest pieces of quartz for the sacks as fast as the sacks were filled he carried them from the mine and packed them on the burrow when they had a load the indian led the pack animal away to return later for another it was a full two hours before daybreak when natachi announced that they had taken out all that the four burrows could carry with this last load he led hugh out of the mine and back to the cabin then while the white man prepared breakfast the indian went once more to the mine to destroy every evidence of their visit and to obliterate every sign of the tracks they had made going and returning when he again appeared at the cabin the gray light of the coming day shone above the crest of the mountains with the four burrows loaded with the precious ore the two men set out for the partner's home in the lower canyon they had reached a point on san Diego ridge above the house when natachi who was leading the way stopped suddenly with a low exclamation what is the matter cried hugh 
the indian motioned for the white man to come to his side silently he pointed down at the little house on the floor of the canyon below well what is it what is the matter what do you see said hugh gazing at the familiar scene there is no one there returned the indian in a low voice no one about the house the door is closed no one at the mine no horse in the corral no smoke from the chimney and see he pointed to three buzzards that were circling about the yard in the rear of the house while they looked another huge bird joined the group and then another with a cry hugh edwards started forward but natichi caught him by the arm wait you do not know who may be watching for you to come wait quickly the indian led the burrs into a little hollow that was fringed with thick bushes where he tied them securely then showing hugh where to lie in a clump of manzanita so that he could watch the vicinity of the house below the red man disappeared in the brush for what seemed hours to him hugh edwards waited with his eyes fixed on the scene below there was no movement no sign of life about the little house the indian had disappeared as if the earth had swallowed him the company of buzzards increased until there were eight or ten now wheeling above the silent dwelling the watching man had almost reached the limit of his patience when to his amazement the front door of the house was thrown open and natichi stepped out the indian signalled his companion to come and hugh plunged with reckless haste down the steep side of the ridge the old prospector of thad grove was lying on his bed unconscious from a blow that had cut a deep gash on the side of his head natichi had found him on the floor in front of the door to martyr's room at the end of the living-room opposite the door to the girl's chamber sonora jack's mexican companion was lying on the floor severely wounded though unable to move the man was conscious and his eyes followed the indian with the look of a crippled animal at bay the body of the other partner was lying in a queer twisted heap in the yard halfway between the kitchen door and the barn marta was gone End of chapter twenty five the tragedy signs which were as clear to the indian as the words on a printed page at first when his mind was able to grasp the terrible facts of the tragedy hugh edwards nearly lost control of himself but natichi steadied him the indian assured him with such confidence the martyr was in no immediate danger that he took heart again the girl is worth too much money to sonora jack for him to harm her continued natichi he has carried her away yes but remember we know that he expects somehow to make a fortune through her you may depend upon it he will take every care to keep her safe but how can you know said hugh wondering at the certainty of the red man's words the indian answered quickly because the outlaw even in his haste was careful to take the girl's things with her he led his companion into the girl's room look this closet is nearly empty the drawers of this dresser are all pulled out and there is almost nothing left in them her toilet articles even are not here there are no blankets left on this bed i tell you there is much for you to hope for yet my friend if you can make yourself as cool and self-controlled as i know you are brave when they had returned to the room where the old prospector lay the indian after bending over the unconscious man for a moment turned again to hugh slowly he said there is no night so dark but there is a little light for those whose eyes are good always one can see the mountain peaks against the sky the mexican there will not talk and i have not yet looked about outside the house but some things are very clear this happened last night because there are still a few coals among the ashes in the kitchen stove and the clock was wound as usual sonora jack will go to mexico he does not dare remain in the united states where there is a reward out for him at the best possible time it will take him two days to reach the line he will not travel with his woman prisoner by daylight that he expects to lay up during the day is shown by his taking every particle of food he could find in the house it is not likely that he got started before midnight with the girl's clothing the bedding the provisions and his own things he must have taken a pack animal good i natichi will follow a trail like that 
as fast as a horse can run hugh edwards put his hand on the indian's arm we can get horses and men at wheeler's he said quickly it ought not to take an hour to raise a posse we can telephone the sheriff from the ranch come on he started toward the door but the calm voice of the indian checked him you forget this is no time for you to meet the sheriff no one but dr burton and his mother must know of this until you are safe out of the country i'm a fool not a chi i forgot tell me what to do for a moment the indian again bent over the unconscious man on the bed then he said we cannot leave thad like this he must have a doctor i'm going to bring the burtons while i'm away you must not leave the old man's side he might regain consciousness for a moment and you must be ready to hear anything that he can tell you and keep your eye on that mexican snake out there in the other room he is the kind that may try something desperate to keep thad from ever speaking again for the old prospector is the only one who can tell us exactly what happened here last night do you understand i do returned hugh you can trust me a moment later the indian was running up the canyon trail toward the little white house on the mountain side two hours later natichi returned with st jimmy and mother burton who were riding and carrying on their horses a supply of food while dr burton with his mother and hugh were doing all that could be done for thad and for the wounded mexican natichi with the swiftness and certainty of a well-bred hunting dog examined every foot of the ground in the vicinity of the house the barn and the corral when the indian was satisfied that he could learn nothing more he climbed swiftly up the steep side of the canyon to the spot where he and hugh had left the four burrows with their heavy loads of gold edwards was just coming from the house when natichi leading the burrows arrived at the gate together the two men took the animals with their precious burdens down into the creek bottom and across to the partner's little mine where they hurriedly buried the sacks of gold in the dump at the mouth of the tunnel and then not far from the house between two wide spreading mesquite trees where a pair of cardinals have their nest and mockingbirds love to swing and sing in the moonlight where anemone and sweet peas and evening primroses never fail to bloom the white man and the indian dug a grave there was no time to secure a coffin they dared not make any public announcement now nor wait for any formal ceremony with tender hands they wrapped the old-timer in his blankets and gently laid him in his resting place and who shall say that mother burton's simple prayer was not as potent before that one who judges not by pomp and ceremony as any ritual ordained by church or creed and who shall say that the old prospector himself would not have wished it to be done just that way as st jimmy said gently after all it is not the first time that bob has slept on the ground while mrs burton was preparing a hurried dinner natichi told hugh and st jimmy the story of the tragedy as he had read it from the tracts about the premises signs which were as clear to the indian as the words on a printed page there were three of them said natichi they came from down the canyon it was after everybody in the house was sleeping because sonora jack would not start from where he was hiding in his camp until after dark the third man was the lizard they left their horses and a pack mule at the gate the marks of the lizard's feet where he dismounted are very clear jack and the mexican went to the corner of the house there at the back they crouched close to the ground against the wall so they would not be seen easily in the dark and waited while the lizard went to the barn and frightened the pinto so that the noise would waken the partners and cause one of them to come out to see what was the matter with the horse bob came out by the kitchen door and started for the barn he did not see the men who were behind the corner of the house when the old prospector was halfway to the barn jack and the mexican ran upon him from behind bob fought them but he had no chance perhaps he called a fad i think not however from what happened in the house either jack or the mexican killed him with a knife because the lizard would not have had time to come from the barn then the lizard went to stand guard at the front of the house to prevent marta from escaping by that door and to give warning in case any one should come his tracks are there by the porch the two outlaws went into the house by the kitchen door thad probably had also been awakened by the noise at the barn and while waiting for bob to come back must have heard jack and the mexican he was trying to prevent them from entering martyr's room 
when he shot the mexican and sonora jack struck him down the lizard i think is with jack and the girl he seems to have turned his own horse loose and taken the mexicans marta is riding her pinto they have taken the pack mule as natchee finished mrs burton called them to dinner while they were eating the indian asked the doctor about thad's condition i cannot say yet as to his complete recovery returned st jimmy but i feel reasonably sure that he will pull through all right i am quite certain that he will regain consciousness for a time at least but the mexican has no chance he will live for several days perhaps but the end is certain good said natchee you and mrs burton will stay here until edwards and i return will you indeed we will return mother burton quickly good said the indian again we should be back the morning of the fourth day he looked at dr burton inquiringly we will save time getting started if we take your horses the partner's horses are out on the range somewhere and to go to wheeler's for help would mean the sheriff they are yours take them of course said dr burton and his mother in a breath we will take a little food for to-night and to-morrow continued the indian and a canteen of water with a little grain for the horses and the partner's guns that will be all except he smiled grimly my bow and arrows End of chapter twenty six on the trail what madness to think that natichi could ever find them in that seemingly infinite space the trail left by sonora jack led edwards and natichi down the creek and out of the canyon by the old road but a mile or two beyond the crossing the outlaw had left the road for a course more to the west through the foothills and here in the soft ground where there were no other tracks the marks of the horse's iron-shod feet were very clear even to the white man but when edwards would have urged his mount forward the indian checked him there are many miles of desert ahead of us my friend said natchee i must not permit your impatience to rob us of our horses before our journey is half finished reluctantly edwards restrained himself and the indian riding a little in advance set the pace they had not gone far when natchee pulled up his horse and springing from his saddle held up his hand for his companion to stop what is it asked edwards what is the matter the indian who was moving here and there as he studied the ground did not answer until he was apparently satisfied with his examination of the tracks as he came back to his waiting horse he said they stopped here and the men dismounted to tighten the cinches i was right about the lizard those tracks there are his and there are the tracks of his horse sonora jack and his horse are over there when the men had attended to their saddles the lizard went to look after the pack mule over there while jack went to the horse that stood there which must have been the pinto now that we have identified the horses with their riders we can follow the movements of each in case they should separate unless of course they should change horses again the indian was in his saddle and they went on at times they rode at a fast walk again their sturdy mounts put mile after mile behind them with the easy swinging lope of the cow horse occasionally natichi reined in his mount and bending low from the saddle studied the trail carefully but he never hesitated for more than a moment or two at first after leaving the old road the trail led them straight west but just before they crossed the bank head highway they turned a little to the south so as to pass the southern end of the tortoyita range and here in the harder ground and among the rocks the trail became more difficult also as natchee had foreseen and the outlaw had separated his party sending the lizard with the pack mule one way while he with marta went another the indian explaining to edwards what had happened held to nuggets tracks and now as he proceeded the outlaw had taken every precaution to throw any possible pursuer off his trail choosing the hardest ground he had turned and twisted double back and forth riding over ledges of rock avoiding soft spots of ground and taking advantage of everything in his course there would be an obstacle in the way of any one attempting to follow at the same time he had moved steadily toward the west and south edwards in dismay felt that all hope of rescuing marta was lost to his eyes there was no mark to show which way they had gone but natichi smiled dismounting and giving his bridle rein to his companion the indian went ahead stooping low at times and moving slowly again running confidently at a dog-trot 
three times he caused edwards to wait while he drew a wide circle and picked up the trail at some point further on where hugh could see not the slightest mark to show that a living thing had passed that way the indian moved forward with a certainty that was to the white man almost supernatural a tiny scratch on a rock a pebble brushed from its resting place was enough to mark the way for the indian as clearly as if it were a paved street it was late in the afternoon when the trail finally drew away from the tortoyitas and again lay clearly marked in the softer ground of the desert and here presently natchez pointed out to edwards that the tracks of the lizard's horse and the pack mule had again merged in with those of the animals ridden by sonora jack and his captive the sun had set when natchez stopped his horse there was still light to see the trail but it would last but a few minutes longer for some time the indian seemed lost in contemplation of the scene slowly his eyes swept the vast reaches of desert and the mountain ranges that lay before them his companion waited at last natchez said sonora jack is going to mexico if he were not he would have gone to the north of the tortoyitas back there but mexico lies there to the south and this trail is leading almost due west what can we do cried edwards it will be dark in twenty minutes we cannot follow the trail in the night patience returned the indian and listen the ways by which one may go through these deserts and mountains are more or less fixed pointing to the southwest where the ragged skyline of the tucson range was sharp against the glowing sky he continued the outlaw would not risk going straight south on this side of those hills because that is the thickly settled valley of the santa cruz with the city of tucson to bar his way do you see through that gap in the tucson range a dome-like peak of another range beyond yes well that is babo quivari the babo quivari the coyote the rascuga and the waterman mountains are in a line north and south with the pozo Verdes at the southern end of the line extending into mexico on this side of those ranges the country is rather well covered by cattle ranches and the main road to san fernando sasabi and new mexico and there is a custom-house on the line i do not think sonora jack would go that way on the other side of that line of mountains lies the thinly settled papago indian reservation if this trail here continues its course to the west it will pass north of those waterman mountains which are at the northern end of that line of ranges which mark the eastern boundary of the reservation the vaca hills in the papago country lie just beyond they are surrounded by barren desert there are no ranches no roads there is no place in all this country more lonely and there is a little water there sonora jack could have reached the vaca hills by daybreak this morning if he spent this day there he will turn south from that point and will be making his way to-night through the papago reservation to the mexican line i have heard that his old headquarters were in mexico south of the nariz and santa rosa mountains which are on the border but if i am wrong and he went south to this side of the babo quivaras then he has gone through the tucson range by the pass of picture rocks and we will find his trail there come by midnight they were at picture rocks a narrow cut through the tucson mountains where the rock walls of the pass are covered with the strange picture writings of a prehistoric people at places the winding passageway is scarcely wider than the tracks of a wagon so that it was not difficult for the indian by the light of an improvised torch to assure himself that sonora jack had not gone that way with his customary exclamation good the indian swung into his saddle and leaving the tucson mountains behind pushed out into the desert with the sureness of a sailor steering toward a harbor light and now through the darkness of the night he set a pace that taxed the endurance of the horses the white men followed blindly before they were out of the pass hugh had lost all sense of direction in the desert the darkness seemed to close in about them like a wall the shadowy form of the indian the ghostly shapes of the desert vegetation and the weird emptiness of those wide houseless spaces gave him a feeling of unreality vainly he strained his eyes to glimpse a light there was no light save for the soft thud of the horse's feet the squeaking of the saddle leathers and the jingle of the bridle chains there was no sound he felt that it must all be a dream from which presently he would awake and somewhere under those same cold stars that looked down with such indifference marta too was riding riding where was the outlaw leading her and to what end where was she at that moment 
what madness to think that natchez could ever find them in that seemingly infinite space after a time which to hugh seemed an age they were again riding among the lower hills of a small desert range another half hour natchez stopped slipping to the ground and giving his bridle rein to edwards he said we are at the northern end of the waterman range if they went to the vaca hills they came this way we will pick up their trail at daylight there is water not far from here wait until i return as noiseless as a shadow the indian disappeared hugh edwards peering into the darkness tried to guess which way the indian had gone he listened on every side the mysteries of the desert night drew close the shadowy bulk of the hills against the stars assumed the shapes of gigantic and awful creatures of some other world the smell of the desert the low sigh of a passing breath of air the stillness the feel of the wide empty spaces touched him with a strange dread the wild weird call of a coyote startled him faint and far away the call was answered the lonesome cry of an owl was followed by the soft swish of unseen wings suddenly as if he had risen from the ground natchez again stood at his horse's shoulder it is all right said the indian as he mounted there is no one at the water-hole we will camp there until daylight after watering their horses and giving them a feed of grain the two men ate a cold lunch and lay down to rest until the morning natchez slept but his white companion lay with wide-open eyes waiting for the light with the first touch of grey in the sky behind the distant cavalinas the indian awoke by the time there was light enough to see they were in the saddle they had not gone far when natchez reined his horse toward the west and pointing to the ground said they went here see and yonder are the vaca hills they were nearing the group of low hills that on every side is surrounded by unbroken desert when natchez with a low exclamation suddenly stopped and standing in his stirrups gazed intently ahead what is it asked hugh trying in vain to see what it was that had attracted the red man's attention a horse as he spoke the indian slipped from his saddle and motioned the white man to dismount leading the animals behind a large greasewood bush natchez said to his companion stay here with the horses and watch before hugh could answer the indian had slipped away through the grey-green desert vegetation half hour passed hugh edwards watched until his eyes ached from horizon to horizon there was no sign of life the desert was as still as a tomb then he saw that to g standing on one of the hills against the sky the indian was signalling hugh to come when the white man joined his companion the indian did not reply to his eager questions and hugh wondered at the red man's grim and scowling face silently natchez mounted and started his horse forward presently they rode into a low depression between the hills and natchez called hugh's attention to the water-hole and the place where the outlaw had made camp pointing out that the trail from this camping-place led south the indians said they left here as soon as it was dark last night they are now close to the border sonora jack will not camp another day on this side of the line but will push on this morning into mexico we will make much better time to-day than they could have made last night but that horse what about that horse you saw demanded hugh for a moment although he stopped natchez did not answer then as if against his will he said curtly ride to the top of that ridge there and you will see wonderingly hugh obeyed on the farther side of the ridge lay the body of the lizard not until the following day did hugh edwards understand why the red man's face was so grim and why he would not speak of the lizard's death hour after hour the indian and the white man followed the trail that led southward through the papago country natchez set the pace nor did he once stop or hesitate for the tracks of the two horses and the pack mule were clear in the soft ground and the outlaw had made no attempt to confuse possible pursuers skirting the northern end of the como bobby range and leaving indian oasis well to the east the trail avoided two small indian villages that lie at the foot of the quijotoas and then swung more to the west natchez who for three hours had not spoken pointed to a group of mountains miles ahead the santa rosa and the nariz mountains on the mexican line sonora jack is making for the headquarters of his old outlaw band as mile after mile passed in steady relentless succession and the hours went by with no relief from the monotonous pound and swing of the horse's feet hugh edwards found reason to be grateful for the past months of heavy labour that had toughened his muscles and hardened his body for this test of physical endurance the sun rode in a sky that held no relieving cloud in the wide basin 
rimmed by desert mountains where no trees grew there was not a shadow to rest his aching eyes the smell of the sweating horses and the odour of warm wet saddle leather was in every breath he drew his lips were parched and cracked his eyes smarted his skin was grimy with dust his clothing damp and sticky with perspiration he felt that he had been riding for ages he grimly set his will to ride on and on and on it was late in the afternoon when natchitoche turned aside from the trail and rode toward a little desert hill near by when edwards following asked the reason natchitoche answered we are not far from the border sonora jack must have friends in this neighborhood or he would not have come so far west before crossing into mexico dismounting the two men climbed to the top of the hill and from that elevation scanned the surrounding country when natchitoche was satisfied they returned to their horses and rode on but now the indian held to the trail only at the intervals necessary to assure himself of the general bearing of the outlaw's course at every opportunity he ascended some high point from which he could survey the country into which the trail was leading them after two hours of this they were rewarded by the sight of a small adobe house and corral a mile perhaps from where they stood as natchitoche pointed to the place he said that is not indian the papago reservation line which follows the international boundary for so many miles turns north at the foot of the nariz hills yonder and then after a few miles turns west again to the santa rosa mountains over there that little ranch is not on the indian reservation it cannot be far from the border it looks mexican and the outlaw's trail leads directly toward it at the possibility suggested by the indian's words hugh edwards cried do you think are they is marta there natchitoche shook his head no i think the outlaw would take her into mexico but whoever lives there they are sonora jack's friends or he would avoid the place then with his eyes on his white companion's face the indian said slowly don't you remember the story you told me how the old prospectors found the little girl yes said edwards not at first seeing the connection well continued natchitoche have you forgotten that thad and bob were coming in from the santa rosa mountains and that they found the child at a mexican ranch near the border hugh edwards fully aroused now was trembling with emotion he gazed at the little ranch house in the distance as if fascinated then without a word he went hurriedly down the hill to his horse natchitoche was beside him and as they mounted the indian spoke we must be careful friend it will not do to show ourselves here if i am not mistaken we will pick up the trail again beyond that ranch on the south riding into the nearest opening between the hills of the nariz range the indian again turned westward thus leaving the ranch well to the north at the western end of the range they found the outlaw's trail leading straight south into mexico when the sun went down natchitoche and edwards lying in the greasewood and mesquite on top of a low ridge a few miles south of the international boundary line looked down upon the buildings and corrals of a mexican ranch the nearest corral was not more than a quarter of a mile distant the fence of a small pasture which lay between them and the corrals was less than a hundred yards away in this pasture within a storm's throw of where the white man and the indian lay the pinto horse nugget was feeding quietly with another horse and a mule End of chapter 27 The Outlaws In reality, the ranch was a general meeting place or station for cattle rustlers, smugglers, and their kind from both sides of the border. All through these lonely months following the disappearance of Hugh Edwards, marta hillgrove had lived in the firm conviction that the man she loved would come again she had nothing to justify her belief she could not understand why if he loved her he had left no message no word of hope but her woman instinct had persistently swept aside all the opposing facts and held her to the truth which her heart knew she was so sure of hugh edward's love that nothing could shake her faith in him or cause her to doubt that he would come again to claim her with st jimmy's help she had endured the long days when there had been no word from the man to whom she had given without reserve the wealth of her first woman love 
marta never dreamed what it cost st jimmy to help her she would never know many many times st jimmy had told himself that the girl must never know how hard it was for him to help her through those weeks of her waiting for hugh edwards then at last natichee had come with the explanation of hugh's silence the story of the hunted man's innocence of the crime for which he had been imprisoned together with the promises of the freedom and happiness that was now through the gold her lover had found so near at hand for them both every moment of that day her heart had sung to-morrow he was coming to-morrow he is coming the hours were filled with rosy visions of the days that were now so near when she would be with him with no fear of another separation again and again she assured herself that it was all true that it was not another of her dreams hugh had found the gold that meant freedom for him and happiness for them both the partners when they had talked with st jimmy were willing to do their part in carrying out the plan as they would have been willing to submit to any hardship to ensure the happiness of their daughter st jimmy was arranging everything to-morrow to-morrow hugh would come there had been a long talk with her two fathers that evening and when at last they had said good-night the girl had not found it easy to sleep she was too excited too thrilled with her happiness her mind was too active with thoughts of what the morning would bring she heard the noise at the barn and wondered what mischief nugget was in at the same moment she heard the partners stirring in their room and knew that they too had been disturbed by the noise that nugget was making the door of her room was open and she could hear bob muttering about the pinto as he passed through the living-room on his way out to the barn the noise at the barn ceased she waited listening for bob's return there was the sound of steps in the kitchen and someone entered the living-room thad moved in his room she caught a whispered word outside her door it was not bob what did it mean sitting up in her bed she listened suddenly all was confusion thad's voice rang out challenging the intruders there was a trampling rush of feet toward her door a tangle of straining writhing figures a spurt of fire accompanied by the deafening report of a gun a cry of pain a dull sickening blow a moaning voice hey mamma cita de me vido a dreadful silence then another voice spoke sharply in mexican followed by a groaning reply and then a man stood beside her bed telling her that she must prepare to go with him and assuring her that no harm should come to her if she was obedient and made no effort to escape dumb with terror the girl started to dress and sonora jack went back to the wounded mexican marta heard him call to the lizard to bring up the horses and the pack mule and to saddle the pinto but when the outlaw went again to the girl he found her kneeling beside thad overcome with grief lifting her to her feet sonora jack said sternly come this is no good the old man he will be all right when he wake up you do what i say and make yourself ready to ride your own horse with me or i'll finish him and pack you on a mule he drew a knife and stooped over the old prospector with a cry of martyr sprang to do his bidding in those first hours of her enforced ride in the night with so nora jack and the lizard the girl was still too bewildered and frightened to think clearly but when the outlaw ordered the lizard to take the pack mule and go one way while he with marta went another in order to confuse any possible pursuers she caught from her captors words and actions a gleam of hope hugh edwards and natichee would arrive at her home in the morning they would not be long in setting out to find her with this hope and the assurance from the outlaw's manner toward her that she was in no immediate personal danger the girl's courage returned and she was able to consider her situation with some degree of calmness she did not know that bob had been killed but certainly he had not returned after being called from the house by that noise at the barn nor had she heard his voice this together with the fact that neither sonora jack nor the lizard had mentioned the old prospector or referred to him in any way led her to believe that he was dead she could not know how seriously thad was hurt try as she might she could find no hint of the outlaw's purpose in taking her away when the lizard would have talked to her sonora jack ordered him curtly to keep his mouth shut and look after the pack mule morning came and they were in the vaca hills when sonora jack and the lizard had made camp 
and breakfast was over the outlaw ordered the girl to rest and sleep because there was a long hard ride before her and she would need all her strength then telling the lizard that he would call him later to take his turn watching for any one following on their trail sonora jack went to the top of a hill from which he could overlook the country to the east no sooner had his leader left the camp than the lizard approached martyr with a leering grin twisting his rat-like features he said you're a-ridin with me after all ain't ye the girl making no effort to hide her disgust did not answer still a feelin high and mighty be ye well you'd best be a gettin over hit you're a long way from the kenyatta del oro right now and you're a goin a heap further marta forced herself to ask calmly do you know where we are going the lizard looked back at the hill toward which the outlaw had gone i know whar sonora jack says we're a goin whether we go or not depends on you what do you mean faltered marta what do ye reckon i'm here a mixin up in this fur retorted the lizard i i'm sure i don't know oh you don't don't ye can't even make a guess hey well i'll tell you it's like this sonora jack he's a aimin to carry ye into mexico he lows he knows whar there's a fellow what'll be glad to pay an almighty fancy price for a likely lookin gal like you and he's goin to sell you once he's south of a border he can work it easy enough he's a takin good care ye cause he's got to deliver ye in first class shape once you're delivered and the other fellow has paid jack's price well i reckon you'll be made to earn your livin all right and pay right smart on your owner's investment besides the explanation of the outlaw's purpose in abducting her was so plausible that martha was stricken with horror after a moment the lizard spoke again emphasizing his words with significant care that's what jack thinks he's a goin to do jist like he thinks i'm come along to help him the girl caught the fellow's suggestion with desperate eagerness but you won't help him you you couldn't do such a thing you came to save me then as she saw the expression of the lizard's face her voice broke and she faltered that is what you mean isn't it what i mean depends on you when sonora jack wanted me to come along and help him get you into mexico i seen the chance i've been a long time waitin for it'd be plumb easy to get shed of that half-breed mex anywhere this side of the line with outfit we got you and me could make it on west to yuma and california easy the girl was watching him as if she were under a spell the look in his shifty eyes the expression of his loose mouth fascinated her but he added deliberately you'll have to go as my woman with a low cry the girl hid her face no 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 you can take your choice i'll help sonora jack sell you to that fellow in mexico ere ye can go with me then the girl's overstrained nerves gave way springing to her feet she broke into wild laughter the hysterical merriment with which she received his proposal maddened the lizard beyond reason it's funny ain't it he snarled i've allus been funny to ye ye ain't never done nothin but laugh at me but i done made up my mind a long time ago that i'd have ye some day and now whether ye want to go with me or not he sprang forward and caught her in his arms the girl screamed a moment later the lizard was caught by a heavy hand and whirled twenty feet away as he recovered his balance and snatched at the gun on his hip sonora jack said sharply drop it the lizard with his eyes fixed on the outlaw's steady weapon raised his empty hands when sonora jack with the coolness of his long experience had disarmed his companion he turned to the girl i'm sorry for this senorita i said that with me you would be all right i don't want you should be scared like this tell me please what did this hombre say it is nothing stammered the girl you don't cry loud like that for nothing returned the outlaw you don't get scared so for nothing for some time the girl by refusing to answer or by giving evasive answers to his questions tried to keep from telling him what the lizard had proposed but sonora jack with persistent and cunning questions with adroit suggestions and bold assertions drew from her little by little the truth then the outlaw faced the cringing lizard so you think you play a game with sonora jack eh don't i tell you how the senorita is worth so much gold to me that she must be guarded with great care what am i goin to do now you're a traitor to me i know can trust you this month while i'm gone such a little way to watch the trail 
fore we get to the border there's goin to be plenty of chances for you to betray me ain't goin to be safe with you even in mexico come the senorita must not again be scared come you and me we take a little walk over there behind the that hill grasping the lizard's arm he forced the frightened creature to accompany him the terrified girl watching saw them disappear over the low ridge trembling she listened there was no sound presently she saw the outlaw coming back over the hill sonora jack was alone leisurely he approached and bowing low said gently i'm sorry senorita you got so scared it ain't goin to be so no more all night they rode and in the gray light of the early morning came to that small adobe ranch-house near the mexican border save for a half-starved dog that slunk from sight behind the house as they approached there seemed to be no life about the place but when sonora jack riding to within a few feet of the door shouted buenos dias madre the door opened and an old mexican appeared he greeted the outlaw with a cordial welcome and came forward to take the horses at the same moment an ancient crone hobbled from the house he yo mayos gracias a dios que vo viste sin novedad she cried my son thanks to god you have returned without mishap si madre sin novedad yes mother without mishap you found the mine with the door of iron no mother but i found something else that will bring much gold to me he turned toward martha and bade the girl dismount to the old man he said we must eat and go on over the line quickly feed and water the animals but do not remove the saddles then leading martha into the house he took her to a little room and told her to lie down and rest until their breakfast was ready and left her when she was alone the girl looked about with wondering interest she had felt even as they were approaching the house that there was something strangely familiar about the place she seemed to have been there before or else to have seen it all in some dream that corral the well the water trough the adobe building the hard-beaten yard the pile of mesquite wood the heap of old tin cans and rubbish surely she had seen it all before the interior of the house too was familiar in every detail the bed upon which she was lying the old rawhide bottom chairs the cracked mirror on the wall and that print of the holy family how strange it all was she was certain that once before she had been shut in that room and lying on that bed had heard those voices talking in mexican on the other side of that door in her wanderings with the old prospectors marta had picked up enough of the mexican language to understand a little of the conversation she learned that the old woman was sonora jack's mother as she listened now she gathered that they were discussing her she caught the words prospectors canato del oro and several times she heard little girl while the old woman and the man who had come in after caring for the animals exclaimed with astonishment in a flash the meaning of it all came to her she was the little girl this was the place from which the partners had taken her but try as she might she could not bring back that childhood experience with any degree of clearness it was a hazy fragment a memory she could not recall how she was first brought to that place nor what her relationship to those people had been if only hugh and natchez she would come if only they could be here now perhaps perhaps they could force these people to tell what they knew about her at breakfast the old woman and the man treated martyr with great deference again and again they assured her in mexican and broken english that she must not be frightened that she would come to no harm if she obeyed sonora jack when with sonora jack she rode away to the south they watched until she passed from sight they had ridden two or three hours when the outlaw said senorita we go and come now to the end of our ride for a little time this is mexico the line is ten miles back over them hills ahead is a rancho we go and stop there it is not so good a place as i like for you but it is best i can do for now many men are going to be there wanqueras all kinds bad hombres all the time they come and go you no want to be scared cause me i'm going to take good care of you it is best if we make like you was my wife when the girl cried out with fear and he saw the horror in her eyes he hastened to explain senorita you mistake it is only that we make believe you are my wife you sabe if i take you to that place says senorita hillgrove you go in to be in much danger i can fight them yes they know that i can fight but he shrugged his shoulders then senora richard would be safe sure nobody is going make insult to the wife of sonora jack they know for that sonora jack would sure kill the martyr would not or more literally could not agree the outlaw impatiently spurred his horse forward all right senorita we go in to see i'm going to tell that you are my wife 
i promise it is only a make-believe if you go in to tell it is not so that you are not signor richards then i can't tell what comes next in a few minutes they were at the ranch the house was a long flat-topped adobe building with several rooms opening on to a long ramada in reality the ranch was a general meeting-place or station for cattle rustlers smugglers and their kind from both sides of the border there were eight or ten men gathered in a group in front of the house as the outlaw and his prisoner arrived all of them knew sonora jack and with two or three exceptions greeted him cordially when the outlaw told them that his wife was ill from the long ride and must at once retire martyr made no protest bright as she was at the villainous company worn with the nervous strain and the physical hardship of her journey the poor girl's appearance made sonora jack's statement that she was ill more plausible a room at the end of the building was soon made ready by a moza who appeared in answer to a call from one of the men the pack mule was relieved of his burden and the things taken inside the room was rather large with two doors one opening on to the ramada in front and one connecting the apartment with another two windows supplied plenty of fresh air and the place was fairly well furnished as a bedroom evidently it was the best apartment that the establishment afforded when the mozo was gone and the door was shut sonora jack whispered you done all right senorita now you goin be safe for sure everything goin be fine you make like you too sick to get out of bed me i bring what you want to eat myself he smiled i go and tell them hombres a pretty story bout my poor senor who is so sick that i'm goin play cards with them all night we play and you will not be scared adios senorita don't you be scared rest and sleep marta threw herself on the bed and in spite of her situation fell into a deep sleep when sonora jack brought her dinner she awoke and realizing that she must keep her strength for what might come forced herself to eat then once more she slept when she was again awakened it was dark she could not guess the time a strip of light shone under the door from that next room and she could hear the men who were drinking and gambling at times their voices were raised in angry dispute or in boisterous laughter again there was only the slap slap of cards as they were thrown on the table with the accompanying thud thud of heavy hands the click of bottled necks against glasses the scuffling sound of a boot heel the jingle of a spur or the scrape of a chair on the rough floor then a drunken yell of exultation would ring out accompanied by a heavy grumbling undertone the girl trembling with fear listened and waited would sonora jack keep his promise was the incentive which led him to protect her from even himself strong enough to endure when he had become inflamed by drink slowly the terrible hours passed it must be nearly midnight the voices of the men in the next room were becoming louder more quarrelsome and reckless suddenly the frightened girl felt rather than heard that front door opening in the dim light she saw it swing slowly inch by inch she held her breath she wanted to scream but she dared not the door swung a little farther and she could see the stars through the opening then a dark form slipped into the room as soundless as a shadow noiselessly the door was closed cold with horror unable to move a muscle the girl cowered on the bed the shadowy form moved toward her it stopped then came a low whisper miss hillgrove do not be frightened be very still i natuji have come for you End of chapter twenty eight the rescue and marta gave a low cry of delight when far away to the northeast they saw the blue heights of the santa catalinas for a moment marta could not speak then in spite of herself she gave a low cry of joy which brought another whispered warning from the indian moving closer he said hugh edwards is waiting with the horses we have the pinto and your saddle but i fear you must leave everything else not all the men are in there gambling and drinking there are three in front of the house at the farther end of the ramada they are sitting with their backs toward your door so i was able to get in i dared not wait longer because from their talk they are expecting someone to come any minute then the party in the next room will break up and it will be too late for us to move we must hurry i'm ready whispered the girl you will be brave and do exactly what i say yes good come there was a burst of angry voices in the next room the indian waited until he was satisfied that the gamblers were continuing their play then leading marta to the window in the end of the building toward the west 
he slipped through and from the outside helped the girl to follow at that moment they heard the sound of feet on the hard earth floor of the ramada someone was coming toward that end of the house with his lips to the girl's ear natachi bade her lie down she obeyed instantly and the indian knife in hand crept to the corner of the building toward which the sound was approaching where he stood flattened against the wall the man who was coming along the front of the house walked leisurely to the end of the ramada and stood almost within reach of the indian's hand looking out toward the west and toward the corrals natuchi was as motionless as the wall against which he stood had the fellow gone a step farther or turned his head to look past the corner of the building he would have died that same instant presently he turned and started back toward his companions calling to them in mexican as he did so it is strange that they are so late they should have been here an hour ago in a flash natuchi was again at marta's side lifting her to her feet he whispered follow me and do as i do a hundred feet away a hollow in the uneven ground made a deeper shadow lying prone the indian crawled to the little depression the girl followed close behind for a moment they lay side by side in the hollow then the indian rose and stooping low ran for the dark mass of a mesquite tree some fifty yards farther on again marta imitated his movements good whispered the indian as she crouched breathless beside him but from here on there are too many dry sticks and things for you to stumble over and we must go swiftly before she realized his purpose he had caught her up in his arms and keeping the tree between them and the house was running swift and silent as a wolf through the brush when they were at a safe distance the indian circled to the right and so gained the shelter of the corral fence with the corral which was north of the house between them and the ramada where the three men were still sitting putting the girl down he whispered if you should make any noise now they will think it is the horses but be careful following the back fence of the corral they were soon some distance east of the house then still keeping the fences between them and the three men on the ramada natachi led the way toward a mesquite thicket in a sandy wash between two low ridges where hugh was waiting with the horses there was no time for greetings scarcely had they gained their saddles when a yell came from the house and in the light that streamed from the open door of the room where the gamblers had been carousing they could see the dark forms of the men gather in answer to the alarm clearly they heard the voice of sonora jack crying sofue la muchacha los caballos aseguir la the girl is gone the horses to follow her when the indian made no move to go but sat calmly watching the lights and listening to the voices of the outlaws as they called to one another while saddling their horses edwards said impatiently come natuchi we are losing valuable time here if we go now we will have a good start ahead of them no returned the indian that is exactly what they expect us to do and their horses are much faster and fresher than ours they think that we are making for the united states by the most direct route which is there due north between those two mountain ranges the santa rosas to the left and the nariz to the east they will not waste time trying to find our trail in the darkness but will try to outride us to the line and by scattering to cover the country so as to prevent us from crossing be patient and you will see very soon the indian's judgment was proved sound the outlaws dashed away as fast as their horses could run toward that gap in the mountains through which sonora jack had brought marta the day before when the last rider was gone and the rolling thunder of the horses feet had died away in the darkness natuchi spoke again good now we will go when the day comes we must be on the northern side of the nariz mountains and a little to the east of where edwards and i struck the hills yesterday as we start behind the outlaws we need not fear pursuit at least until daybreak 
for two or three miles the indian followed the northern course taken by the outlaws then turning aside from the broad well-travelled trail he led the way at a leisurely but steady pace to the northeast another hour and they were well into the nariz hills by daylight they were on the northern side of the range in the united states leaving their horses they climbed to a point from which they could look out over the wide plains of the papago reservation with its scattered groups of hills and small mountain ranges bounded by the mighty bulwark of the babo Waris and the coyotes on the east and by the santa rosa and gunside mountains on the west and marta gave a low cry of delight when far away to the northeast they saw the blue heights of the santa catalinas lifting boldly into the morning sky for some time the indians scanned the country at the foot of the hills where they stood there was not a living creature moving within range of his vision with a smile natichi turned to his companions and pointing to the west said sonora jack and his friends are very busy looking for us over there between these hills and the santa roses yonder thanks to you natichi the girl answered with deep feeling as if he had not heard the indian pointed more to the north and continued that smoke which you see over there is from a little ranch mexican i think toward which we trailed you and sonora jack yesterday did you stop there marta told them briefly of her experience of the old mexican woman who was evidently sonora jack's mother and of her conviction that it was from those people that the old prospectors had taken her when she was a little girl hugh edwards heard her story with many exclamations comments and questions the indian who continued to scan the country before them with ceaseless vigilance listened without a word when marta had finished her story natichi said it is time we were moving friends sonora jack will be on our trail when he has made sure that we did not take the course he thought we would take he will ride east along the mexico side of this range until he picks up our trail for he will know that we would not go into the santa rosa mountains i think he will bring with him only one or two men because he will not wish to share the profit of his venture with so many when one or two are all that he needs now that it is no longer a question of heading us off before we cross the border there would be a greater risk too with a large company in the united states he will know that there are only three of us and will plan to follow and pick us off at a safe distance when the opportunity offers or attack us to-night when he has again taken his prisoner he can easily rid himself of one or two helpers as he disposed of the lizard a quarter of a mile from where they had left their horses the low ridge beyond which lay the open country was broken by a narrow sandy wash one side of this natural gateway of these hills is an irregular cliff some twenty feet in height the indian leading the way straight to this opening passed close under the cliff and leaving the hills behind set their course straight toward the distant santa catalinas they had ridden but a short way when the indian again halted pointing to a peak in the northern end of the babo quiwaris he said to hugh that is kitt's peak if you ride toward it you will come to indian oasis there is a store there where you can water and feed your horses and purchase something to eat for yourselves i'm going back to wait for sonora jack i will overtake you later he was turning his horse to ride away when edwards cried wait a minute do you mean that you are going back to meet those outlaws sonora jack must be stopped returned the indian all right agreed hugh but sonora jack is not alone do you think i am going to ride on and leave you to face those fellows single-handed you faced three of them single-handed for me i natichi do not forget but that was different argued edwards there were several things in my favour no no natichi it won't do when you meet those fellows who are following our trail i must be there to do my little bit with you but miss hillgrove said the indian marta spoke quickly hugh is right natichi the indian yielded come then we must not delay longer or it will be too late 
swinging in a wide circle to the right natu chi led the way swiftly back to a point at the foot of the ridge a short distance east of that rocky gateway they dismounted at a spot that was well hidden and the indian directing marta to stay with the horses and telling edwards to follow ran quickly along the ridge to the top of the cliff directly above the tracks they had made when first leaving the hills when he had assured himself that there was no one in sight following their trail the indian stood before his companion and hugh knew that it was not the natuchi of the schools that was about to speak drawing himself up proudly the red man said hugh edwards listen seven days ago this stealer of women sonora jack and his companions crawled like three snakes into natuchi's hut hiding they struck when natuchi alone crossed the threshold of his home in the night they bound the indian to a rock and but for you would have put live coals from their fire on his naked breast one of the three who did that thing is dying in the canyon of gold is even now perhaps dead but i natuji did not strike him the body of another is over there in the vaca hills he did not die by the hand of the indian he had trapped sonora jack alone is left he is left for me do you understand the white man remembering the indian's face and manner when he had found the lizard's body understood slowly reluctantly he said this is your affair natuji have it your own way they had not waited long when natuji saw sonora jack and a mexican riding down through the hills the indian fitting an arrow to his bow said to his companion when i give the word stand up and cover sonora jack with your rifle with their eyes on the tracks they were following the outlaws rode swiftly toward the rocks where natuji and edwards were waiting sonora jack was a little in advance they were just past the cliff when the mexican with a cry tumbled from his saddle sonora jack pulled his horse up sharply and whirled about to see what had happened at the moment he caught sight of the arrow in the body of his fallen companion natuchi's voice rang out from the rock above with the familiar command put up your hands and looking up the outlaw saw the indian with another arrow drawn to its head and the white man with his menacing rifle while edwards covered the trapped outlaw the indian relieved their captive of his guns and ordered him to dismount then natuji motioned for edwards to lower his rifle and stood face to face with sonora jack from his position on the rocks hugh edwards looked down upon them with intense interest at last the red man spoke the snake that crawled into natuji's hut to strike when the indian was not looking is caught one of his brother snakes he left to die in the home he robbed another he killed with his own hand it is not well that even one of the three snakes that hid in natuji's hut should remain alive when sonora jack with the help of his two brother snakes had bound natuji to a rock sonora jack was very brave he was so brave that he dared even to strike the helpless indian now he shall strike the indian again if he can when the snake snore jack would have put his coals of fire on the naked breast of the indian he required the help of two others if i natuji could not alone kill a snake i would die of shame the one who frightened sonora jack and his brave friends so that they ran like rabbits into the brush is here but natuji is not bound to a rock now sonora jack need not fear the one from whom he and his brothers ran in such haste hugh edwards will not point his rifle toward the snake but i natuji will kill sonora jack boasted that with live coals of fire he would burn the heart out of natuji's breast there is no fire here but here is a knife sonora jack also has a knife let the snake who was so brave with his two brother snakes when they hid in natuji's hut and bound the indian to a rock keep his heart from the knife of the indian now if he can the two men were by no means 
unevenly matched in stature or in strength both for men whose muscles had been hardened by their active lives in the desert and the mountains both were skilled in the use of the knife as a weapon sonora jack fought with the desperate fury of a cornered animal the indian cool and calculating seemed in no haste to finish that which in his savage pride he had set himself to accomplish so swiftly did the duelists change position so closely were they locked together as they wheeled and twisted in their struggles that the white man who was trembling with tense excitement could not have used his rifle if he would at his repeated failures to touch the indian with his knife the outlaw lost more and more his self-control until he was fighting with reckless and ungoverned madness natchee weary and collected smiled grimly as he saw the fear in the straining face of his enemy then twice in quick succession the point of the indian's knife reached the outlaw's breast but with no effect edwards gasped in dismay as he saw the baffled look which came into natchee's face again the indian with all the strength of his arm drove his weapon at the outlaw's heart and again sonora jack was unharmed suddenly the indian changed his method of attack to edwards the duel seemed to become a wrestling match for a moment they struggled locked in each other's arms their limbs entwined writhing and straining then they fell and to edwards horror the indian was under the outlaw but the next instant while sonora jack was struggling to free his knife arm for a death blow the indian hugging his antagonist close forced his weapon between sonora jack's shoulders the muscles of the outlaw relaxed his body became limp natchee rolled to one side and leaped to his feet as if he had forgotten the solitary witness of the combat the indian calmly recovered his knife and stood looking down at the man who was already dead sick with horror of the thing he had been forced to witness hugh edwards called to the indian come natchee for god's sake let's get away from here the snake that crawled into natchee's hut is dead returned the indian the stealer of women will not again steal the woman hugh edwards loves hugh was already starting back to the place where they had left martyr when he noticed that the indian was not following he paused to call again aren't you coming go on returned natchee i will join you in a moment and hugh edwards from where he now stood could not see that natchee was examining the body of the outlaw to learn why the point of his knife had three times been kept from sonora jack's breast when hugh reached marta the indian was just behind him to the girl natchee said simply you can ride home in peace now there is no one to follow our trail sonora jack will never come for you again and marta asked no questions on the homeward journey natchee did not follow the course they had come but took a more direct route near indian oasis they stopped while natchee went to the store to purchase food when they camped for the night marta would let them rest only an hour or two insisting that she must push on in the excitement and dangers of that first night there had been no opportunity for hugh edwards to speak to marta of his love and now as the hours of their long trying journey passed he still did not speak there really was no need for him to speak they both knew so well the girl was so distressed by her anxiety for thad and by her grief over bob's death and so worn by her terrible experience that hugh could not bring himself to talk of the plans that meant so much to him when they were safely back in the canyon of gold and marta was rested when she had found comfort and strength in mother burton's arms then he would tell her his love and ask her to go with him to a place of freedom and happiness End of chapter twenty nine partners still every day he spent the greater part of his time under the mesquite trees with bob and in the night they would hear him going out to see as he said if his partner was all right in the cañada del oro dr burton and his mother watched beside the old prospector and the wounded mexican 
the man who had been so heartlessly abandoned by his outlaw leader did not speak but his eyes like the eyes of a wounded animal followed every movement of saint jimmy and mother burton but as the days and nights of suffering passed and he received nothing but the gentlest and most attentive care from the two good samaritans into whose hands he had fallen the expression of suspicion and fear which had at first marked his every glance gave way to a look of wondering and pathetic gratitude it was late in the afternoon of that first day following the tragedy when thad regained consciousness st jimmy who was at the bedside when the sturdy old prospector looked up at him with a smile of recognition said cheerfully good morning neighbor how are you had a good sleep there was the suggestion of a twinkle in those faded blue eyes as thad returned there ain't no need for you to pretend none with me doc i come to quite a spell back got a peek at you though first thing when you weren't lookin and i just naturally shut my eyes again quick i've been layin here figurin things out got em about figured i reckon his leathery wrinkled old face twisted into a grimace of pain and his gray lips quivered as he added they got my gal didn't they st jimmy returned gravely you must be careful not to excite yourself fed you have had a dangerous injury holy cats you don't need to think this is the first time i ever been knocked out my old head is tougher than you know you don't need to worry about me getting rattled neither i tell you i know what happened up to the time that half mex devil hit me with his gun i know they must have got her or she would have been settin right here certain sure tell me yes they took her away but hugh edwards and natichi are on their trail what time did the boys start after them about noon good enough they won't throw the engine off and him and you will be able to handle them if they ain't too many they're only two with martyr sonora jack and the lizard the lizard you say is he in on this deal too yes huh I always knowed he'd do some real meanness if he ever worked up nerve enough that made three of them then yes i got one of them didn't i yes he is lying in the other room pretty sick is he he is going to die fed uh-huh that's what i expected him to do when i took a shot at him the old prospector looked at dr burton appealingly as if there was another question which he longed yet dreaded to ask st jimmy evaded the unspoken question by asking have you guessed who that fellow john holt really is thad he certain sure ain't no decent prospector or he wouldn't be trying to carry away my gal like he's doin that's all i know he is sonora jack the outlaw natichi found it out holy cats and i wasted a shot on a measly mex when i might just as well have picked the king himself first but what do you figure he wants to carry off my gal that away for i wish we knew said st jimmy well there ain't no good trying to guess we'll know what we know when natichi and hugh comes back with her but say doc the old prospector hesitated and his gaze roamed about the room st jimmy swallowed a lump in his throat what fed where why the gnarl fingers plucked at the bedding nervously and the faded blue eyes at last met the eyes of the younger man with such pathetic fear that st jimmy's eyes filled why ain't my partner bob here where is he he didn't go with the engine and the boy no thad bob did not go with you and natichi the old prospector put out his trembling hand as if to cling to st jimmy and dr burton caught it in both his own they they didn't get my partner bob ain't cashed in st jimmy bowed his head then his mother came to the door and the doctor willingly made an excuse to leave his patient for a little when he returned an hour later and mother burton had yielded her place to him and left the room old thad smiled up at him that mother of yourn is a plum wonder sir i always suspicioned it on account of what she's done for marta but i know now that i hadn't even begun to appreciate it i reckon i'll be getting up now and i reckon you won't retorted the doctor putting out a firm hand and pushing him back on the pillow you'll stay right where you are until to-morrow morning you've already talked too much here let me fix the bandage there that will do now take this and turn your face to the wall and keep quiet the old prospector obeyed but the next morning he was out of the house before either st jimmy or his mother had left their beds when mrs burton went to call him for breakfast she found him beside the grave under the mesquite trees 
you see ma'am he explained with childish confusion i got to imagine long in the night that my pardner bob must be feelin all fired lonesome and left out like with me sleepin in the house and him out here all alone bob and me ain't never been very far apart you see for a good many years now and so i felt like he'd kind of want me round somewheres it's funny ain't it how an old desert rat like me could get fussed up that away i think maybe the bob would feel some better too if only our gal was here i'm plumb sure i would but i know she'll be back all right that engine can hang to a trail like the smell follows a skunk and the boy will be here too with both feet when it comes to getting her away from them again that half next and the lizard won't stand a show again natchez she and are you i wish they'd hurry back though yes ma'am i'm comin so long pardner i got to get my breakfast i'll be back again directly every day he spent the greater part of his time under the mesquite trees with bob and in the night they would hear him going out to see as he said if his pardner was all right it was there that marta found him the morning of her return with hugh and natchez later when mother burton had put the tired girl to bed old thad roamed contentedly about the place petting nugget and going often to the door of marta's room to listen with a smile for any sound that would tell him the girl was awake and that night he did not leave the house you see ma'am he explained to mother burton in the morning bob he's all right now that our gal is safe home again and there ain't nobody ever going to steal her no more it's a good thing the lizard is gone and that the engine done for that sonora jack cause if they hadn't a got what was comin to em i'd be obliged to take a try for them myself old as i be i couldn't ever a look bob in the face again no how if i'd a let them hombres get away with such a job as that but it's all right now it's sure all right during the forenoon of the day following marta's return the mexican at last spoke to dr burton who was dressing his patient's wound as the man spoke in his native tongue saying jimmy could not understand going to the door he called natchez when the mexican had repeated what he had said the indian interpreted his words for saint jimmy he says he thinks he's going to die and wants to know if it is so shall i tell him the truth natchez why not returned the indian coldly he may have something that he wishes to say perhaps it is something the friends of miss hillgrove should know tell him then that there is no hope for his life death is certain it may come any time now when natchez had repeated the doctor's words in the mexican tongue and the dying man had replied the indian said there is something that he wants to tell he says that you and your mother have been so kind that he will not die without speaking of the girl you both love so much i think you should call the others it may be in the nature of a confession it would be well to have them he spoke again to the mexican and the man answered si habla le a la muchacha y sus amigos natchez interpreted yes call the girl and her friends a few minutes later mother burton fad hugh edwards and marta were with st jimmy and the indian in the presence of the dying mexican End of chapter thirty the mexican's confession it was well that no one in the room save nata g and the mexican could at that moment see st jimmy's face slowly the eyes of the mexican turned from face to face of the silent group but it was upon st jimmy's face that his gaze finally rested and it was to st jimmy that he addressed himself the indian as coldly impersonal and impassive as a mechanical instrument translated he says that you dr burton are a man who lives very close to god when you are near him he can feel god god is never far from any man returned st jimmy natchez translated the doctor's words and the mexican replied in his mother tongue which the indian rendered in english he says yes sir that is true but some men keep their backs toward god and refuse to see or listen to him he says he is one who has lived with his face away from god tell him then to turn around again the indian translated st jimmy's words and received the mexican's answer he says he sees god when he looks at you that if you will remain with him when he dies he can go with his face toward god i will not leave him returned st jimmy tell him not to fear 
when he received this message from the indian the man smiled and made the sign of the cross then he spoke again and natachi translated he says to thank you and that now he will tell you all he knows about the girl you love it was well that no one in the room save natachi and the mexican could at that moment see st jimmy's face tell him that we are listening with frequent pauses to gather strength or to shape the things he would say the mexican told his story in those intervals natchez's deep voice without a trace of feeling made the message clear to the little company his name is chico alvarez he was a member of sonora jack's band of outlaws in the years when they were active here in this part of arizona about twenty years ago they held up a man and a woman who were driving in a covered wagon on the road from tucson to yuma and california the man and woman were killed there was a little girl hiding in the bottom of the wagon they did not know the baby was there when they shot the man and woman when sonora jack was searching the outfit for money and valuables he found papers and letters that told him about the little girl she was not the child of the people who were killed they had stolen her when she was a little baby from her real parents who lived in the east sonora jack saved all the papers and letters that told about the child but burned everything else in the outfit so that no one would know there had been a child with the man and woman he took the baby with him he said her parents were very rich and would pay much money to have their little girl again the officers were close after the outlaws who were escaping to their place across the border and sonora jack left the little girl with his mother who was mexican and lived with her man not jack's father on a little ranch near the border when sonora jack went back to his mother for the child after the sheriff and his men had given up trying to catch him that time he found that two prospectors had taken the little girl away sonora jack dared not come again into the united states because of the reward that was offered for him so he could not follow the prospectors and the little girl was lost to him sonora jack went south in mexico and stayed there where he was safe last year a man showed him an old spanish map of the cañada del oro and the mine with the iron door sonora jack and this man chico came to find the mine they did not find the mine but they found again the little girl whose people would pay so much money to have her back sonora jack planned to steal the girl he said they would take her into mexico and keep her until her people paid much money if it should be that her people were dead then he and chico would make from her enough money in another way to pay them for their trouble that is all the mexican closed his eyes wearily st jimmy spoke quickly ask him what became of the things that told about the little girl's parents and how she was stolen from them the indian spoke to the man and received his reply he says i do not know sonora jack he will always keep those things for himself hugh edwards cried hoarsely but the name natuchi ask him the name the dying mexican opened his eyes as the indian bending over him repeated the question he answered eso nunca me di yo sonora jack and with a look toward st jimmy sank into unconsciousness natuchi faced toward that little company of agitated listeners he says sonora jack never did tell me that mother burton led marta from the room old thad muttering to himself followed dr burton turned from the bedside saying quietly it is all over he is gone natuchi spoke you dr burton and you hugh edwards wait here for me the others will not come again into this room for a little while wait i will come back in a moment the indian left the room hugh edwards and st jimmy looked at each other in wondering silence when natuchi returned he held in his hand a flat package some six inches wide by eight inches long and about an inch in thickness the envelope was of leather laced securely and there were straps attached the straps had been cut the indian addressed hugh as i fought with sonora jack did you see that when i struck his breast my knife drew no blood yes returned edwards i saw it and wondered about it at the time but what happened immediately after made me forget now that you mention it i remember distinctly 
good when you had gone back to miss hillgrove i looked to see why my knife had refused to touch the snake's heart until i found the way between his shoulders this package was fastened to sonora jack's breast under his shirt this strap was over his shoulders to support it this other strap was around his chest to hold the packet in place look there are the marks of my knife three times i struck there and there and there the two white men exclaimed with amazement at the indian's statement i think said natchitoche slowly that you would do well to see what this thing is that the stealer of little girls hid so carefully under his clothing and fastened so securely to his body hugh edwards drew back with an appealing look at st jimmy who took the packet from the indian must this thing be opened said edwards yes hugh i think so returned the doctor gently anything else would hardly be fair to marta would it no i suppose not answered edwards with a groan all right go ahead you can tell me when you have finished he turned away and went to the window where he sat with his back towards st jimmy who seated himself at the table natchitoche stood near the door with his arms folded as motionless as a statue undoing the lacing of the leather envelope st jimmy found a number of newspaper clippings so cut as to preserve the name and date line of the paper several letters and a diary with various entries under different dates rather poorly written but legible swiftly he scanned the printed articles the diary and the letters he read with more care hugh edwards was like a man condemned already in his own mind awaiting the formality of the verdict when martyr's birth and the character of her parents had been under a cloud the man who was branded before the world a criminal had felt that their love was right and that there was no obstacle to their marriage he had reasoned indeed that their happiness would in a measure lighten the shadow that lay over the girl's life and in a degree would atone for the injustice under which he himself had suffered the unjust shame and humiliation that the girl had felt so keenly the dishonour and shame that injustice had brought upon him had been to them a common bond while the knowledge of what each had innocently suffered and the sympathy of each for the other had deepened and strengthened their love but as he listened to the dying mexican story he saw the barrier that was being raised to his happiness with the girl he loved martyr's birth and parentage were not after all what the old prospectors st jimmy and martyr herself had believed what then was left to justify him in asking her to become the wife of a convict if indeed her birth and name were without a shadow how could he ask her to accept his name dishonoured as it was and if it should be shown that her people were living if they were people of importance and honour how then could the convict who loved her ask her to share his life of dishonour when the mexican had been unable to give the name hope had again risen in edward's heart but when natchitoche brought the packet which sonora jack had treasured with such care hugh edwards knew that it was only a matter of minutes until the identity of the woman he loved would be established which meant that now he could never ask her to be his wife st jimmy finished reading the papers and carefully placed them again in the leather envelope to the watching indian he seemed undecided he had the air of one not quite sure of his hand at last looking up he said slowly you are right natchitoche this envelope completes the mexican story and establishes the identity of the girl we have always known as marta hillgrove end of chapter thirty one revelation natchitoche remembered hugh edwards rose to his feet well he said desperately let's have it st jimmy answered in an odd musing tone marta or martha for that is her name was born in a little city in southwestern missouri in the lead and zinc mining district her parents were both held in the highest esteem in the community where their families had lived for three generations about the time marta was born her father who was a real estate speculator and trader on a rather small scale purchased a tract of land from some people who could barely make a living on it the land was hilly and stony and covered mostly with scrub oak which made it almost worthless for farming and the man and his wife were glad to get the usual market price 
for such property but shortly after the same cheap farm land was developed as a very valuable mineral property about the richest in fact in that district hugh edwards interrupted wait a minute did you learn all this just now from the contents of that package no hugh the fact is i was born and grew up in that same missouri town it was the home of my people and even after i went to st louis i was in close touch with the old place these papers here merely fill in some of the missing details of a story that i have known for years i'm trying to tell it to you so that you will understand everything clearly go on please when the property they had sold proved so valuable the people who had been glad to receive the price they did for their supposedly worthless farmlands were very bitter they considered themselves swindled and being the sort they were brooded over their fancied wrongs until they formed a plan of revenge they stole the baby martha the plan of the kidnappers as it is shown here st jimmy touched the packet on the table was to hold the little girl until her father had made a fortune from the mineral lands he had purchased from them and then to force him to pay a large part of that wealth back to them as a ransom for the child the man and woman with the baby travelled west by wagon they always camped when supplies were needed the man would go alone to purchase them they rarely entered a town except to pass through and then of course took every precaution to hide the child their plan to extort money from the father led them to preserve carefully the evidence that would later prove the identity of the little girl their fears of arrest led them to conceal their own identity as carefully it was more than a year later when they reached tucson the rest of the story we have heard i should add that marta's mother died six months after the baby was stolen george clinton after his wife's death sold his mining interests and moved to california hugh edwards started forward his face was ghastly his lips trembled so that he could scarcely form the words george clinton did you say yes george willard clinton yes do you know of him hugh edwards fighting for self-control became very still turning his back on the others he walked to the window and stood looking out yes he said at last and his voice was steady now yes i know him he lives in los angeles i had heard that he was at one time interested in mines in missouri but of course i knew nothing of this story that you have told he is a very wealthy man what a splendid thing for marta exclaimed st jimmy hugh edwards left the window and went to stand beside the body of the mexican yes it will be very fine for her and suddenly as he stood looking down at the dead man hugh edwards laughed st jimmy sprang to his feet such laughter was not good to hear hugh the man whirled on him you win st jimmy congratulations he rushed madly from the room st jimmy gazed at natchez speechless with amazement what on earth did he mean by that he said at last is it possible you do not know the other shook his head natchez said slowly when everybody believed that the woman hugh edwards loved was one who had no real right to even the name she bore then he could ask her to become his wife now that the woman is the daughter of honor and wealth how can the convict expect her to go with him hugh edwards is not blind he sees it is now more fitting that the woman he loves become the wife of his friend st jimmy upon whose name there is no shadow but natchi with the cunning of his indian nature had not given st jimmy the whole truth in his explanation of hugh edwards manner natchi remembered that the man who had promoted that investment company and who had used his power as the president of the institution to rob the people of their savings and who to shield himself had sent donald payne an innocent man to prison was george willard clinton End of chapter thirty two gold he saw that the need of gold is a curse that the craving for gold is a greater curse that the possession of gold may be the greatest curse of all when hugh edwards left st jimmy and the indian he was beside himself with grief and rage he had prepared himself in a measure to lose marta 
he had told himself that his love was strong enough to endure even that test but to give her up because she proved to be the daughter of the man who by making him a convict had robbed him of the right to keep her was more than he could endure as he rushed blindly from the house that had been to him a house of refuge but was now become a house of torment marta called to him he did not stop he must get away away from them all the old prospector st jimmy natichi marta the dead mexican they had all conspired with god to sink him in a hell of conflicting love and hatred when he came to himself he was at the cabin where he had made his home during those first months of his life in the canyon of gold when he was seeking a place to hide as a wild creature wounded by the hunter seeks to hide from the dogs he had found that little cabin he had learned to feel safe there but he did not feel safe there now the empty place was crowded with memories that would drive him to some deed of madness it was there his dream of freedom and love had been born it was there that the dear comradeship of the girl had led him to believe there might still be something to hope for to work for and to live for he could not stay there now the place was no longer a place where he could hide from his enemies it was a trap a snare he must go and go quickly without consciously willing his movements indeed without realizing where he was going he climbed out of the canyon and hurried away up the mountain slopes and along the ridges in the direction of natchez's hut with no clearly defined trail to follow it is doubtful if in his normal mental state he could have found the place he certainly would not have made the attempt particularly at that time of day but some subconscious memory must have guided him for at sundown he found himself in the familiar gulch where he had toiled all through the winter for the gold that meant for him the realization of his dreams of freedom and happiness with marta when night came he was seated on that spot from which he had so often in the agony of those lonely months of hiding watched the tiny point of light in the gloom of the canyon below with his eyes fixed on that red spot which he knew was the window of marta's room hugh edwards brooded over the series of events that had ended in that hour of his dead hopes and broken dreams his thoughts went back even to those glad days when he was graduated from his university and when with a heart of honest courage and purpose he had accepted a position of trust in the institution that seemed to afford such an opportunity for service he recalled every proud step of his advancement from office to office of increasing responsibility he lived again that appalling hour when he knew that he had been promoted only that he might be betrayed again he suffered the agony of his arrest the trial with his baffled attempts to prove his innocence the hideous publicity the hatred of the people and again he heard the sentence that condemned him to years in prison and to a life of dishonour and shame once more he endured the horror of a convict's life and the death of his mother then came the terrible experiences of his escape when he was hunted as a wild beast is hunted with dogs and guns and then the canyon of gold with its promise of peace and safety its blessed work and dreams and hopes its miraculous gift of love one by one the strange events of his life in the canyon of gold passed in review before him the period when he lived in the cabin next door to the old prospectors and their partnership daughter his comradeship with marta and the sure development of their love the story of the girl's questionable parentage that had made it possible for him to think of her as his wife then the visit of the sheriff his enforced life of torment with the indian and his fruitless toil for the gold that held him with its promise of freedom and martyr again he lived over the coming of the outlaw with the sudden turn of fortune that made natichi his ally and gave him the gold from the mine with the iron door and then with the gold in his possession and all its promises almost within his grasp the tragedy and disaster that had followed until now having gained the wealth for which inspired by love he had toiled and fought he had lost the thing which gave the gold its value the thing for which he had wanted the gold had become impossible to him the light in the canyon of gold went out the hours passed and still the man held his place on that wild spot high up in the mountains and now he saw and felt the mysteries of the night saw the wide sea of darkness that engulfed the vast desert below and felt the whispering breath of the desert air saw the mighty peaks and shoulders of the mountains lifting out of the dark shadows below up and up and up into the starlit sky and felt the fragrant coolness dropping from the pines that held the snows saw the night sky filled with countless star worlds and felt the brooding presence that fixes the time of their every movement and marks their paths of gleaming light 
so the black depths of the canyon of gold and felt the ghostly multitude of the disappointed ones who had toiled day as he had toiled for the treasure he never found or finding were cursed with its possession and then as one who in a vision glimpses the underlying truth of things this man on the mountain heights above the canada del oro saw that life itself was but a canyon of gold as men through the ages had braved the dangers and endured the hardships of desert and mountains to gain the yellow wealth from the canada del oro so men braved dangers and endured hardships everywhere every dream of man was a dream of gold every effort was an effort for gold every hope was a hope for gold for gold was life and honour and power and love and happiness and gold was death and dishonour and murder and hatred and misery it was gold that had led marta's father to purchase the rich mining property from the ignorant owners for a price that was little more than nothing the victims of george clinton's shrewdness had stolen his child in the hope that by her they might regain the gold they had lost it was for gold that clinton had robbed the people who because of their need for gold had trusted him with their savings to ensure himself in the possession of gold clinton had sent donald payne to prison and condemned him to a life of dishonour gold to the escaped convict had meant at first the bare necessities of life it had come to mean everything for which a man desires to live for gold sonora jack had given himself to crime lured by the gold of the mine with the iron door he had come to the cañada del oro and had been brought finally to his death it was gold that had at last led to the revelations that brought the love of hugh edwards and martyr to naught the man saw that the story of his life in the canyon of gold with its needs its hopes its labors its fears its victories and defeats was the story of all life everywhere he saw that the need of gold is a curse that the craving for gold is a greater curse that the possession of gold may be the greatest curse of all when hugh edwards went down to the cabin he found that to see the indian waiting for him End of chapter thirty three morning the heart of a white man is a strange thing i natichi cannot understand and hugh edwards knew by the light that flashed in the indian's sombre eyes by the expression of that dark countenance and by the proud bearing of the red man that natichi had put aside the teaching of the white man's school there was something too beneath the indian's stoical composure which told hugh that he was under the strain of some great excitement gazing at edwards with a curious intentness the indian said my friend has been watching his star in the canyon of gold yes natichi i've been up on the mountain silently the indian gave him a letter it was from marta hugh handled the letter turning it over and over as if debating with himself what he should do with it open it and read said the indian then hear what i natichi shall say edwards opened the letter and read it was not a long letter but it was filled with the strongest assurances of understanding and sympathy that a woman's loving heart could pen st jimmy had told her of the completion of the story that had been left unfinished by the mexican and had explained its effect on the man she loved but it made no difference to her that she was proved to be the daughter of george clinton except that she was glad for her future husband's sake that her birth was honourable that she was not nameless as she had believed herself to be for the rest everything must go on exactly as if she were still the old prospector's partnership girl st jimmy had gone to complete the arrangements he had started to make when sonora jack carried her away there must be no change in their plans when they were safe out of the country she could communicate with her father hugh must come for her at once she would be waiting for him to-morrow morning with deliberate care hugh edwards folded the letter and returned it to the envelope the indian was watching him intently the man did not appear in any way surprised elated or disturbed one would have said that he had been expecting the letter had foreseen its contents and had already in his mind answered it his manner was that of one who having fought and lived through the crisis of a storm methodically and wearily takes up again the routine duties of his existence 
calmly with a shadowy smile that would have caused martyr to think of saint jimmy he spoke what is it that you wish to say natichi i natichi the indian can now pay the debt i owe hugh edwards you have more than paid that debt natichi the red man returned haughtily is the life of natichi of such little value that it is paid for by the death of that snake sonora jack and his companion who stopped the arrow but for you martyr would not have escaped from sonora jack and the other outlaws returned edwards but for me no one would know the woman hugh edwards loves except as the pardoner's girl hugh edwards but for natuji would be free to make her his wife indicating the letter in his hand hugh answered she says here that it need make no difference she says for me to come as if the mexican had died without speaking as if you had taken nothing from sonora jack the indian's eyes blazed with triumph good that is as i natuji wanted it to be now the way of my friend to the great desire of his heart is clear listen when you left so hurriedly after hearing the name of the girl's father dr burton wondered at your manner i told him that now when the girl was known to be the daughter of a man of wealth and honourable position you felt you could not take her for your wife that was true enough returned edwards wondering at the excitement which the indian with all his assumed composure could not hide yes but i did not tell any one that it was the girl's father who sent you my friend to prison no one but hugh edwards and natuchi knows that no one shall know until you donald payne are revenged for all that this man clinton has made you suffer when you have trapped this clinton coyote when you have made him pay for your shame your imprisonment your mother's death when he has paid for everything your heart holds against him then i not that she will have paid my debt to you hugh edwards gazed at the indian bewildered amazed wondering what on earth do you mean not do you not understand listen the girl who does not know what her father did will go with you good take her let there be a pretense of marriage then when her shame is accomplished send her to her father let george clinton who made donald payne a convict beg that convict to give his daughter a name for her children the shame that he heaped upon your name the dishonour that he compelled you to suffer you will give back to him through his daughter the white man exclaimed with horror in god's name stop is not the heart of donald payne filled with hate for the man who has filled his life with suffering yes natuchi i hate george clinton but you will not take the revenge that i natuchi have planned for you no 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 the heart of a white man is a strange thing returned the indian i natuchi cannot understand the sun was not yet above the mountains but the sky was glorious with the beauty of the new day when hugh edwards stood in the doorway of the indian's hut against a sky of liquid gold melting into the deeper blue above wreaths of flaming crimson cloud mists were flung with the careless splendour of the artist who paints with the brush of the wind and the colours of light on the canvas of the heavens the man bared his head and with face uplifted watched he felt the soft breath of the spring on his neck and caught the perfume of cedar and pine he heard the birds singing among the blossoms on the mountain side he saw the mighty peaks and crags towering high he looked down upon the foothills and mesas and afar over the desert where grey blue shadows drifted on a sea of colour into the far purple distance a squirrel in a live oak near by chattered a glad good morning a buck stepped from the cover of a manzanita thicket and stood for a moment with antlered head lifted as if he too sensed the beauty and the meaning of life a timid doe came to stand beside her lordly mate the man motionless held his breath in a flash they were gone natuchi the indian stood beside his white companion hugh edwards held out his hand to the red man good-bye natuchi you go asked the puzzled indian yes you have paid your debt natuchi the fire of savage exultation flamed in the red man's eyes hugh edwards will take the revenge that i natuchi have offered no 
the indian said doubtfully as if striving for an answer to the thing which puzzled him so there is something in the white man's heart that is more than hate yes natichi yesterday i believed that there was nothing left for me in life but hate then you last night revealed to me what hate might do and i knew the strength of love i must go now to the woman who is waiting for me down there in the canyon of gold but hugh edwards when he told st jimmy that george clinton was living had been mistaken the very night that natchegee brought the girl from that place where sonora jack had taken her martyr's father died in a los angeles hospital in the same hour that the indian and the girl were stealing from the mexican house south of the border the man for whose crime donald payne was sent to prison was dictating a confession with the last of his strength he signed the instrument natichi when he offered to hugh edwards his scheme of revenge did not know that at that very moment every newspaper in the land was heralding the innocence of the escaped convict donald payne the man who went down the mountain slopes and ridges toward the canyon of gold that morning did not know that he was even then a free man the girl who waited for her lover who had never spoken to her of his love did not know but dr burton when he went to oracle that evening before to complete his arrangements for that wedding journey had received the news it was like st jimmy to meet hugh edwards on the mountain side that morning and to tell him what he had learned before hugh had come within sight of the house in the canyon it was like st jimmy too to suggest that perhaps now martin need never know at least not until after they had returned from their trip abroad End of chapter thirty four freedom it was the plan that had been arranged by st jimmy late in the afternoon of that appointed day an automobile from tucson turned off from the bankhead highway into the old road that leads to the canada del oro at the point where the road enters the canyon of gold which is as far as an automobile can go on that ancient trail hugh and marta with old thad were waiting the automobile would take them without a stop straight south through tucson to nogales where they would cross the international boundary line into nogales mexico from there immediately after the wedding ceremony donald payne and his bride would travel by rail to mexico city from which point in due time they would go to the lands of the old world thad would return to the canada del oro and would for a while at least make his home with st jimmy and mother burton it was the plan that had been arranged by st jimmy when they all believed that it was unsafe for hugh to make his real name known in the united states for marta's sake the original plan was still to be carried out when marta and her husband were safely out of the country and on their way abroad dr burton would give the facts to the newspapers in a few months the sensational story would cease to be of news interest to the press and would be forgotten by the public then marta would be told that her husband's innocence had been established that donald payne no longer a fugitive from prison was free to return again to his own country st jimmy and his mother had said their good-byes at the little home of the old prospectors and their partnership girl from a rocky point on samaniego ridge high above the canyon of gold natchee the indian saw the black moving spot which was the automobile on the old trail that had been followed by so many peoples in so many ages motionless as a figure of stone with a face unmoved the red man watched the automobile stopped the dark eyes of the indian trained to such distance could see as no white man could have seen the three figures entering the machine the automobile moved away winding down through the foothills crawling cautiously over the ridges laboring heavily across the sandy washes growing smaller and smaller until even to the indian's vision it was lost in the gray-brown plain of the desert but still natchee's gaze held toward the south where presently he saw a faint cloud of dust rising from the yellow thread-like line of highway then the cloud of dust melted into the desert air a moment longer the indian watched then slowly his gaze swept the many miles that lie between the foot of the santa catalinas 
and the far horizon a puff of air fragrant with the scent of the desert stirred the single feather that drooped from the loosely twisted folds of the indian's headband in the blue depth of the sky a wheeling eagle screamed lifting his dark face toward the mountain peaks that towered above his lonely hut natchitchee the indian mystic guarding of the mine with the iron door smiled the end end of chapter thirty five end of the mine with the iron door by harold bell wright